For the first time in her life, the Don was angry with her. He is the father of your child. What can a child come to in this world if he has no father? He said to Connie. Learning all this, Carlo Rizzi grew confident. He was perfectly safe. In fact, he bragged to his two writers on the book, Sally Rags and Coach, about how he bounced his wife around when she got snotty, and saw their looks of respect that he had the guts to manhandle the daughter of the great Don Corleone. But Rizzi would not have felt so safe if he had known that when Sonny Corleone learned of the beatings, he had flown into a murderous rage and had been restrained only by the sternest and most imperious command of the Don himself, a command that even Sonny dared not disobey which was why Sonny avoided Rizzi, not trusting himself to control his temper. So, feeling perfectly safe on this beautiful Sunday morning, Carlo Rizzi sped cross town on 96th Street to the east side. He did not see Sonny's car coming the opposite way toward his house. Sonny Corleone had left the protection of the mall and spent the night with Lucy Mancini in town. Now, on the way home, he was traveling with four bodyguards, two in front and two behind. He didn't need guards right beside him. He could take care of a single direct assault. The other men traveled in their own cars and had apartments on either side of Lucy's apartment. It was safe to visit her as long as he didn't do it too often. But now that he was in town, he figured he would pick up his sister Connie and take her out to Long Beach. He knew Carlo would be working at his book and the cheap bastard wouldn't get her a car. So he'd give his sister a lift out. He waited for the two men in front to go into the building and then followed them. He saw the two men in back pull up behind his car and get out to watch the streets. He kept his own eyes open. It was a million to one shot that the opposition even knew he was in town, but he was always careful. He had learned that in the 1930s war. He never used elevators. They were death traps. He climbed the eight flights to Connie's apartment, going fast. He knocked on her door. He had seen Carlo's car go by and knew she would be alone. There was no answer. He knocked again, and then he heard his sister's voice, frightened, timid. Who is it? The fright in the voice stunned him. His kid sister had always been fresh and snotty, tough as anybody in the family. What the hell had happened to her? It's Sonny. The bolt inside slid back, and the door opened, and Connie was in his arms, sobbing. He was so surprised, he just stood there. He pushed her away from him and saw her swollen face, and he understood what had happened. He pulled away from her to run down the stairs and go after her husband. Rage flamed up in him, contorting his own face. Connie saw the rage and clung to him not letting him go, making him come into the apartment. She was weeping out of terror now. She knew her older brother's temper and feared it. She had never complained to him about Carlo for that reason. Now she made him come into the apartment with her. It was my fault. I started a fight with him and I tried to hit him, so he hit me. He really didn't try to hit me that hard. I walked into it. Sonny's heavy, cupid face was under control. You going to see the old man today? She didn't answer, so he added... I thought you were, so I dropped over to give you a lift. I was in the city anyway. She shook her head. I don't want them to see me this way. I'll come next week. Okay. He picked up her kitchen phone and dialed a number. I'm getting a doctor to come over here and take a look at you and fix you up. In your condition, you have to be careful. How many months before you have the kid? Two months. Sonny, please don't do anything. Please don't. Sonny laughed. His face was cruelly intent. Don't worry, I won't make your kid an orphan before he's born. He left the apartment after kissing her lightly on her uninjured cheek. On East 112th Street, a long line of cars were double parked in front of a candy store that was the headquarters of Carlo Rizzi's book. On the sidewalk in front of the store, fathers played catch with small children they had taken for a Sunday morning ride and to keep them company as they placed their bets. When they saw Carlo Rizzi coming, they stopped playing ball and bought their kids ice cream to keep them quiet. Then they started studying the newspapers that gave the starting pitchers, trying to pick out winning baseball bets for the day. Carlo went into the large room in the back of the store. His two writers, a small wiry man called Sally Rags and a big husky fellow called Coach, were already waiting for the action to start. They had their huge lined pads in front of them ready to write down bets. On a wooden stand was a blackboard with the names of the 16 big league baseball teams chalked on it, paired to show who was playing against who. Against each pairing was a blocked out square to enter the odds. Carlo asked Coach, Is the store phone tapped today? Coach shook his head. Uh, tap is still off. Carlo went to the wall phone and dialed a number. Sally Rags and Coach watched him impassively as he jotted down the line, the odds on all baseball games for that day. 
They watched him as he hung up the phone and walked over to the blackboard and chalked up the odds against each game. Though Carlo did not know it, they had already gotten the line and were checking his work. In the first week in his job, Carlo had made a mistake in transposing the odds onto the blackboard and had created that dream of all gamblers, a middle. That is, by betting the odds with him and then betting against the same team with another bookmaker at the correct odds, the gambler could not lose. The only one who could lose was Carlo's book. That mistake had caused a $6,000 loss in the book for the week and confirmed the Don's judgment about his son-in-law. He had given the word that all of Carlo's work was to be checked. Normally, the highly placed members of the Corleone family would never be concerned with such an operational detail. There was at least a five-layer insulation to their level. But since the book was being used as a testing ground for the son-in-law, it had been placed under the direct scrutiny of Tom Hagen, to whom a report was sent every day. Now, with the line posted, the gamblers were thronging into the back room of the candy store to jot down the odds on their newspapers next to the games printed there with probable pictures. Some of them held their little children by the hand as they looked up at the blackboard. One guy who made big bets looked down at the little girl he was holding by the hand and said teasingly, Who do you like today, honey, Giants or the Pirates? The little girl, fascinated by the colorful name, said, Are Giants stronger than Pirates? The father laughed. A line began to form in front of the two writers. When a writer filled one of his sheets, he tore it off, wrapped the money he had collected in it, and handed it to Carlo. Carlo went out the back exit of the room and up a flight of steps to an apartment which housed the candy store owner's family. He called in the bets to his central exchange and put the money in a small wall safe that was hidden by an extended window drape. Then he went back down into the candy store after having first burned the bet sheet and flushed its ashes down the toilet bowl. None of the Sunday games started before 2 p.m. because of the blue laws. So, after the first crowd of bettors, family men who had to get their bets in and rush home to take their families to the beach, came the trickling of bachelor gamblers or the diehards who condemned their families to Sundays in the hot city apartments. These bachelor bettors were the big gamblers. They bet heavier and came back around 4 o'clock to bet the second games of doubleheaders. They were the ones who made Carlos Sundays a full-time day with overtime, though some married men called in from the beach to try and recoup their losses. By 1.30, the betting had trickled off so that Carlo and Sally Rags could go out and sit on the stoop beside the candy store and get some fresh air. They watched the stickball game the kids were having. A police car went by. They ignored it. This book had very heavy protection at the precinct and couldn't be touched on a local level. A raid would have to be ordered from the very top, and even then, a warning would come through in plenty of time. Coach came out and sat beside them. They gossiped a while about baseball and women. Carlo said laughingly, <laughs> I had to bat my wife around again today, teach her who's boss. Coach said casually. She's knocked up pretty big now, ain't she? Yeah, I just slapped her face a few times. I didn't hurt her. He brooded for a moment. She thinks she can boss me around. I don't stand for that. There were still a few betters hanging around, shooting the breeze, talking baseball, some of them sitting on the steps above the two riders and Carlo. Suddenly, the kids playing stickball in the street scattered. A car came screeching up the block into a halt in front of the candy store. It stopped so abruptly that the tires screamed, and before it had stopped, almost, a man came hurtling out of the driver's seat, moving so fast that everybody was paralyzed. The man was Sonny Corleone. His heavy, cupid-featured face with its thick, curved mouth was an ugly mask of fury. In a split second, he was at the stoop and had grabbed Carlo Rizzi by the throat. He pulled Carlo away from the others, trying to drag him into the street. But Carlo wrapped his huge, muscular arms around the iron railings of the stoop and hung on. He cringed away, trying to hide his head and face in the hollow of his shoulders. His shirt ripped away in Sonny's hand. What followed then was sickening. Sonny began beating the cowering Carlo with his fists, cursing him in a thick, rage-choked voice. Carlo, despite his tremendous physique, offered no resistance, gave no cry for mercy or protest. Coach and Sally Rags dared not interfere. They thought Sonny meant to kill his brother-in-law and had no desire to share his fate. The kids playing stickball gathered to curse the driver who had made them scatter, but now were watching with awestruck interest. They were tough kids, but the sight of Sonny in his rage silenced them. Meanwhile, another car had drawn up behind Sonny's, and two of his bodyguards jumped out. When they saw what was happening, they too dared not interfere. They stood alert, ready to protect their chief if any bystanders had the stupidity to try to help Carlo. What made the sight sickening was Carlo's complete subjection. 
but it was perhaps this that saved his life. He clung to the iron railings with his hands so that Sonny could not drag him into the street, and despite his obvious equal strength, still refused to fight back. He let the blows rain on his unprotected head and neck until Sonny's rage ebbed. Finally, his chest heaving, Sonny looked down at him and said, You dirty bastard. You ever beat up my sister again, I'll kill you. These words released the tension, because, of course, if Sonny intended to kill the man, he would never have uttered the threat. He uttered it in frustration because he could not carry it out. Carlo refused to look at Sonny. He kept his head down and his hands and arms entwined in the iron railing. He stayed that way until the car roared off, and he heard Coach say in his curiously paternal voice, Okay, Carlo, come on into the store. Let's get out of sight. It was only then that Carlo dared to get out of his crouch against the stone steps of the stoop and unlock his hands from the railing. Standing up, he could see the kids look at him with the staring, sickened faces of people who had witnessed the degradation of a fellow human being. He was a little dizzy, but it was more from shock, the raw fear that had taken command of his body. He was not badly hurt despite the shower of heavy blows. He let Coach lead him by the arm into the back room of the candy store and put ice on his face, which, though it was not cut or bleeding, was lumpy with swelling bruises. The fear was subsiding now, and the humiliation he had suffered made him sick to his stomach so that he had to throw up. Coach held his head over the sink, supported him as if he were drunk, then helped him upstairs to the apartment and made him lie down in one of the bedrooms. Carlo never noticed that Sally Rags had disappeared. Sally Rags had walked down to Third Avenue and called Rocco Lamponi to report what had happened. Rocco took the news calmly, and in his turn called his capo regime, Pete Clemenza. Clemenza groaned. Oh, Christ! That goddamn Sonny and his temper! But his finger had prudently clicked down on the hook so that Rocco never heard his remark. Clemenza called the house in Long Beach and got Tom Hagen. Hagen was silent for a moment, and then he said, Send some of your people and cars out on the road to Long Beach as soon as you can, just in case Sonny gets held up by traffic or an accident. When he gets sore like that, he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Maybe some of our friends on the other side will hear he was in town. You never can tell. Uh, by the time I could get anybody on the road, Sonny will be home. That goes for the Tatalias, too. I know, but if something out of the ordinary happens, Sonny may be held up. Do the best you can, Pete. Grudgingly, Clemenza called Rocco Lamponi and told him to get a few people in cars and cover the road to Long Beach. He himself went out to his beloved Cadillac and with three of the platoon of guards who now garrisoned his home, started over the Atlantic Beach Bridge toward New York City. One of the hangers-on around the candy store, a small better on the payroll of the Tatalia family, as an informer, called the contact he had with his people. But the Tatalia family had not streamlined itself for the war. The contact still had to go all the way through the insulation layers before he finally got to the capo regime who contacted the Tatalia chief. By that time, Sonny Corleone was safely back in the mall in his father's house in Long Beach, about to face his father's wrath. Chapter 17 The War of 1947 between the Corleone family and the five families combined against them proved to be expensive for both sides. It was complicated by the police pressure put on everybody to solve the murder of Captain McCluskey. It was rare that operating officials of the police department ignored political muscle that protected gambling and vice operations. But in this case, the politicians were as helpless as the general staff of a rampaging, looting army whose field officers refused to follow orders. This lack of protection did not hurt the Corleone family as much as it did their opponents. The Corleone group depended on gambling for most of its income and was hit especially hard in its numbers or policy branch of operations. The runners who picked up the action were swept into police nets and usually given a medium shellacking before being booked. Even some of the banks were located and raided with heavy financial loss. The bankers, 90 calibers in their own right, complained to the capo regime, who brought their complaints to the family council table. But there was nothing to be done. The bankers were told to go out of business. Local Negro freelancers were allowed to take over the operation in Harlem, the richest territory, and they operated in such scattered fashion that the police found it hard to pin them down. After the death of Captain McCluskey, some newspapers printed stories involving him with Salazzo. They published proof that McCluskey had received large sums of money in cash shortly before his death. These stories had been planted by Hagen, the information supplied by him. The police department refused to confirm or deny these stories, but they were taking effect. The police force got the word through informers, through police on the family payroll, that McCluskey had been a rogue cop. Not that he had taken money or clean graft. There was no rank-and-file onus to that. 
but that he had taken the dirtiest of dirty money, murder and drugs money, and in the morality of policemen, this was unforgivable. Hagen understood that the policeman believes in law and order in a curiously innocent way. He believes in it more than does the public he serves. Law and order is, after all, the magic from which he derives his power. Individual power, which he cherishes, as nearly all men cherish individual power. And yet, there is always the smoldering resentment against the public he serves. They are at the same time his ward and his prey. As wards, they are ungrateful, abusive, and demanding. As prey, they are slippery and dangerous, full of guile. As soon as one is in the policeman's clutches, the mechanism of the society the policeman defends marshals all its resources to cheat him of his prize. The fix is put in by politicians. Judges give lenient suspended sentences to the worst hoodlums. Governors of the states and the president of the United States himself give full pardons, assuming that respected lawyers have not already won his acquittal. After a time, the cop learns. Why should he not collect the fees these hoodlums are paying? He needs it more, his children. Why should they not go to college? Why shouldn't his wife shop in more expensive places? Why shouldn't he himself get the sun with a winter vacation in Florida? After all, he risks his life, and that is no joke. But usually, he draws the line against accepting dirty graft. He will take money to let a bookmaker operate. He will take money from a man who hates getting parking tickets or speeding tickets. He will allow call girls and prostitutes to ply their trade for a consideration. These are vices natural to man. But usually, he will not take a payoff for drugs, armed robberies, rape, murder, and other assorted perversions. In his mind, these attack the very core of his personal authority and cannot be countenanced. The murder of a police captain was comparable to regicide. But when it became known that McCluskey had been killed while in the company of a notorious narcotics peddler, when it became known that he was suspected of conspiracy to murder, the police desire for vengeance began to fade. Also, after all, there were still mortgage payments to be made, cars to be paid off, children to be launched into the world. Without their sheet money, policemen had to scramble to make ends meet. Unlicensed peddlers were good for lunch money. Parking ticket payoffs came to nickels and dimes. Some of the more desperate even began shaking down suspects, homosexuals, assaults, and batteries in the precinct squad rooms. Finally, the brass relented. They raised the prices and let the families operate. Once again, the payoff sheet was typed up by the precinct bagman, listing every man assigned to the local station and what his cut was each month. Some semblance of social order was restored. It had been Hagen's idea to use private detectives to guard Don Corleone's hospital room. These were, of course, supplemented by the much more formidable soldiers of Tessio's regime. But Sonny was not satisfied even with this. By the middle of February, when the Don could be moved without danger, he was taken by ambulance to his home in the mall. The house had been renovated so that his bedroom was now a hospital room with all equipment necessary for any emergency. Nurses, specially recruited and checked, had been hired for round-the-clock care, and Dr. Kennedy, with the payment of a huge fee, had been persuaded to become the physician in residence to this private hospital, at least until the Don would need only nursing care. The mall itself was made impregnable. Button men were moved into the extra houses. The tenants sent on vacations to their native villages in Italy, all expenses paid. Freddy Corleone had been sent to Las Vegas to recuperate and also to scout out the ground for a family operation in the luxury hotel gambling casino complex that was springing up. Las Vegas was part of the West Coast Empire, still neutral, and the dawn of that empire had guaranteed Freddy's safety there. The New York Five families had no desire to make more enemies by going into Vegas after Freddy Corleone. They had enough trouble on their hands in New York. Dr. Kennedy had forbade any discussion of business in front of the dawn. This edict was completely disregarded. The Don insisted on the Council of War being held in his room. Sonny, Tom Hagen, Pete Clemenza, and Tessio gathered there the very first night of his homecoming. Don Corleone was too weak to speak much, but he wished to listen and exercise veto powers. When it was explained that Freddy had been sent to Las Vegas to learn the gambling casino business, he nodded his head approvingly. When he learned that Bruno Tattaglia had been killed by Corleone button men, he shook his head and sighed. But what distressed him most of all was learning that Michael had killed Salazzo and Captain McCluskey and had then been forced to flee to Sicily. When he heard this, he motioned them out, and they continued the conference in the corner room that held the law library. Sonny Corleone relaxed in the huge armchair behind the desk. I think we'd better let the old man take it easy for a couple of weeks, until a doc says he can do business. He paused. I'd like to have it going again before he gets better. We had the go-ahead from the cops to operate. 
The first thing is the policy banks in Harlem. The black boys up there had their fun. Now we have to take it back. They screwed up the works, but good, just like they usually do when they run things. A lot of their runners didn't pay off winners. They drive up in Cadillacs and tell their players they gotta wait for their dough, or maybe just pay them half what they win. I don't want any runner looking rich to his players. I don't want them dressing too good. I don't want them driving new cars. I don't want them welching on paying a winner. And I don't want any freelancers staying in business. They give us a bad name. Tom, let's get that project moving right away. Everything else will fall in line as soon as you send out the word that the lid is off. There are some very tough boys up in Harlem. They got a taste of the big money. They won't go back to being runners or sub-bankers again. Sonny shrugged. Just give their names to Clemenza. That's his job. Straighten them out. It was Tessio who brought up the most important question. Once we start operating, the five families start their raids. They'll hit our bankers in Harlem and our bookmakers on the east side. They may even try to make things tough for the garment center outfits we service. This war is going to cost a lot of money. Maybe they won't. They know we'll hit them right back. I've got peace feelers out, and maybe we can settle everything by paying an indemnity for the Tatalia kid. We're getting the cold shoulder on those negotiations. They lost a lot of dough the last few months, and they blame us for it, with justice. I think what they want is for us to agree to come in on the narcotics trade, to use the family influence politically. In other words, Salazzo's deal minus Salazzo. But they won't broach that until they've hurt us with some sort of combat action. Then, after we've been softened up, they figure we'll listen to a proposition on narcotics. No deal on drugs. The Don said no, and it's no until he changes it. Then we're faced with a tactical problem. Our money is out in the open. Bookmaking and policy. We can be hit. But the Tatalia family has prostitution and call girls in the dock unions. How the hell are we going to hit them? The other families are in some gambling, but most of them are in the construction trades. Shylocking, controlling the unions, getting the government contracts. They get a lot from strong arm and other stuff that involves innocent people. Their money isn't out in the street. The Tatalia nightclub is too famous to touch. It would cause too much of a stink. And with the Don still out of action, their political influence matches ours. So we've got a real problem here. It's my problem, Tom. I'll find the answer. Keep the negotiation alive and follow through on the other stuff. Let's go back into business and see what happens. Then we'll take it from there. Clemenza and Tessio have plenty of soldiers. We can match the whole five families, gun for gun, if that's the way they want it. We'll just go to the mattresses. There was no problem getting the freelance Negro bankers out of business. The police were informed and cracked down, with a special effort. At that time, it was not possible for a Negro to make a payoff to a high police or political official to keep such an operation going. This was due to racial prejudice and racial distrust more than anything else. But Harlem had always been considered a minor problem, and its settlement was expected. The five families struck in an unexpected direction. Two powerful officials in the garment unions were killed, officials who were members of the Corleone family. Then, the Corleone family Shylocks were barred from the waterfront piers, as were the Corleone family bookmakers. The Longshoremen's Union locals had gone over to the five families. Corleone bookmakers all over the city were threatened to persuade them to change their allegiance. The biggest numbers banker in Harlem, an old friend and ally of the Corleone family, was brutally murdered. There was no longer any option. Sonny told his capo regime to go to the mattresses. Two apartments were set up in the city and furnished with mattresses for the button men to sleep on, a refrigerator for food and guns and ammunition. Clemenza staffed one apartment and Tessio the other. All family bookmakers were given bodyguard teams. The policy bankers in Harlem, however, had gone over to the enemy, and at the moment nothing could be done about that. All this cost the Corleone family a great deal of money, and very little was coming in. As the next few months went by, other things became obvious. The most important was that the Corleone family had overmatched itself. There were reasons for this. With the Don still too weak to take apart, a great deal of the family's political strength was neutralized. Also, the last ten years of peace had seriously eroded the fighting qualities of the two capa regime, Clemenza and Tessio. Clemenza was still a competent executioner and administrator, but he no longer had the energy or the youthful strength to lead troops. Tessio had mellowed with age and was not ruthless enough. Tom Hagen, despite his abilities, was simply not suited to be a consigliere in a time of war. His main fault was that he was not a Sicilian. Sonny Corleone recognized these weaknesses in the family's wartime posture, but could not take any steps to remedy them. He was not the Don, and only the Don could replace the capo regime and the consigliere. And the very act of replacement would make the situation more dangerous, might precipitate some treachery. At first, 
Sonny had thought of fighting a holding action until the Don could become well enough to take charge. But with the defection of the policy bankers, the terrorization of the bookmakers, the family position was becoming precarious. He decided to strike back. But he decided to strike right at the heart of the enemy. He planned the execution of the heads of the five families in one grand tactical maneuver. To that purpose, he put into effect an elaborate system of surveillance of these leaders. But after a week, the enemy chiefs promptly dived underground and were seen no more in public. The five families and the Corleone Empire were in stalemate. Chapter 18 Amerigo Bonacetta lived only a few blocks from his undertaking establishment on Mulberry Street, and so always went home for supper. Evenings he returned to his place of business, dutifully joining those mourners paying their respects to the dead who lay in state in his somber parlors. He always resented the jokes made about his profession, the macabre technical details, which were so unimportant. Of course, none of his friends or family or neighbors would make such jokes. Any profession was worthy of respect to men who for centuries earned bread by the sweat of their brows. Now, at supper with his wife in their solidly furnished apartment, gilt statues of the Virgin Mary with their red glass candles flickering on the sideboard, Bonacera lit a camel cigarette and took a relaxing glass of American whiskey. His wife brought steaming plates of soup to the table. The two of them were alone now. He had sent his daughter to live in Boston with her mother's sister, where she could forget her terrible experience and her injuries at the hands of the two ruffians Don Corleone had punished. As they ate their soup, his wife asked, Are you going back to work tonight? Amerigo Bonacera nodded. His wife respected his work, but did not understand it. She did not understand that the technical part of his profession was the least important. She thought, like most other people, that he was paid for his skill in making the dead look so lifelike in their coffins. And indeed, his skill in this was legendary. But even more important, even more necessary, was his physical presence at the wake. When the bereaved family came at night to receive their blood relatives and their friends beside the coffin of their loved one, they needed Amerigo Bonacera with them. For he was a strict chaperone to death. His face always grave, yet strong and comforting, his voice unwavering, yet muted to a low register, he commanded the mourning ritual. He could quiet grief that was too unseemly. He could rebuke unruly children whose parents had not the heart to chastise. Never cloying in the tender of his condolences, yet never was he offhand. Once a family used Amarigo Bonacera to speed a loved one on, they came back to him again and again, and he never, never deserted one of his clients on that terrible last night above ground. Usually, he allowed himself a little nap after supper. Then he washed and shaved afresh, talcum powder generously used to shroud the heavy black beard, a mouthwash always. He respectfully changed into fresh linen, white gleaming shirt, the black tie, a freshly pressed dark suit, dull black shoes and black socks. And yet the effect was comforting instead of somber. He also kept his hair dyed black, an unheard of frivolity in an Italian male of his generation, but not out of vanity simply because his hair had turned a lively pepper and salt, a color which struck him as unseemly for his profession. After he finished his soup, his wife placed a small steak before him with a few forkfuls of green spinach, oozing yellow oil. He was a light eater. When he finished this, he drank a cup of coffee and smoked another camel cigarette. Over his coffee, he thought about his poor daughter. She would never be the same. Her outward beauty had been restored, but there was a look of a frightened animal in her eyes that had made him unable to bear the sight of her and so they had sent her to live in Boston for a time. Time would heal her wounds. Pain and terror was not so final as death, as he well knew. His work made him an optimist. He had just finished the coffee when his phone in the living room rang. His wife never answered it when he was home, so he got up and drained his cup and stubbed out his cigarette. As he walked to the phone, he pulled off his tie and started to unbutton his shirt, getting ready for his little nap. Then he picked up the phone and said with quiet courtesy, Hello? The voice on the other end was harsh, strained. This is Tom Hagen. I'm calling for Don Corleone at his request. Amerigo Bonacera felt the coffee churning sourly in his stomach, felt himself going a little sick. It was more than a year since he had put himself in the debt of the Don to avenge his daughter's honor, and in that time the knowledge that he must pay that debt had receded. He had been so grateful seeing the bloody faces of those two ruffians that he would have done anything for the Don. But time erodes gratitude more quickly than it does beauty. Now, Bonacera felt the sickness of a man faced with disaster. Yes, I understand. I'm listening. He was surprised at the coldness in Hagen's voice. The consigliere had always been a courteous man, though not Italian. 
but now he was being rudely brusque. You owe the Don a service. He has no doubt that you will repay him, that you will be happy to have this opportunity. In one hour, not before, perhaps later, he will be at your funeral parlor to ask for your help. Be there to greet him. Don't have any people who work for you there. Send them home. If you have any objections to this, speak now and I'll inform Don Corleone. He has other friends who can do him this service. Amerigo Bonacera almost cried out in his fright. How can you think I would refuse the Godfather? Of course I'll do anything he wishes. I haven't forgotten my debt. I'll go to my business immediately, at once. Hagen's voice was gentler now, but there was something strange about it. Thank you. The Don never doubted you. The question was mine. Oblige him tonight and you can always come to me in any trouble. You'll earn my personal friendship. This frightened Amerigo Bonacera even more. The Don himself is coming to me tonight? Yes. Then he's completely recovered from his injuries, thank God. His voice made it a question. There was a pause at the other end of the phone. Then Hagen's voice said very quietly, Yes. There was a click, and the phone went dead. Bonacera was sweating. He went into the bedroom and changed his shirt and rinsed his mouth, but he didn't shave or use a fresh tie. He put on the same one he had used during the day. He called the funeral parlor and told his assistant to stay with the bereaved family using the front parlor that night. He himself would be busy in the laboratory working area of the building. When the assistant started asking questions, Bonacera cut him off very curtly and told him to follow orders exactly. He put on his suit jacket and his wife, still eating, looked up at him in surprise. I have work to do. She did not dare question him because of the look on his face. Bonacera went out of the house and walked the few blocks to his funeral parlor. This building stood by itself on a large lot with a white picket fence running all around it. There was a narrow roadway leading from the street to the rear, just wide enough for ambulances and hearses. Bonacera unlocked the gate and left it open. Then he walked to the rear of the building and entered it through the wide door there. As he did so, he could see mourners already entering the front door of the funeral parlor to pay their respects to the current corpse. Many years ago, when Bonacera had bought this building from an undertaker planning to retire, there had been a stoop of about ten steps that mourners had to mount before entering the funeral parlor. This had posed a problem. Old and crippled mourners determined to pay their respects had found the steps almost impossible to mount. So the former undertaker had used the freight elevator for these people, a small metal platform that rose out of the ground beside the building. The elevator was for coffins and bodies. It would descend underground, then rise into the funeral parlor itself, so that a crippled mourner would find himself rising through the floor beside the coffin as other mourners moved their black chairs aside to let the elevator rise through the trap door. Then, when the crippled or aged mourner had finished paying his respects, the elevator would again come up through the polished floor to take him down and out again. Amerigo Bonacera had found this solution to the problem unseemly and penny-pinching. So, he had had the front of the building remodeled, the stoop done away with, and a slightly inclining walk put in its place. But of course, the elevator was still used for coffins and corpses. In the rear of the building, cut off from the funeral parlor and reception rooms by a massive soundproof door, was the business office, the embalming room, a storeroom for coffins, and a carefully locked closet holding chemicals and the awful tools of his trade. Bonacera went to the office, sat at his desk, and lit up a camel, one of the few times he had ever smoked in this building. Then he waited for Don Corleone. He waited with a feeling of the utmost despair, for he had no doubt as to what services he would be called upon to perform. For the last year, the Corleone family had waged war against the five great mafia families of New York, and the carnage had filled the newspapers. Many men on both sides had been killed. Now the Corleone family had killed somebody so important that they wished to hide his body, make it disappear, and what better way than to have it officially buried by a registered undertaker. And Amerigo Bonacera had no illusions about the act he was to commit. He would be an accessory to murder. If it came out, he would spend years in jail. His daughter and wife would be disgraced. His good name, the respected name of Amerigo Bonacera, dragged through the bloody mud of the Mafia War. He indulged himself by smoking another camel. And then he thought of something even more terrifying. When the other Mafia families found out that he had aided the Corleones, they would treat him as an enemy. They would murder him. And now he cursed the day he had gone to the Godfather and begged for his vengeance. He cursed the day his wife and the wife of Don Corleone had become friends. He cursed his daughter and America and his own success. And then his optimism returned. It could all go well. Don Corleone was a clever man. Certainly everything had been arranged to keep the secret. He had only to keep his nerve. For, of course, the one thing more fatal than any other was to earn the Don's displeasure. He heard tires on gravel, 
His practiced ear told him a car was coming through the narrow driveway and parking in the backyard. He opened the rear door to let them in. The huge, fat man, Clemenza, entered, followed by two very rough-looking young fellows. They searched the rooms without saying a word to Bonacera. Then Clemenza went out. The two young men remained with the undertaker. A few moments later, Bonacera recognized the sound of a heavy ambulance coming through the narrow driveway. Then Clemenza appeared in the doorway, followed by two men carrying a stretcher. And Amerigo Bonacera's worst fears were realized. On the stretcher was a corpse, swaddled in a gray blanket, but with bare yellow feet sticking out the end. Clemenza motioned the stretcher-bearers into the embalming room, and then, from the blackness of the yard, another man stepped into the lighted office room. It was Don Corleone. The Don had lost weight during his illness, and moved with a curious stiffness. He was holding his hat in his hands, and his hair seemed thin over his massive skull. He looked older, more shrunken than when Bonacera had seen him at the wedding, but he still radiated power. Holding his hat against his chest, he said to Bonacera, Well, old friend, are you ready to do me this service? Bonacera nodded. The Don followed the stretcher into the embalming room, and Bonacera trailed after him. The corpse was on one of the guttered tables. Don Corleone made a tiny gesture with his hat, and the other men left the room. Bonacera whispered, What do you wish me to do? Don Corleone was staring at the table. I want you to use all your powers, all your skill as you love me. I do not wish his mother to see him as he is. He went to the table and drew down the gray blanket. Amerigo Bonacera, against all his will, against all his years of training and experience, let out a gasp of horror. On the embalming table was the bullet-smashed face of Sonny Corleone. The left eye, drowned in blood, had a star fracture in its lens. The bridge of his nose and left cheekbone were hammered into pulp. For one fraction of a second, the Don put out his hand to support himself against Bonacera's body. See how they have massacred my son. Chapter 19 Perhaps it was the stalemate that made Sonny Corleone embark on the bloody course of attrition that ended in his own death. Perhaps it was his dark, violent nature given full reign. In any case, that spring and summer he mounted senseless raids on enemy auxiliaries. Tatalia family pimps were shot to death in Harlem. Dock goons were massacred. Union officials who owed allegiance to the five families were warned to stay neutral. And when the Corleone bookmakers and Shylocks were still barred from the docks, Sonny sent Clemenza and his regime to wreak havoc upon the longshore. This slaughter was senseless because it could not affect the outcome of the war. Sonny was a brilliant tactician and won his brilliant victories. But what was needed was the strategical genius of Don Corleone. The whole thing degenerated into such a deadly guerrilla war that both sides found themselves losing a great deal of revenue and lives to no purpose. The Corleone family was finally forced to close down some of its most profitable bookmaking stations, including the book given to son-in-law Carlo Rizzi for his living. Carlo took to drink and running with chorus girls and giving his wife Connie a hard time. Since his beating at the hands of Sonny, he had not dared to hit his wife again, but he had not slept with her. Connie had thrown herself at his feet, and he had spurned her, as he thought, like a Roman with exquisite patrician pleasure. He had sneered at her, Go call your brother and tell him I won't screw you. Maybe he'll beat me up until I get a hard-on. But he was in deadly fear of Sonny, though they treated each other with cold politeness. Carlo had the sense to realize that Sonny would kill him, that Sonny was a man who could, with the naturalness of an animal, kill another man, while he himself would have to call up all his courage, all his will to commit murder. It never occurred to Carlo that because of this he was a better man than Sonny Corleone, if such terms could be used. He envied Sonny his awesome savagery, a savagery which was now becoming a legend. Tom Hagen, as the consigliere, disapproved of Sonny's tactics and yet decided not to protest to the Don simply because the tactics, to some extent, worked. The five families seemed to be cowed, finally, as the attrition went on, and their counterblows weakened and finally ceased altogether. Hagen at first distrusted this seeming pacification of the enemy, but Sonny was jubilant. I'll pour it on, and then those bastards will come begging for a deal. Sonny was worried about other things. His wife was giving him a hard time because the rumors had gotten to her that Lucy Mancini had bewitched her husband. And though she joked publicly about her Sonny's equipment and technique, he had stayed away from her too long, and she missed him in her bed, and she was making life miserable for him with her nagging. In addition to this, Sonny was under the enormous strain of being a marked man. 
He had to be extraordinarily careful in all his movements, and he knew that his visits to Lucy Mancini had been charted by the enemy. But here he took elaborate precautions, since this was the traditional vulnerable spot. He was safe there, though Lucy had not the slightest suspicion she was watched 24 hours a day by men of the Santino regime, and when an apartment became vacant on her floor, it was immediately rented by one of the most reliable men of that regime. The Don was recovering and would soon be able to resume command. At that time, the tide of battle must swing to the Corleone family. This Sonny was sure of. Meanwhile, he would guard his family's empire, earn the respect of his father, and, since the position was not hereditary to an absolute degree, cement his claim as heir to the Corleone Empire. But the enemy was making its plans. They too had analyzed the situation, and had come to the conclusion that the only way to stave off complete defeat was to kill Sonny Corleone. They understood the situation better now and felt it was possible to negotiate with the Don, known for his logical reasonableness. They had come to hate Sonny for his bloodthirstiness, which they considered barbaric. Also, not good business sense. Nobody wanted the old days back again with all its turmoil and trouble. One evening, Connie Corleone received an anonymous phone call, a girl's voice, asking for Carlo. Who is this? The girl on the other end giggled. I'm a friend of Carlo's. I just wanted to tell him I can't see him tonight. I have to go out of town. You lousy bitch! You lousy tramp, bitch! There was a click on the other end. Carlo had gone to the track for that afternoon, and when he came home in the late evening, he was sore at losing and half drunk from the bottle he always carried. As soon as he stepped into the door, Connie started screaming curses at him. He ignored her and went in to take a shower. When he came out, he dried his naked body in front of her and started dolling up to go out. Connie stood with hands on hips, her face pointy and white with rage. You're not going any place. Your girlfriend called and said she can't make it tonight. You lousy bastard! You have the nerve to give your horse my phone number! I'll kill you, you bastard! She rushed at him, kicking and scratching. He held her off with one muscular forearm. You're crazy! But she could see he was worried, as if he knew the crazy girl he was screwing would actually pull such a stunt. She was kidding around, some nut. Connie ducked around his arm and clawed at his face. She got a little bit of his cheek under her fingernails. With surprising patience, he pushed her away. She noticed he was careful because of her pregnancy, and that gave her the courage to feed her rage. She was also excited. Pretty soon, she wouldn't be able to do anything. The doctor had said no sex for the last two months, and she wanted it before the last two months started. Yet her wish to inflict a physical injury on Carlo was very real, too. She followed him into the bedroom. She could see he was scared, and that filled her with contemptuous delight. You're staying home. You're not going out. Okay, okay. He was still undressed, only wearing his shorts. He liked to go around the house like that. He was proud of his V-shaped body, the golden skin. Connie looked at him hungrily. He tried to laugh. <laughs> you gonna give me something to eat at least? That mollified her, his calling on her duties, one of them at least. She was a good cook. She'd learned that from her mother. She sautéed veal and peppers, preparing a mixed salad while the pan simmered. Meanwhile, Carlo stretched out on his bed to read the next day's racing form. He had a water glass full of whiskey beside him, which he kept sipping at. Connie came into the bedroom. She stood in the doorway as if she could not come close to the bed without being invited. Food is on the table. Still reading the racing form, he said, I'm not hungry yet. It's on the table. Stick it up your ass. He drank off the rest of the whiskey in the water glass, tilted the bottle to fill it again. He paid no more attention to her. Connie went into the kitchen, picked up the plates filled with food, and smashed them against the sink. The loud crashes brought Carlo in from the bedroom. He looked at the greasy veal and peppers splattered all over the kitchen walls, and his finicky neatness was outraged. You filthy guinea spoiled brat. Clean that up right now or I'll kick the shit out of you. Like hell I will. She held her hands like claws, ready to scratch his bare chest to ribbons. Carlo went back into the bedroom, and when he came out he was holding his belt doubled in his hand. Clean it up. This is the end of disc number seven. Please insert disc number eight. Clean that up right now or I'll kick the shit out of you. Like hell I will. She held her hands like claws ready to scratch his bare chest to ribbons. Carlo went back into the bedroom, and when he came out, he was holding his belt doubled in his hand. Clean it up.
There was no mistaking the menace in his voice. She stood there, not moving, and he swung the belt against her heavily padded hips, the leather stinging, but not really hurting. Connie retreated to the kitchen cabinets, and her hand went into one of the drawers to haul out the long bread knife. She held it ready. Even the female Corleones are murderers. He put the belt down on the kitchen table and advanced toward her. She tried a sudden lunge, but her pregnant heavy body made her slow, and he eluded the thrust she aimed at his groin in such deadly earnest. He disarmed her easily, and then he started to slap her face with a slow, medium-heavy stroke so as not to break the skin. He hit her again and again as she retreated around the kitchen table trying to escape him, and he pursued her into the bedroom. She tried to bite his hand, and he grabbed her by the hair to lift her head up. He slapped her face until she began to weep like a little girl with pain and humiliation. Then he threw her contemptuously onto the bed. He drank from the bottle of whiskey still on the night table. He seemed very drunk now. His light blue eyes had a crazy glint in them, and finally Connie was truly afraid. Carlos straddled his legs apart and drank from the bottle. He reached down and grabbed a chunk of her pregnant heavy thigh in his hand. He squeezed very hard, hurting her and making her beg for mercy. You're fat as a pig. With disgust, he walked out of the bedroom. Thoroughly frightened and cowed, she lay in the bed, not daring to see what her husband was doing in the other room. Finally, she rose and went to the door to peer into the living room. Carlo had opened a fresh bottle of whiskey and was sprawled on the sofa. In a little while, he would drink himself into sodden sleep, and she could sneak into the kitchen and call her family in Long Beach. She would tell her mother to send someone out here to get her. She just hoped Sonny didn't answer the phone. She knew it would be best to talk to Tom Hagen or her mother. It was nearly ten o'clock at night when the kitchen phone in Don Corleone's house rang. It was answered by one of the Don's bodyguards, who dutifully turned the phone over to Connie's mother. But Mrs. Corleone could hardly understand what her daughter was saying. The girl was hysterical, yet trying to whisper so that her husband in the next room would not hear her. Also, her face had become swollen because of the slaps, and her puffy lips thickened her speech. Mrs. Corleone made a sign to the bodyguard that he should call Sonny, who was in the living room with Tom Hagen. Sonny came into the kitchen and took the phone from his mother. Yeah, Connie. Connie was so frightened, both of her husband and of what her brother would do, that her speech became worse. She babbled, Sonny, just send a car to bring me home. I'll tell you then. It's nothing, Sonny. Don't you come. Send Tom. Please, Sonny. It's nothing. I just want to come home. By this time, Hagen had come into the room. The Don was already under a sedated sleep in the bedroom above, and Hagen wanted to keep an eye on Sonny in all crises. The two interior bodyguards were also in the kitchen. Everybody was watching Sonny as he listened on the phone. There was no question that the violence in Sonny Corleone's nature rose from some deep, mysterious, physical well. As they watched, they could actually see the blood rushing to his heavily corded neck, could see the eyes film with hatred, the separate features of his face tightening, growing pinched. Then his face took on the grayish hue of a sick man fighting off some sort of death, except that the adrenaline pumping through his body made his hands tremble. But his voice was controlled, pitched low, as he told his sister, You wait there, you just wait there. He hung up the phone. He stood there a moment, quite stunned with his own rage. Then he said, The fucking son of a bitch, the fucking son of a bitch. He ran out of the house. Hagen knew the look on Sonny's face. All reasoning power had left him. At this moment, Sonny was capable of anything. Hagen also knew that the ride into the city would cool Sonny off, make him more rational. But that rationality might make him even more dangerous, though the rationality would enable him to protect himself against the consequences of his rage. Hagen heard the car motor roaring into life and he said to the two bodyguards, Go after him. Then he went to the phone and made some calls. He arranged for some men of Sonny's regime living in the city to go up to Carlo Rizzi's apartment and get Carlo out of there. Other men would stay with Connie until Sonny arrived. He was taking a chance, thwarting Sonny, but he knew that Don would back him up. He was afraid that Sonny might kill Carlo in front of witnesses. He did not expect trouble from the enemy. The five families had been quiet too long, and obviously were looking for peace of some kind. By the time Sonny roared out of the mall in his Buick, he had already regained, partly, his senses. He noted the two bodyguards getting into a car to follow him and approved. He expected no danger. The five families had quit counterattacking, were not really fighting anymore. He had grabbed his jacket in the foyer, and there was a gun in a secret dashboard compartment of the car. The car registered in the name of a member of his regime, so that he, personally, could not get into any legal trouble but he did not anticipate needing any weapon. 
He did not even know what he was going to do with Carlo Rizzi. Now that he had a chance to think, Sonny knew he could not kill the father of an unborn child, and that father his sister's husband, not over a domestic spat, except that it was not just a domestic spat. Carlo was a bad guy, and Sonny felt responsible that his sister had met the bastard through him. The paradox in Sonny's violent nature was that he could not hit a woman and had never done so, that he could not harm a child or anything helpless. When Carlo had refused to fight back against him that day, it had kept Sonny from killing him. Complete submission disarmed his violence. As a boy, he had been truly tender-hearted. That he had become a murderer as a man was simply his destiny. But he would settle this thing once and for all, Sonny thought, as he headed the Buick toward the causeway that would take him over the water from Long Beach to the parkways on the other side of Jones Beach. He always used this route when he went to New York. There was less traffic. He decided he would send Connie home with the bodyguards, and then he would have a session with his brother-in-law. What would happen after that, he didn't know. If the bastard had really hurt Connie, he'd make a cripple out of the bastard. But the wind coming over the causeway, the salty freshness of the air, cooled his anger. He put the window down all the way. He had taken the Jones Beach causeway, as always, because it was usually deserted this time of night, at this time of year, and he could speed recklessly until he hit the parkways on the other side and even there traffic would be light. The release of driving very fast would help dissipate what he knew was a dangerous tension. He had already left his bodyguard's car far behind. The causeway was badly lit. There was not a single car. Far ahead, he saw the white cone of the manned toll booth. There were other toll booths beside it, but they were staffed only during the day, for heavier traffic. Sonny started breaking the Buick, and at the same time searched his pockets for change. He had none. He reached for his wallet, flipped it open with one hand, and fingered out a bill. He came within the arcade of light, and he saw, to his mild surprise, a car in the toll booth slot blocking it, the driver obviously asking some sort of directions from the toll taker. Sonny honked his horn, and the other car obediently rolled through to let his car slide into the slot. Sonny handed the toll taker the dollar bill and waited for his change. He was in a hurry now to close the window. The Atlantic Ocean air had chilled the whole car. But the toll-taker was fumbling with his change. The dumb son of a bitch actually dropped it. Head and body disappeared as the toll-man stooped down in his booth to pick up the money. At that moment, Sonny noticed that the other car had not kept going, but had parked a few feet ahead, still blocking his way. At that same moment, his lateral vision caught sight of another man in the darkened toll booth to his right. But he did not have time to think about that, because two men came out of the car parked in front and walked toward him. The toll collector still had not appeared. And then, in the fraction of a second before anything actually happened, Santino Corleone knew he was a dead man. And in that moment, his mind was lucid, drained of all violence, as if the hidden fear, finally real and present, had purified him. Even so, his huge body, in a reflex for life, crashed against the Buick door, bursting its lock. The man in the darkened toll booth opened fire and the shots caught Sonny Corleone in the head and neck as his massive frame spilled out of the car. The two men in front held up their guns now. The man in the darkened toll booth cut his fire, and Sonny's body sprawled on the asphalt with the legs still partly inside. The two men each fired shots into Sonny's body, then kicked him in the face to disfigure his features even more, to show a mark made by a more personal human power. Seconds afterward, all four men, the three actual assassins and the bogus toll collector, were in their car, and speeding toward the Meadowbrook Parkway on the other side of Jones Beach. Their pursuit was blocked by Sonny's car and body in the tollgate slot, but when Sonny's bodyguards pulled up a few minutes later and saw his body lying there, they had no intention to pursue. They swung their car around in a huge arc and returned to Long Beach. At the first public phone off the causeway, one of them hopped out and called Tom Hagen. He was very curt and very brisk. Sonny's dead. They got him at the Jones Beach toll. Hagen's voice was perfectly calm. Okay. Go to Clemenza's house and tell him to come here right away. He'll tell you what to do. Hagen had taken the call in the kitchen with Mama Corleone bustling around preparing a snack for the arrival of her daughter. He had kept his composure, and the old woman had not noticed anything amiss. Not that she could not have if she wanted to, but in her life with the Don, she had learned it was far wiser not to perceive, that if it was necessary to know something painful, it would be told to her soon enough. And if it was a pain that could be spared her, she could do without She was quite content not to share the pain of her men. After all, did they share the pain of women? Impassively, she boiled her coffee and set the table with food. 
In her experience, pain and fear did not dull physical hunger. In her experience, the taking of food dulled pain. She would have been outraged if a doctor had tried to sedate her with a drug, but coffee and a crust of bread were another matter. She came, of course, from a more primitive culture. And so, she let Tom Hagen escape to his corner conference room, and once in that room, Hagen began to tremble so violently he had to sit down with his legs squeezed together, his head hunched into his contracted shoulders, hands clasped together between his knees, as if he were praying to the devil. He was, he knew now, no fit consigliere for a family at war. He had been fooled, faked out by the five families and their seeming timidity. They had remained quiet, laying their terrible ambush. They had planned and waited, holding their bloody hands no matter what provocation they had been given. They had waited to land one terrible blow, and they had. Old Genko Abandando would never have fallen for it. He would have smelled a rat. He would have smoked them out, tripled his precautions. And through all this, Hagen felt his grief. Sonny had been his true brother, his savior, his hero, when they had been boys together. Sonny had never been mean or bullying with him, had always treated him with affection, had taken him in his arms when Salazzo had turned him loose. Sonny's joy at that reunion had been real. That he had grown up to be a cruel and violent and bloody man was, for Hagen, not relevant. He had walked out of the kitchen because he knew he could never tell Mama Corleone about her son's death. He had never thought of her as his mother as he thought of the Don as his father and Sonny as his brother. His affection for her was like his affection for Freddy and Michael and Connie. The affection for someone who has been kind but not loving. But he could not tell her. In a few short months, she had lost all her sons, Freddy exiled to Nevada, Michael hiding for his life in Sicily, and now Santino dead. Which of the three had she loved most of all? She had never shown. It was no more than a few minutes. Hagen got control of himself again and picked up the phone. He called Connie's number. It rang for a long time before Connie answered in a whisper. Hagen spoke to her gently. Connie, this is Tom. Wake your husband up. I have to talk to him. Tom, is Sonny coming here? No, Sonny's not coming there. Don't worry about that. Just wake Carlo up and tell him it's very important I speak to him. Tommy beat me up. I'm afraid he'll hurt me again if he knows I called home. He won't. He'll talk to me and I'll straighten him out. Everything will be okay. Tell him it's very important, very, very important he come to the phone, okay? It was almost five minutes before Carlo's voice came over the phone, a voice half slurred by whiskey and sleep. Hagen spoke sharply to make him alert. Listen, Carlo, I'm going to tell you something very shocking. Now prepare yourself, because when I tell it to you, I want you to answer me very casually, as if it's less than it is. I told Connie it was important, so you have to give her a story. Tell her the family has decided to move you both to one of the houses in the mall and to give you a big job. That the Don has finally decided to give you a chance in the hope of making your home life better. You got that? There was a hopeful note in Carlo's voice as he answered. Yeah, okay. In a few minutes, a couple of my men are going to knock on your door to take you away with them. Tell them I want them to call me first. Just tell them that. Don't say anything else. I'll instruct them to leave you there with Connie, okay? Yeah, yeah, I got it. His voice was excited. The tension in Hagen's voice seemed to have finally alerted him that the news coming up was going to be really important. Hagen gave it to him straight. They killed Sonny tonight. Don't say anything. Connie called him while you were asleep and he was on his way over there. But I don't want her to know that. Even if she guesses it, I don't want her to know it for sure. She'll start thinking it's all her fault. Now, I want you to stay with her tonight and not tell her anything. I want you to make up with her. I want you to be the perfect, loving husband. And I want you to stay that way until she has her baby at least. Tomorrow morning, somebody, maybe you, maybe the Don, maybe her mother, will tell Connie that her brother got killed. And I want you by her side. Do me this favor, and I'll take care of you in the times to come. You got that? Sure, Tom, sure. Listen, me and you always got along. I'm grateful, understand? Yeah. Nobody will blame your fight with Connie for causing this. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. He paused, and softly, encouragingly, Go ahead now. Take care of Connie. He broke the connection. He had learned never to make a threat. The Don had taught him that. But Carlo had gotten the message all right. He was a hair away from death. Hagen made another call to Tessio, telling him to come to the mall in Long Beach immediately. He didn't say why, and Tessio did not ask. Hagen sighed. Now would come the part he dreaded. He would have to waken the Don from his drugged slumber. He would have to tell the man he most loved in the world 
that he had failed him, that he had failed to guard his domain and the life of his eldest son. He would have to tell the Don everything was lost unless the sick man himself could enter the battle. For Hagen did not delude himself. Only the great Don himself could snatch even a stalemate from this terrible defeat. Hagen didn't even bother checking with Don Corleone's doctors. It would be to no purpose. No matter what the doctors ordered, even if they told him that the Don could not rise from his sickbed on pain of death, he must tell his adopted father and then follow him. And of course, there was no question about what the Don would do. The opinions of medical men were irrelevant now. Everything was irrelevant now. The Don must be told, and he must either take command or order Hagen to surrender the Corleone power to the five families. And yet, with all his heart, Hagen dreaded the next hour. He tried to prepare his own manner. He would have to be in all ways strict with his own guilt. To reproach himself would only add to the Don's burden. To show his own grief would only sharpen the grief of the Don. To point out his own shortcomings as a wartime consigliere would only make the Don reproach himself for his own bad judgment for picking such a man for such an important post. He must, Hagen knew, tell the news, present his analysis of what must be done to rectify the situation, and then keep silent. His reactions thereafter must be the reactions invited by his Don. If the Don wanted him to show guilt, he would show guilt. If the Don invited grief, he would lay bare his genuine sorrow. Hagen lifted his head at the sound of motors, cars rolling up onto the mall. The Capo Regime were arriving. He would brief them first, and then he would go up and wake Don Corleone. He got up and went to the liquor cabinet by the desk and took out a glass and bottle. He stood there for a moment so unnerved he could not pour the liquid from bottle to glass. Behind him, he heard the door to the room close softly, and turning, he saw, fully dressed for the first time since he had been shot, Don Corleone. The Don walked across the room to his huge leather armchair and sat down. He walked a little stiffly. His clothes hung a little loosely on his frame. But to Hagen's eyes, he looked the same as always. It was almost as if by his will alone the Don had discarded all external evidence of his still weakened frame. His face was sternly set with all its old force and strength. He sat straight in the armchair, and he said to Hagen, Give me a drop of anisette. Hagen switched bottles and poured them both a portion of the fiery, licorice-tasting alcohol. It was peasant, homemade stuff, much stronger than that sold in stores, the gift of an old friend who every year presented the Don with a small truckload. My wife was weeping before she fell asleep. Outside my window I saw my capa regime coming to the house, and it is midnight. So, consigliere of mine, I think you should tell your Don what everyone knows. I didn't tell Mama anything. I was about to come up and wake you and tell you the news myself. In another moment I would have come to waken you. But you needed a drink first. Yes. You had your drink. You can tell me now. There was just the faintest hint of reproach for Hagen's weakness. They shot Sonny on the causeway. He's dead. Don Corleone blinked. For just the fraction of a second, the wall of his will disintegrated, and the draining of his physical strength was plain on his face. Then he recovered. He clasped his hands in front of him on top of the desk and looked directly into Hagen's eyes. Tell me everything that happened. He held up one of his hands. No. Wait until Clemens and Tessio arrive so you won't have to tell it all again. It was only a few moments later that the two Capa Regime were escorted into the room by a bodyguard. They saw at once that the Don knew about his son's death because the Don stood up to receive them. They embraced him as old comrades were permitted to do. They all had a drink of anisette, which Hagen poured them before he told them the story that night. Don Corleone asked only one question at the end. Is it? Certain my son is dead. Clemenza answered. Yes. The bodyguards were of Santino's regime, but picked by me. I questioned him when they came to my house. They saw his body in the light of the toll house. He could not live with the wounds they saw. They placed their lives in forfeit for what they say. Don Corleone accepted this final verdict without any sign of emotion, except for a few moments of silence. Then he said, None of you are to concern yourselves with this affair. None of you are to commit any acts of vengeance. None of you are to make any inquiries to track down the murderers of my son without my express command. There will be no further acts of war against the five families without my express and personal wish. 
Her family will cease all business operations and cease to protect any of our business operations until after my son's funeral. Then, we will meet here again and decide what must be done. Tonight, we must do what we can for Santino. We must bury him as a Christian. I will have friends of mine arrange things with the police and all other proper authorities. Clemenza, he will remain with me at all times as my bodyguard, you and the men of your regime. Tessio, he will guard all other members of my family. Tom, I want you to call Amelie Gobonisera and tell him I will need his services at some time during this night. Wait for me at his establishment. It may be an hour, two hours, three hours. Do you all understand that? The three men nodded. Clemenza, get some men in cars and wait for me. I will be ready in a few minutes. Tom, you did well. In the morning I went Constanzia with her mother. Make arrangements for her and her husband to live in the mall. Have Sandra's friends, the women, go to her house to stay with her. My wife will go there also when I have spoken with her. My wife will tell her the misfortune, and the women will arrange for the church to say their masses and prayers for his soul. The Don got up from his leather armchair. The other men rose with him, and Clemenza and Tessio embraced him again. Hagen held the door open for the Don, who paused to look at him for a moment. Then the Don put his hand on Hagen's cheek, embraced him quickly, and said in Italian, You've been a good son. You comfort me telling Hagen that he had acted properly in this terrible time. The Don went up to his bedroom to speak to his wife. It was then that Hagen made the call to Amerigo Bonacera for the undertaker to redeem the favor he owed to the Corleones. Book 5, Chapter 20 The death of Santino Corleone sent shockwaves through the underworld of the nation, and when it became known that Don Corleone had risen from his sickbed to take charge of the family affairs, when spies at the funeral reported that the Don seemed to be fully recovered, the heads of the five families made frantic efforts to prepare a defense against the bloody retaliatory war that was sure to follow. Nobody made the mistake of assuming that Don Corleone could be held cheaply because of his past misfortunes. He was a man who had made only a few mistakes in his career and had learned from every one of them. Only Hagen guessed the Don's real intentions and was not surprised when emissaries were sent to the five families to propose a peace not only to propose a peace, but a meeting of all the families in the city and with invitations to families all over the United States to attend. Since the New York families were the most powerful in the country, it was understood that their welfare affected the welfare of the country as a whole. At first, there were suspicions. Was Don Corleone preparing a trap? Was he trying to throw his enemies off their guard? Was he attempting to prepare a wholesale massacre to avenge his son? But Don Corleone soon made it clear he was sincere. Not only did he involve all the families in the country in this meeting, but made no move to put his own people on a war footing or to enlist allies. And then he took the final irrevocable step that established the authenticity of these intentions and assured the safety of the Grand Council to be assembled. He called on the services of the Bocchicchio family. The Bocchicchio family was unique in that once a particularly ferocious branch of the Mafia in Sicily, it had become an instrument of peace in America. Once a group of men who earned their living by a savage determination, they now earned their living in what perhaps could be called a saintly fashion. The Bocchicchio's one asset was a closely knit structure of blood relationships, a family loyalty, severe even for a society where family loyalty came before loyalty to a wife. The Bocchicchio family, extending out to third cousins, had once numbered nearly 200 when they ruled the particular economy of a small section of southern Sicily. The income for the entire family then came from four or five flour mills, by no means owned communally, but assuring labor and bread and a minimal security for all family members. This was enough, with intermarriages, for them to present a common front against their enemies. No competing mill, no dam that would create a water supply to their competitors or ruin their own selling of water was allowed to be built in their corner of Sicily. A powerful land-owning baron once tried to erect his own mill strictly for his personal use. The mill was burned down. He called on the Carabinieri and higher authorities, who arrested three of the Bocchicchio family. Even before the trial, the manor house of the baron was torched. The indictment and accusations were withdrawn. A few months later, one of the highest functionaries in the Italian government arrived in Sicily and tried to solve the chronic water shortage of that island by proposing a huge dam. 
Engineers arrived from Rome to do surveys while watched by grim natives, members of the Bocchicchio clan. Police flooded the area, housed in a specially built barracks. It looked like nothing could stop the dam from being built, and supplies and equipment had actually been unloaded in Palermo. That was as far as they got. The Bocchicchios had contacted fellow Mafia chiefs and extracted agreements for their aid. The heavy equipment was sabotaged, the lighter equipment stolen. Mafia deputies in the Italian parliament launched a bureaucratic counterattack against the planners. This went on for several years, and in that time, Mussolini came to power. The dictator decreed that the dam must be built. It was not. The dictator had known that the Mafia would be a threat to his regime, forming what amounted to a separate authority from his own. He gave full powers to a high police official who promptly solved the problem by throwing everybody into jail or deporting them to penal work islands. In a few short years, he had broken the power of the Mafia simply by arbitrarily arresting anyone even suspected of being a mafioso, and so also brought ruin to a great many innocent families. The Bocchicchios had been rash enough to resort to force against this unlimited power. Half of the men were killed in armed combat, the other half deported to penal island colonies. There were only a handful left when arrangements were made for them to emigrate to America via the clandestine underground route of jumping ship through Canada. There were almost 20 immigrants, and they settled in a small town not far from New York City in the Hudson Valley, where, by starting at the very bottom, they worked their way up to owning a garbage hauling firm and their own trucks. They became prosperous because they had no competition. They had no competition because competitors found their trucks burned and sabotaged. One persistent fellow who undercut prices was found buried in the garbage he'd picked up during the day, smothered to death. But as the men married to Sicilian girls, needless to say, children came, and the garbage business, though providing a living, was not really enough to pay for the finer things America had to offer. And so, as a diversification, the Bocchicchio family became negotiators and hostages in the peace efforts of warring mafia families. A strain of stupidity ran through the Bocchicchio clan, or perhaps they were just primitive. In any case, they recognized their limitations and knew they could not compete with other mafia families in the struggle to organize and control more sophisticated business structures like prostitution, gambling, dope, and public fraud. They were straight-from-the-shoulder people who could offer a gift to an ordinary patrolman but did not know how to approach a political bagman. They had only two assets, their honor and their ferocity. And Bocchicchio never lied, never committed an act of treachery. Such behavior was too complicated. Also, a Bocchicchio never forgot an injury and never left it unavenged, no matter what the cost. And so, by accident, they stumbled into what would prove to be their most lucrative profession. When warring families wanted to make peace and arrange a parley, the Bocchicchio clan was contacted. The head of the clan would handle the initial negotiations and arrange for the necessary hostages. For instance, when Michael had gone to meet Salazzo, a Bocchicchio had been left with the Corleone family as surety for Michael's safety, the service paid for by Salazzo. If Michael were killed by Salazzo, then the Bocchicchio male hostage held by the Corleone family would be killed by the Corleones. In this case, the Bocchicchios would take their vengeance on Salazzo as the cause of their clansmen's death. Since the Bocchicchios were so primitive, they never let anything, any kind of punishment, stand in their way of vengeance. They would give up their own lives, and there was no protection against them if they were betrayed. A Bocchicchio hostage was guilt-edged insurance. And so now, when Don Corleone employed the Bocchicchios as negotiators and arranged for them to supply hostages for all the families to come to the peace meeting, there could be no question as to his sincerity. There could be no question of treachery. The meeting would be safe as a wedding. Hostages given, the meeting took place in the director's conference room of a small commercial bank whose president was indebted to Don Corleone, and indeed some of whose stock belonged to Don Corleone, though it was in the president's name. The president always treasured that moment when he had offered to give Don Corleone a written document proving his ownership of the shares to preclude any treachery. Don Corleone had been horrified. He told the president, I would trust you with my whole fortune. I would trust you with my life and the welfare of my children. It is inconceivable to me that you would ever trick me or otherwise betray me. My whole world, all my faith in my judgment of human character would collapse. Of course, I have my own written record so that if something should happen to me, my heirs would know that you hold something in trust for them. But I know that even if I were not here in this world to guard the interests of my children, you would be faithful to their needs. The president of the bank, though not Sicilian, was a man of tender sensibilities. He understood the Don perfectly. Now, the godfather's request 
was the president's command. And so, on a Saturday afternoon, the executive suite of the bank, the conference room with its deep leather chairs, its absolute privacy, was made available to the families. Security at the bank was taken over by a small army of hand-picked men wearing bank guard uniforms. At 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, the conference room began to fill up. Besides the five families of New York, there were representatives from ten other families across the country, with the exception of Chicago, that black sheep of their world. They had given up trying to civilize Chicago, and they saw no point in including those mad dogs in this important conference. A bar had been set up and a small buffet. Each representative to the conference had been allowed one aide. Most of the dons had brought their consiglieres as aides, so there were comparatively few young men in the room. Tom Hagen was one of those young men, and the only one who was not Sicilian. He was an object of curiosity, a freak. Hagen knew his manners. He did not speak. He did not smile. He waited on his boss, Don Corleone, with all the respect of a favorite earl waiting on his king, bringing him a cold drink, lighting his cigar, positioning his ashtray, with respect but no obsequiousness. Hagen was the only one in that room who knew the identity of the portraits hanging on the dark paneled walls. They were mostly portraits of fabulous financial figures done in rich oils. One was of Secretary of the Treasury Hamilton. Hagen could not help thinking that Hamilton might have approved of this peace meeting being held in a banking institution. Nothing was more calming, more conducive to pure reason, than the atmosphere of money. The arrival time had been staggered for between 9.30 to 10 a.m. Don Corleone, in a sense the host, since he had initiated the peace talks, had been the first to arrive. One of his many virtues was punctuality. The next to arrive was Carlo Tramonte, who had made the southern part of the United States his territory. He was an impressively handsome middle-aged man, tall for a Sicilian, with a very deep sunburn, exquisitely tailored and barbered. He did not look Italian. He looked more like one of those pictures in the magazines of millionaire fishermen lolling on their yachts. The Tramonte family earned its livelihood from gambling, and no one meeting their Don would ever guess with what ferocity he had won his empire. Emigrating from Sicily as a small boy, he had settled in Florida and grown to manhood there, employed by the American syndicate of southern small-town politicians who controlled gambling. These were very tough men, backed up by very tough police officials, and they never suspected that they could be overthrown by such a greenhorn immigrant. They were unprepared for his ferocity and could not match it, simply because the rewards being fought over were not, to their minds, worth so much bloodshed. Tremonti won over the police with bigger shares of the gross. He exterminated those redneck hooligans who ran their operation with such a complete lack of imagination. It was Tremonti who opened ties with Cuba and the Batista regime and eventually poured money into the pleasure resorts of Havana gambling houses, whorehouses, to lure gamblers from the American mainland. Tremonti was now a millionaire many times over and owned one of the most luxurious hotels in Miami Beach. When he came into the conference room, followed by his aide, an equally sunburned consigliere, Tremonti embraced Don Corleone, made a face of sympathy to show he sorrowed for the dead son. Other Dons were arriving. They all knew each other. They had met over the years, either socially or when in the pursuit of their businesses. They had always showed each other professional courtesies, and in their younger, leaner days had done each other little services. The second Don to arrive was Joseph Zalucki from Detroit. The Zalucki family, under appropriate disguises and covers, owned one of the horse racing tracks in the Detroit area. They also owned a good part of the gambling. Saluki was a moon-faced, amiable-looking man who lived in a $100,000 house in the fashionable Gross Point section of Detroit. One of his sons had married into an old, well-known American family. Saluki, like Don Corleone, was sophisticated. Detroit had the lowest incidence of physical violence of any of the cities controlled by the families. There had been only two executions in the last three years in that city. He disapproved of traffic and drugs. Zalucchi had brought his consigliere with him, and both men came to Don Corleone to embrace him. Zalucchi had a booming American voice with only the slightest trace of an accent. He was conservatively dressed, very businessman, and with a hearty goodwill to match. He said to Don Corleone, Only your voice could have brought me here. Don Corleone bowed his head in thanks. He could count on Zalucchi for support. The next two Dons to arrive were from the West Coast, motoring from there in the same car since they worked together closely in any case. They were Frank Falcone and Anthony Molinari, and both were younger than any of the other men who would come to the meeting, in their early forties. They were dressed a little more informally than the others, there was a touch of Hollywood in their style, and they were a little more friendly than necessary. Frank Falcone controlled the movie unions and the gambling at the studios, plus a complex of pipeline prostitution that supplied girls to the whorehouses of the states in the far west. 
It was not in the realm of possibility for any Don to become showbiz, but Falcone had just a touch. His fellow Dons distrusted him accordingly. Anthony Molinari controlled the waterfronts of San Francisco and was preeminent in the empire of sports gambling. He came of Italian fisherman stock and owned the best San Francisco seafood restaurant, in which he took such pride that the legend had it he lost money on the enterprise by giving too good value for the prices charged. He had the impassive face of the professional gambler, and it was known that he also had something to do with dope smuggling over the Mexican border and from the ships plying the lanes of the Oriental Oceans. Their aides were young, powerfully built men, obviously not counselors, but bodyguards, though they would not dare to carry arms to this meeting. It was general knowledge that these bodyguards knew karate, a fact that amused the other dons but did not alarm them in the slightest, no more than if the California dons had come wearing amulets blessed by the Pope, though it must be noted that some of these men were religious and believed in God. Next arrived the representative from the family in Boston. This was the only don who did not have the respect of his fellows. He was known as a man who did not do right by his people, who cheated them unmercifully. This could be forgiven. Each man measures his own greed. What could not be forgiven was that he could not keep order in his empire. The Boston area had too many murders, too many petty wars for power, too many unsupported freelance activities. It flouted the law too brazenly. If the Chicago Mafia were savages, then the Boston people were gavunis, or uncouth louts, ruffians. The Boston Don's name was Dominic Panza. He was short, squat. As one Don put it, he looked like a thief. The Cleveland Syndicate, perhaps the most powerful of the strictly gambling operations in the United States, was represented by a sensitive-looking elderly man with gaunt features and snow-white hair. He was known, of course, not to his face, as the Jew, because he had surrounded himself with Jewish assistants rather than Sicilians. It was even rumored that he would have named a Jew as his consigliere if he had dared. In any case, as Don Corleone's family was known as the Irish Gang because of Hagen's membership, so Don Vincent Forlenz's family was known as the Jewish family, with somewhat more accuracy. But he ran an extremely efficient organization, and he was not known ever to have fainted at the sight of blood, despite his sensitive features. He ruled with an iron hand in a velvet political glove. The representatives of the five families of New York were the last to arrive, and Tom Hagen was struck by how much more imposing, impressive, these five men were than the out-of-towners, the Hicks. For one thing, the five New York Dons were in the old Sicilian tradition. They were men with a belly, meaning figuratively power and courage, and literally physical flesh, as if the two went together, as indeed they seem to have done in Sicily. The five New York Dons were stout, corpulent men with massive leonine heads, features on a large scale, fleshy imperial noses, thick mouths, heavy folded cheeks. They were not too well tailored or barbered. They had the look of no-nonsense busy men without vanity. There was Anthony Stracci, who controlled the New Jersey area and the shipping on the west side docks of Manhattan. He ran the gambling in Jersey and was very strong with the Democratic political machine. He had a fleet of freight-hauling trucks that made him a fortune primarily because his trucks could travel with a heavy overload and not be stopped and fined by highway weight inspectors. These trucks helped ruin the highways, and then his road-building firm, with lucrative state contracts, repaired the damage wrought. It was the kind of operation that would warm any man's heart, business of itself, creating more business. Stracci, too, was old-fashioned and never dealt in prostitution. But because his business was on the waterfront, it was impossible for him not to be involved in the drug-smuggling traffic. Of the five New York families opposing the Corleones, his was the least powerful, but the most well-disposed. The family that controlled Upper New York State, that arranged smuggling of Italian immigrants from Canada, all upstate gambling, and exercised veto power on state licensing of racing tracks, was headed by Otilio Cuneo. This was a completely disarming man with the face of a jolly, round peasant baker, whose legitimate activity was one of the big milk companies. Cuneo was one of those men who loved children and carried a pocket full of sweets in the hopes of being able to pleasure one of his many grandchildren or the small offspring of his associates. He wore a round fedora with the brim turned down all the way round like a woman's sun hat, which broadened his already moon-shaped face into the very mask of joviality. He was one of the few dons who had never been arrested and whose true activities had never even been suspected, so much so that he had served on civic committees and had been voted as Businessman of the Year for the state of New York by the Chamber of Commerce. The closest ally to the Tattaglia family was Don Emilio Barzini. 
He had some of the gambling in Brooklyn and some in Queens. He had some prostitution. He had strong arm. He completely controlled Staten Island. He had some of the sports betting in the Bronx and Westchester. He was in narcotics. He had close ties to Cleveland and the West Coast. And he was one of the few men shrewd enough to be interested in Las Vegas and Reno, the open cities of Nevada. He also had interests in Miami Beach and Cuba. After the Corleone family, his was perhaps the strongest in New York and therefore in the country. His influence reached even to Sicily. His hand was in every unlawful pie. He was even rumored to have a toehold in Wall Street. He had supported the Tattaglia family with money and influence since the start of the war. It was his ambition to supplant Don Corleone as the most powerful and respected mafia leader in the country and to take over part of the Corleone empire. He was a man much like Don Corleone, but more modern, more sophisticated, more businesslike. He could never be called an old mustache Pete, and he had the confidence of the newer, younger, brasher leaders on their way up. He was a man of great personal force, in a cold way, with none of Don Corleone's warmth, and he was perhaps at this moment the most respected man in the group. The last to arrive was Don Philip Tattaglia, the head of the Tattaglia family that had directly challenged the Corleone power by supporting Salazzo, and had so nearly succeeded. And yet, curiously enough, he was held in a slight contempt by the others. For one thing, it was known that he had allowed himself to be dominated by Salazzo, had in fact been led by the nose by that fine Turkish hand. He was held responsible for all this commotion, this uproar, that had so affected the conduct of everyday business by the New York families. Also, he was a sixty-year-old dandy and woman chaser, and he had ample opportunity to indulge his weaknesses. For the Tatalia family dealt in women. Its main business was prostitution. It also controlled most of the nightclubs in the United States and could place any talent anywhere in the country. Philip Tatalia was not above using strong arm to get control of promising singers and comics and muscling in on record firms. But prostitution was the main source of the family income. His personality was unpleasant to these men. He was a whiner, always complaining of the costs in his family business. Laundry bills, all those towels ate up the profits, but he owned the laundry firm that did the work. The girls were lazy and unstable, running off, committing suicide. The pimps were treacherous and dishonest and without a shred of loyalty. Good help was hard to find. Young lads of Sicilian blood turned up their noses at such work, considered it beneath their honor to traffic and abuse women. Those rascals who would slit a throat with a song in their lips and the cross of an Easter palm in the lapel of their jackets. So, Philip Tatalia would rant on to audiences unsympathetic and contemptuous. His biggest howl was reserved for authorities who had it in their power to issue and cancel liquor licenses for his nightclubs and cabarets. He swore he had made more millionaires than Wall Street with the money he had paid those thieving guardians of official seals. In a curious way, his almost victorious war against the Corleone family had not won him the respect it deserved. They knew his strength had come first from Salazzo and then from the Barzini family. Also, the fact that with the advantage of surprise, he had not won complete victory was evidence against him. If he had been more efficient, all this trouble could have been avoided. The death of Don Corleone would have meant the end of the war. It was proper, since they had both lost sons in their war against each other, that Don Corleone and Philip Tattaglia should acknowledge each other's presence only with a formal nod. Don Corleone was the object of attention, the other men studying him to see what mark of weakness had been left on him by his wounds and defeats. The puzzling factor was why Don Corleone had sued for peace after the death of his favorite son. It was an acknowledgment of defeat. It would almost surely lead to a lessening of his power. But they would soon know. There were greetings. There were drinks to be served. And almost another half hour went by before Don Corleone took his seat at the polished walnut table. Unobtrusively, Hagen sat in the chair slightly to the Don's left and behind him. This was the signal for the other Don's to make their way to the table. Their aides sat behind them, the consigliere up close, so that they could offer any advice when needed. Don Corleone was the first to speak, and he spoke as if nothing had happened, as if he had not been grievously wounded and his eldest son slain, his empire in a shambles, his personal family scattered, Freddy in the west and under the protection of the Molinari family, and Michael secreted in the wastelands of Sicily. He spoke, naturally, in Sicilian dialect. I want to thank you all for coming. I consider it a service done to me personally, and I am in the debt of each and every one of you. And so, I will say at the beginning that I am here not to quarrel or convince, but only to reason, and, as a reasonable man, do everything possible for us all, to part friends here, too. I give my word on that, and some of you who know me well know that I do not give my word lightly. Ah, oh, well. 
Let's get down to business. We are all honorable men here. We don't have to give each other assurances as if we were lawyers. He paused. None of the others spoke. Some were smoking cigars, others sipping their drinks. All of these men were good listeners, patient men. They had one other thing in common. They were those rarities, men who had refused to accept the rule of organized society, men who refused the dominion of other men. There was no force, no mortal man who could bend them to their will unless they wished it. They were men who guarded their free will with wiles and murder. Their wills could be subverted only by death or the utmost reasonableness. Don Corleone sighed. How did things ever go so far? Well, no matter. A lot of foolishness has come to pass. It was so unfortunate, so unnecessary. But let me tell what happened as I see it. He paused to see if someone would object to his telling his side of the story. Thank God my health has been restored and maybe I can help set this affair aright. Perhaps my son was too rash, too headstrong. I don't say no to that. Anyway, let me just say that Salazzo came to me with a business affair in which he asked me for my money and my influence. He said he had the interest of the Tataria family. The affair involved drugs, in which I have no interest. I'm a quiet man, and such endeavors are too lively for my taste. I explained this to Salazzo. With all respect for him and the Tataria family, I gave him my no. With all courtesy, I told him his business would not interfere with mine, that I had no objection to his earning his living in this fashion. He took it ill and brought misfortune down on all our heads. Well, that's life. Everyone here could tell his own tale of sorrow. That's not to my purpose. Don Corleone paused and motioned to Hagen for a cold drink, which Hagen swiftly furnished him. Don Corleone wet his mouth. I'm willing to make the peace. Tataria has lost his son. I have lost his son. We are quits. What would the world come to if people kept carrying grudges against all reason? That has been the cross of Sicily, where men are so busy with vendettas they have no time to earn bread for their families. It's foolishness. So... I say now, let things be as they were before. I have not taken any steps to learn who betrayed and killed my son. Given peace, I will not do so. I have a son who cannot come home and I must receive assurances that when I arrange matters so that he can return safely, that there will be no interference, no danger from the authorities. Once that's settled, maybe we can talk about other matters that interest us and do ourselves, all of us. A profitable service today. Corleone gestured expressively, submissively, with his hands. That is all I want. It was very well done. It was the Don Corleone of old, reasonable, pliant, soft-spoken. But every man there had noted that he had claimed good health, which meant he was a man not to be held cheaply despite the misfortunes of the Corleone family. It was noted that he had said the discussion of other business was useless until the peace he asked for was given. It was noted that he had asked for the old status quo, that he would lose nothing despite his having got the worst of it over the past year. However, it was Emilio Barzini who answered Don Corleone, not Tatalia. He was curt and to the point without being rude or insulting. That is all true enough, but there's a little more. Don Corleone is too modest. The fact is that Solazzo and the Tatalias could not go into their new business without the assistance of Don Corleone. In fact, his disapproval injured them. And it's not his fault, of course. The fact remains that the judges and politicians who would accept the favors from Don Corleone, even on drugs, would not allow themselves to be influenced by anybody else when it came to narcotics. Salazzo couldn't operate if he didn't have some insurance of his people being treated gently. We all know that. We would all be poor men otherwise. 
And now that they have increased the penalties, the judges and the prosecuting attorneys drive a hard bargain when one of our people get in trouble with the narcotics. Even a Sicilian sentenced to twenty years might break the Omertar and talk his brains out. That can't happen. Don Corleone controls all that apparatus. His refusal to let us use it is not the act of a friend. He takes the bread out of the mouths of our families. Times have changed. It's not like the old days when everyone can go his own way. If Corleone has all of the judges in New York, then he must share them or let us others use them. Certainly he can present a bill for such services. <laughs> We're not communists, after all. Eh? <laughs> but he has to let us draw water from the well. It's that simple. When Barzini had finished talking, there was a silence. The lines were now drawn. There could be no return to the old status quo. What was more important was that Barzini, by speaking out, was saying that if peace was not made, he would openly join the Tatalias in their war against the Corleone. And he had scored a telling point. Their lives and their fortunes depended upon their doing each other services. The denial of a favor asked by a friend was an act of aggression. Favors were not asked lightly, and so could not be lightly refused. Don Corleone finally spoke to answer. My friends, I didn't refuse out of spite. You all know me. When have I ever refused an accommodation? That's simply not in my nature. But I had to refuse this time. Why? Because I think this drug business will destroy us in the years to come. There's too much strong feeling about such traffic in this country. It's not like whiskey or gambling or even women, which most people want and is forbidden them by the Petsonavanti of the church and the government. But drugs are dangerous for everyone connected with them. It could jeopardize all other business. And let me say, I am flattered by the belief that I am so powerful with the judges and law officials and I wish it were true. I do have some influence, but many of the people who respect my counsel might lose this respect if drugs become involved in our relationship. They are afraid to be involved in such business, and they have strong feelings about it. Even policemen who help us in gambling and other things would refuse to help us in drugs. So, to ask me to perform a service in these matters is to ask me to do a disservice to myself. But I'm willing to do even that. If all of you think it proper in order to adjust other matters. When Don Corleone had finished speaking, the room became much more relaxed with more whisperings and crosstalk. He had conceded the important point. He would offer his protection to any organized business venture in drugs. He was, in effect, agreeing almost entirely to Salazzo's original proposal if that proposal was endorsed by the national group gathered here. It was understood that he would never participate in the operational phase, nor would he invest his money. He would merely use his protective influence with the legal apparatus. But this was a formidable concession. The Don of Los Angeles, Frank Falcone, spoke to answer. There's no way of stopping our people from going into that business. They go in on their own, and they get in trouble. There's too much money in it to resist. So it's more dangerous if we don't go in. At least if we control it, we can cover it better, organize it better, make sure it causes less trouble. Being in it is not so bad. There has to be control. There has to be protection. There has to be organization. We can't have everybody running around doing just what they please, like a bunch of anarchists. The Don of Detroit, more friendly to Corleone than any of the others, also now spoke against his friend's position in the interest of reasonableness. I don't believe in drugs. For years I paid my people extra so they wouldn't do that kind of business. But it didn't matter. It didn't help. Somebody comes to them and says, I have powders. If you put up the three, four thousand dollar investment, we can make fifty thousand distributing. Who can resist such a profit? And they are so busy with their little side business, they neglect the work I pay them to do. There's more money in drugs. It's getting bigger all the time. There's no way to stop it, so we have to control the business and keep it respectable. I don't want any of it near schools. I don't want any of it sold to children. That is an infamita. In my city, I would try to keep the traffic in the dark people, the colored. They are the best customers, the least troublesome, and they are animals anyway. 
They have no respect for their wives or their families or for themselves. Let them lose their souls with drugs. But something has to be done. We just can't let people do as they please and make trouble for everyone. This speech of the Detroit Don was received with loud murmurs of approval. He had hit the nail on the head. You couldn't even pay people to stay out of the drug traffic. As for his remarks about children, that was his well-known sensibility, his tender-heartedness speaking. After all, who would sell drugs to children? Where would children get the money? As for his remarks about the coloreds, that was not even heard. The Negroes were considered of absolutely no account, of no force whatsoever. That they had allowed society to grind them into the dust proved them of no account, and his mentioning them in any way proved that the Don of Detroit had a mind that always wavered toward irrelevancies. All the Don spoke. All of them deplored the traffic in drugs as a bad thing that would cause trouble, but agreed there was no way to control it. There was simply too much money to be made in the business. Therefore, it followed that there would be men who would dare anything to dabble in it. That was human nature. It was finally agreed. Drug traffic would be permitted, and Don Corleone must give it some legal protection in the East. It was understood that the Barzini and Tatalia families would do most of the large-scale operations. With this out of the way, the conference was able to move on to other matters of a wider interest. There were many complex problems to be solved. It was agreed that Las Vegas and Miami were to be open cities where any of the families could operate. They all recognized that these were the cities of the future. It was also agreed that no violence would be permitted in these cities and that petty criminals of all types were to be discouraged. It was agreed that in momentous affairs, in executions that were necessary but might cause too much of a public outcry, the execution must be approved by this council. It was agreed that button men and other soldiers were to be restrained from violent crimes and acts of vengeance against each other on personal matters. It was agreed that families would do each other services when requested, such as providing executioners technical assistance in pursuing certain courses of action, such as bribing jurors, which in some instances could be vital. These discussions, informal, colloquial, and on a high level, took time and were broken by lunch and drinks from the buffet bar. Finally, Don Barzini sought to bring the meeting to an end. That's the whole matter, then. We have the peace, and let me pay my respects to Don Corleone, whom we have all known over the years as a man of his word. If there are any more differences, we can meet again. We need not to become foolish again. On my part, the road is new and fresh. I'm glad this is all settled. Only Philip Tatalia was a little worried still. The murder of Santino Corleone made him the most vulnerable person in this group if war broke out again. He spoke at length for the first time. I've agreed to everything here. I'm willing to forget my own misfortune. But I would like to hear some strict assurances from Corleone. Will he attempt any individual vengeance? When time goes by and his position perhaps becomes stronger, Will he forget that we have sworn our friendship? How am I to know that in three or four years he won't feel that he's been ill-served, forced against his will to this agreement, and so free to break it? Will we have to guard against each other all the time, or can we truly go in peace with peace of mind? Would Corleone give us all his assurances, as I now give mine? It was then that Don Corleone gave the speech that would be long remembered, and that reaffirmed his position as the most far-seeing statesman among them, so full of common sense, so direct from the heart and to the heart of the matter. In it, he coined a phrase that was to become as famous, in its way, as Churchill's Iron Curtain, though not public knowledge until more than ten years later. For the first time, he stood up to address the council. He was short, and a little thin from his illness. Perhaps his sixty years showed a bit more, but there was no question that he had regained all his former strength and had all his wits. What matter of men are we then if we do not have our reason? We are all no better than beasts in a jungle, if that were the case. But we have reason. We can reason with each other, and we can reason with ourselves. To what purpose would I start all these troubles again, the violence and the turmoil? My son is dead, and that is a misfortune, and I must bear it, not make the innocent world around me suffer with me. And so I say, I give my honor that I will never seek vengeance. 
I will never seek knowledge of the deeds that have been done in the past. I will leave here with a pure heart. Let me say that we must always look to our interests. We are all men who have refused to be fools, who have refused to be puppets dancing on a string, pulled by the men on high. We have been fortunate here in this country. Already most of our children have found a better life. Some of you have sons who are professors, scientists, musicians. And you are fortunate. Perhaps your grandchildren will become the new Pesinovanti. None of us here want to see our children follow in our footsteps. It's too hard a life. They can be as others. Their position and security won by our courage. I have grandchildren now, and I hope their children may someday, who knows, be a governor, a president. Nothing's impossible here in America, but we have to progress with the times. The time has passed for guns and killings and massacres. We have to be cunning, like the business people. There's more money in it, and it's better for our children and our grandchildren. As for our own deeds, we are not responsible for the 90 calibers, the pets and the bodies who take it upon themselves to decide what we shall do with our lives, who declare wars they wish us to fight in to protect what they own. Who is to say we should obey the laws they make for their own interest and to our hurt? And who are they, then, to meddle when we look after our own interests? Sona Cosa Nostra. These are our own affairs. We will manage our world for ourselves because it is our world, Cosa Nostra. And so, we have to stick together to guard against outside meddlers. Otherwise, they will put the ring in our nose as they have put the ring on the nose of all the millions of Neapolitans and other Italians in this country. For this reason, I forego my vengeance for my dead son. For the common good, I swear, now that as long as I am responsible for the actions of my family, there will not be one finger lifted against any man here without just cause and utmost provocation. I am willing to sacrifice my commercial interests for the common good. This is my word. This is my honor. And there are those of you here who know I have never betrayed either. Monk, I have a selfish interest. My youngest son had to flee, accused of Salazzo's murder and that of a police captain. I must now make arrangements so that he can come home with safety, cleared of all these false charges. That is my affair, and I will make those arrangements. I must find the real culprits, perhaps, or perhaps I must convince the authorities of his innocence. Perhaps the witnesses and informants will recant their lies. But again, I say, this is my affair, and I believe I will be able to bring my son home. But let me say this. I am a superstitious man, a ridiculous feeling, but I must confess it here. And so if some unlucky accident should befall my youngest son, if... Some police officer should accidentally shoot him. If he should hang himself in his cell, if new witnesses appear to testify to his guilt, my superstition will make me feel that it was the result of the ill will still borne me by some people here. Let me go further. If my son is struck by a bolt of lightning, I will blame some of the people here. If his plane should fall into the sea, or his ship sink beneath the waves of the ocean, if he should catch a mortal fever, if his automobile should be struck by a train, such is my superstition that I would blame the ill will felt by people here. Gentlemen, that ill will, that bad luck, I could never forgive. But... Aside from that, let me swear by the souls of my grandchildren that I will never break the peace we have made. After all, are we or are we not better men than those Pezzo Navanti who have killed countless millions of men in our lifetime? With this, Don Corleone stepped from his place and went down the table to where Don Philip Tattaglia was sitting. Tattaglia rose to greet him, and the two men embraced, kissing each other's cheeks. The other Dons in the room applauded and rose to shake hands with everybody in sight and to congratulate Don Corleone and Don Tattaglia on their new friendship.
It was not perhaps the warmest friendship in the world. They would not send each other Christmas gift greetings, but they would not murder each other. That was friendship enough in this world, all that was needed. Since his son Freddy was under the protection of the Molinari family in the West, Don Corleone lingered with the San Francisco Don after the meeting to thank him. Molinari said enough for Don Corleone to gather that Freddy had found his niche out there, was happy, and had become something of a ladies' man. He had a genius for running a hotel, it seemed. Don Corleone shook his head in wonder, as many fathers do, when told of undreamed-of talents in their children. Wasn't it true that sometimes the greatest misfortunes brought unforeseen rewards? They both agreed that this was so. Meanwhile, Corleone made it clear to the San Francisco Don that he was in his debt for the great service done in protecting Freddy. He let it be known that his influence would be exerted so that the important racing wires would always be available to his people, no matter what changes occurred in the power structure in the years to come. An important guarantee, since the struggle over this facility was a constant open wound, complicated by the fact that the Chicago people had their heavy hand in it. But Don Corleone was not without influence even in the land of barbarians, and so his promise was a gift of gold. It was evening before Don Corleone, Tom Hagen, and the bodyguard chauffeur, who happened to be Rocco Lampone, arrived at the mall in Long Beach. When they went into the house, the Don said to Hagen, A driver, that man Lampone, keep an eye on him. He's a fellow worth something better, I think. Hagen wondered at this remark. Lamponi had not said a word all day, had not even glanced at the two men in the back seat. He had opened the door for the Don, the car had been in front of the bank when they emerged, he had done everything correctly, but no more than any well-trained chauffeur might do. Evidently the Don's eye had seen something he had not seen. The Don dismissed Hagen and told him to come back to the house after supper, but to take his time and rest a little, since they would put in a long night of discussion. He also told Hagen to have Clemenza and Tessio present. They should come at 10 p.m., not before. Hagen was to brief Clemenza and Tessio on what had happened at the meeting that afternoon. At 10, the Don was waiting for the three men in his office, the corner room of the house with its law library and special phone. There was a tray with whiskey bottles, ice, and soda water. The Don gave his instructions. We made the peace this afternoon. I gave my word and my honor, and that should be enough for all of you. But our friends are not so trustworthy, so let's all be on our guard still. We don't want any more nasty little surprises. The Don turned to Hagen. You've let the Bukikio hostages go? Hagen nodded. I called Clemenza as soon as I got home. Corleone turned to the massive Clemenza. The Capo Regime nodded. I released them. Tell me, Godfather, is it possible for Sicilian to be as dumb as the Bukikios pretend to be? Don Corleone smiled a little. They are clever enough to make a good living. Why is it so necessary to be more clever than that? It's not the Bukikios who cause the troubles of this world, but it's true. They haven't got the Sicilian head. They were all in a relaxed mood now that the war was over. Don Corleone himself mixed drinks and brought one to each man. The Don sipped his carefully and lit up a cigar. I want nothing set forth to discover what happened to Sonny. That's done with and to be forgotten. I want all cooperation with the other families, even if they become a little greedy and we don't get our proper share in things. I want nothing to break this peace, no matter what the provocation, until we found a way to bring Michael home. And I want that to be first thing on your minds. Remember this. When he comes back, he must come back in absolute safety. I don't mean from the Tatarias or the Barzinis. What I'm concerned about are the police. Sure. We can get rid of the real evidence against him. That waiter won't testify, nor that spectator or gunman or whatever he was. The real evidence is the least of our worries since we know about it. What we have to worry about is the police framing false evidence because their informers have assured them that Michael Corleone is the man who killed their captain. Very well. We have to demand that the five families do everything in their power to correct this belief of the police. All their informers who work with the police must come up with new stories. I think after my speech this afternoon, they will understand it is to their interest to do so. But that's not enough. We have to come up with something special, so Michael won't ever have to worry about that again. Otherwise, there's no point in him coming back to this country. So, let's all think about that. That's the most important matter. Now... Any man should be allowed one foolishness in his life. I have had mine. 
I want all the land around the mall bought, the houses bought. I don't want any man able to look out his window into my garden even if it's a mile away. I want a fence around the mall and I want the mall to be on full protection all the time. I want a gate in that fence. In short, I wish now to live in a fortress. Let me say to you now that I will never go into this city to work again. I will be semi-retired. I feel an urge to work in the garden, to make a little wine when the grapes are in season. I want to live in my house. The only time I leave is to go on a little vacation or to see someone on important business and then I want all precautions taken. Now, don't take this amiss. I'm not preparing anything. I'm being prudent. I've always been a prudent man. There's nothing I find so little to my taste as carelessness in life. Women and children can afford to be careless. Men cannot. Be leisurely. In all these things, no frantic preparations to alarm our friends. It can be done in such a way as to seem natural. Now, I'm going to leave things more and more up to each of you three. I want the Santino regime disbanded and the men placed in your regimes. And that should reassure our friends and show that I mean peace. Tom, I want you to put together a group of men who will go to Las Vegas and give me a full report on what is going on out there. Tell me about Fredo, what's really happening out there. I hear I wouldn't recognize my own son. It seems he's a cook now, that he amuses himself with young girls more than a grown man should. Well, he was always too serious when he was young, and he was never the man for family business. Well, let's find out what really can be done out there. Hagen said quietly, should we send your son-in-law? After all, Carlo is a native of Nevada. He knows his way around. Don Corleone shook his head. No. My wife is lonely here without any of her children. I want Constanze and her husband moved into one of the houses on the mall. I want Carlo given a responsible job. Maybe I've been too harsh on him and... Don Corleone made a grimace. I'm short of sons. Take him out of the gambling and put him in with the unions where he can do some paperwork and a lot of talking. He's a good talker. There was the tiniest note of contempt in the Don's voice. Hagen nodded. Okay, Clemenza and I will go over all the people and put together a group to do the Vegas job. Do you want me to call Freddy home for a few days? The Don shook his head. What for? My wife can still cook our meals. Let him stay out there. The three men shifted uneasily in their seats. They had not realized Freddy was in such severe disfavor with his father, and they suspected it must be because of something they did not know. Don Corleone sighed. I hope to grow some good green peppers and tomatoes in the garden this year. More than we can eat. I'll make you presents of them. I want a little peace. A little quiet and tranquility for my old age. Well, that's all. Have another drink if you like. It was a dismissal. The men rose. Hagen accompanied Clemenza and Tessio to their cars and arranged meetings with them to thrash out the operational details that would accomplish the stated desires of their Don. Then he went back into the house, where he knew Don Corleone would be waiting for him. Hagen accompanied Clemenza and Tessio to their cars and arranged meetings with them to thrash out the operational details that would accomplish the stated desires of their Don. Then he went back into the house, where he knew Don Corleone would be waiting for him. The Don had taken off his jacket and tie and was lying down on the couch. His stern face was relaxed into lines of fatigue. He waved Hagen into a chair. Well, consigliere, do you disapprove of any of my deeds today? Hagen took his time answering. No, but I don't find it consistent nor true to your nature. You say you don't want to find out how Santino was killed or want vengeance for it. I don't believe that. You gave your word for peace and so you'll keep the peace. But I can't believe you will give your enemies the victory they seem to have won today. You've constructed a magnificent riddle that I can't solve. So how can I approve or disapprove? A look of content came over the Don's face. Well, you know me better than anyone else. Even though you're not a Sicilian, I made you one. Everything you say is true, but there's a solution, and you'll comprehend it before it spins out to the end. You agree everyone has to take my word. 
and I'll keep my word. And I want my orders obeyed exactly. But, Tom, the most important thing is we have to get Michael home as soon as possible. Make that first in your mind and in your work. Explore all the legal alleys. I don't care how much money you have to spend. It has to be foolproof when he comes home. Consult the best lawyers on criminal law. I'll give you the names of some judges who'll give you a private audience. Until that time, we have to guard against all treacheries. Like you, I'm not worried so much about the real evidence as the evidence they will manufacture. Also, some police friend may kill Michael after he's arrested. They may kill him in his cell or have one of the prisoners do it. As I see it, we can't even afford to have him arrested or accused. Don Corleone sighed. I know, I know. That's the difficulty. But we can't take too long. There are troubles in Sicily. The young fellows over there don't listen to their elders anymore. And a lot of the men deported from America are just too much for the old-fashioned Dons to handle. Michael could get caught in between. I've taken some precautions against that, and he's still got a good cover, but that cover won't last forever. That's one of the reasons I had to make the peace. Barzini has friends in Sicily, and they were beginning to sniff Michael's trail. That gives you one of the answers to your riddle. I had to make the peace to ensure my son's safety. There was nothing else to do. Hagen didn't bother asking the Don how he had gotten this information. He was not even surprised. And it was true that this solved part of the riddle. When I meet with Tatalia's people to firm up the details, should I insist that all his drug middlemen be clean? The judges will be a little skittish about giving light sentences to a man with a record. Don Corleone shrugged. They should be smart enough to figure that out themselves. Mention it. Don't insist. We'll do our best, but if they use a real snowbird and he gets caught, we won't lift a finger. We'll just tell them nothing can be done. But Borzini is a man who will know that without being told. You notice how he never committed himself in this affair? One might never have known he was in any way concerned. That is a man who doesn't get caught on the losing side. Hagen was startled. You mean he was behind Solazzo and Tatalia all the time? Don Corleone sighed. Tatalia is a pimp. He could never have outfought Santino. That's why I don't have to know about what happened. It's enough to know that Barzini had a hand in it. Hagen let this sink in. The Don was giving him clues. But there was something very important left out. Hagen knew what it was, but he knew it was not his place to ask. He said good night and turned to go. The Don had a last word for him. Remember, use all your wits for a plan to bring Michael home. And one other thing. Arrange with the telephone man so that every month I get a list of all the telephone calls made and received by Clemenza and Tessio. I suspect them of nothing. I would swear they would never betray me. But there's no harm in knowing any little thing that may help us before the event. Hagen nodded and went out. He wondered if the Don was keeping a check on him also in some way, and then was ashamed of his suspicion. But now he was sure that in the subtle and complex mind of the Godfather, a far-ranging plan of action was being initiated that made the day's happenings no more than a tactical retreat. And there was that one dark fact that no one mentioned, that he himself had not dared to ask, that Don Corleone ignored. All pointed to a day of reckoning in the future. Chapter 21 but it was to be nearly another year before Don Corleone could arrange for his son Michael to be smuggled back into the United States. During that time, the whole family racked their brains for suitable schemes. Even Carlo Rizzi was listened to, now that he was living in the mall with Connie. During that time, they had a second child, a boy. But none of the schemes met with the Don's approval. Finally, it was the Bocchicchio family, who, through a misfortune of its own, solved the problem. There was one Bocchicchio, a young cousin of no more than 25 years of age, named Felix, who was born in America and with more brains than anyone in the clan had ever had before. He had refused to be drawn into the family garbage hauling business and married a nice American girl of English stock to further his split from the clan. He went to school at night to become a lawyer and worked during the day as a civil service post office clerk. During that time he had three children, but his wife was a prudent manager and they lived on his salary until he got his law degree. 
Now, Felix Bocchicchio, like many young men, thought that having struggled to complete his education and master the tools of his profession, his virtue would automatically be rewarded and he would earn a decent living. This proved not to be the case. Still proud, he refused all help from his clan. But a lawyer friend of his, a young man well-connected and with a budding career in a big law firm, talked Felix into doing him a little favor. It was very complicated, seemingly legal, and had to do with a bankruptcy fraud. It was a million-to-one shot against its being found out. Felix Bocchicchio took the chance. Since the fraud involved using the legal skills he had learned in a university, it seemed not so reprehensible and, in an odd way, not even criminal. To make a foolish story short, the fraud was discovered. The lawyer friend refused to help Felix in any manner, refused to even answer his telephone calls. The two principals in the fraud, shrewd, middle-aged businessmen who furiously blamed Felix Bocchicchio's legal clumsiness for the plan going awry, pleaded guilty and cooperated with the state, naming Felix Bocchicchio as the ringleader of the fraud and claiming he had used threats of violence to control their business and force them to cooperate with him in his fraudulent schemes. Testimony was given that linked Felix with uncles and cousins in the Bocchicchio clan who had criminal records for strong arm, and this evidence was damning. The two businessmen got off with suspended sentences. Felix Bocchicchio was given a sentence of one to five years and served three of them. The clan did not ask help from any of the families or Don Corleone because Felix had refused to ask their help and had to be taught a lesson. That mercy comes only from the family, that the family is more loyal and more to be trusted than society. In any case, Felix Bocchicchio was released from prison after serving three years, went home and kissed his wife and three children, and lived peacefully for a year, and then showed that he was of the Bocchicchio clan after all. Without any attempt to conceal his guilt, he procured a weapon, a pistol, and shot his lawyer friend to death. He then searched out the two businessmen and calmly shot them, both through the head as they came out of a luncheonette. He left the bodies lying in the street and went into the luncheonette and ordered a cup of coffee, which he drank while he waited for the police to come and arrest him. His trial was swift and his judgment merciless. A member of the criminal underworld had cold-bloodedly murdered state witnesses who had sent him to the prison he richly deserved. It was a flagrant flouting of society, and for once, the public, the press, the structure of society, and even soft-headed and soft-hearted humanitarians were united in their desire to see Felix Bocchicchio in the electric chair. The governor of the state would no more grant him clemency than the officials of the pound spare a mad dog, which was the phrase of one of the governor's closest political aides. The Bocchicchio clan, of course, would spend whatever money was needed for appeals to higher courts. They were proud of him now, but the conclusion was certain. After the legal falderal, which might take a little time, Felix Bocchicchio would die in the electric chair. It was Hagen who brought this case to the attention of the Don at the request of one of the Bocchicchios, who hoped that something could be done for the young man. Don Corleone curtly refused. He was not a magician. People asked him the impossible. But the next day, the Don called Hagen into his office and had him go over the case in the most intimate detail. When Hagen was finished, Don Corleone told him to summon the head of the Bocchicchio clan to the mall for a meeting. What happened next had the simplicity of genius. Don Corleone guaranteed to the head of the Bocchicchio clan that the wife and children of Felix Bocchicchio would be rewarded with a handsome pension. The money for this would be handed over to the Bocchicchio clan immediately. In turn... Felix must confess to the murder of Salazzo and the police captain, McCluskey. There were many details to be arranged. Felix Bocchicchio would have to confess convincingly. That is, he would have to know some of the true details to confess to. Also, he must implicate the police captain in narcotics. Then, the waiter at the Luna restaurant must be persuaded to identify Felix Bocchicchio as the murderer. This would take some courage, as the description would change radically. Felix Bocchicchio being much shorter and heavier... But Don Corleone would attend to that. Also, since the condemned man had been a great believer in higher education and a college graduate, he would want his children to go to college. And so, a sum of money would have to be paid by Don Corleone that would take care of the children's college. Then, the Bocchicchio clan had to be reassured that there was no hope for clemency on the original murders. The new confession, of course, would seal the man's already almost certain doom. Everything was arranged, the money paid and suitable contact made with the condemned man so that he could be instructed and advised. Finally, the plan was sprung, and the confession made headlines in all the newspapers. The whole thing was a huge success. But Don Corleone, cautious as always, waited until Felix Bocchicchio was actually executed four months later before finally giving the command that Michael Corleone 
could return home. Chapter 22 Lucy Mancini, a year after Sonny's death, still missed him terribly, grieved for him more fiercely than any lover in any romance. And her dreams were not the insipid dreams of a schoolgirl, her longings not the longings of a devoted wife. She was not rendered desolate by the loss of her life's companion, or miss him because of his stalwart character. She held no fond remembrances of sentimental gifts, of girlish hero worship, his smile, the amused glint of his eyes when she said something endearing or witty. No, she missed him for the more important reason that he had been the only man in the world who could make her body achieve the act of love, and in her youth and innocence she still believed that he was the only man who could possibly do so. Now, a year later, she sunned herself in the balmy Nevada air. At her feet, the slender, blonde young man was playing with her toes. They were at the side of the hotel pool for the Sunday afternoon, and despite the people all around him, his hand was sliding up her bare thigh. Oh, Jewel, stop. I thought doctors at least weren't as silly as other men. Jules grinned at her. I'm a Las Vegas doctor. He tickled the inside of her thigh and was amazed how just a little thing like that could excite her so powerfully. It showed on her face, though she tried to hide it. She was really a very primitive, innocent girl. Then why couldn't he make her come across? He had to figure that one out. And never mind the crap about a lost love that could never be replaced. This was living tissue here under his hand, and living tissue required other living tissue. Dr. Jules Siegel decided he would make the big push tonight at his apartment. He'd wanted to make her come across without any trickery, but if trickery there had to be, he was the man for it. All in the interest of science, of course, and besides, this poor kid was dying for it. Jules, stop. Please, stop. Her voice was trembling. Jules was immediately contrite. Okay, honey. He put his head in her lap, and using her soft thighs as a pillow, he took a little nap. He was amused at her squirming, the heat that registered from her loins, and when she put her hand on his head to smooth his hair, he grasped her wrist playfully and held it lover-like. But really, to feel her pulse, it was galloping. He'd get her tonight and he'd solve the mystery, what the hell ever it was. Fully confident, Dr. Jules Siegel fell asleep. Lucy watched the people around the pool. She could never have imagined her life would change so in less than two years. She never regretted her foolishness at Connie Corleone's wedding. It was the most wonderful thing that had ever happened to her, and she lived it over and over again in her dreams, as she lived over and over again the months that followed. Sonny had visited her once a week, sometimes more, never less. The days before she saw him again, her body was in torment. Their passion for each other was of the most elementary kind, undiluted by poetry or any form of intellectualism. It was love of the coarsest nature, a fleshly love, a love of tissue for opposing tissue. When Sonny called to tell her he was coming, she made certain there was enough liquor in the apartment and enough food for supper and breakfast, because usually he would not leave until late the next morning. He wanted his fill of her as she wanted her fill of him. He had his own key, and when he came in the door, she would fly into his massive arms. They would both be brutally direct, brutally primitive. During their first kiss, they would be fumbling at each other's clothing, and he would be lifting her in the air, and she would be wrapping her legs around his huge thighs. They would be making love standing up in the foyer of her apartment as if they had to repeat their first act of love together, and then he would carry her so to the bedroom. They would lie in bed making love. They would live together in the apartment for sixteen hours, completely naked. She would cook for him, enormous meals. Sometimes he would get phone calls, obviously about business, but she never even listened to the words. She would be too busy toying with his body, fondling it, kissing it, burying her mouth in it. Sometimes, when he got up to get a drink and he walked by her, she couldn't help reaching out to touch his naked body, hold him, make love to him as if those special parts of his body were a plaything, a specially constructed, intricate, but innocent toy, revealing its known but still surprising ecstasies. At first, she had been ashamed of these excesses on her part, but soon saw that they pleased her lover, that her complete sensual enslavement to his body flattered him. In all this, there was an animal innocence. They were happy together. When Sonny's father was gunned down in the street, she understood for the first time that her lover might be in danger. Alone in her apartment, she did not weep. She wailed aloud, an animal wailing. When Sonny did not come to see her for almost three weeks, she subsisted on sleeping pills, liquor, and her own anguish. The pain she felt was physical pain. Her body ached. When he finally did come, she held onto his body at almost every moment. After that, he came at least once a week, until he was killed. She learned of his death through the newspaper accounts. And that very same night, she took a massive overdose of sleeping pills. 
For some reason, instead of killing, the pills made her so ill that she staggered out into the hall of her apartment and collapsed in front of the elevator door, where she was found and taken to the hospital. Her relationship to Sonny was not generally known, so her case received only a few inches in the tabloid newspapers. It was while she was in the hospital that Tom Hagen came to see her and console her. It was Tom Hagen who arranged a job for her in Las Vegas, working in the hotel run by Sonny's brother, Freddie. It was Tom Hagen who told her that she would receive an annuity from the Corleone family, that Sonny had made provisions for her. He had asked her if she was pregnant, as if that were the reason for her taking the pills, and she had told him no. He asked her if Sonny had come to see her that fatal night, or had called that he would come to see her, and she told him no, that Sonny had not called. That she was always home waiting for him when she finished working, and she had told Hagen the truth. He's the only man I could ever love. I can't love anybody else. She saw him smile a little, but he also looked surprised. Do you find that so unbelievable? Wasn't he the one who brought you home when you were a kid? He was a different person. He grew up to be a different kind of man. Not to me. Maybe to everybody else, but not to me. She was still too weak to explain how Sonny had never been anything but gentle with her. He had never been angry with her, never even irritable or nervous. Hagen made all the arrangements for her to move to Las Vegas. A rented apartment was waiting, he took her to the airport himself, and he made her promise that if she ever felt lonely or if things didn't go right, she would call him and he would help her in any way he could. Before she got on the plane, she asked him hesitantly, Does Sonny's father know what you're doing? Hagen smiled. I'm acting for him as well as myself. He's old-fashioned in these things, and he would never go against the legal wife of his son. But he feels that you were just a young girl, and Sonny should have known better. And you're taking all those pills shook everybody up. He didn't explain how incredible it was to a man like the Don that any person should try suicide. Now, after nearly 18 months in Las Vegas, she was surprised to find herself almost happy. Some night she dreamed about Sonny, and lying awake before dawn continued her dream with her own caresses until she could sleep again. She had not had a man since. But the life in Vegas agreed with her. She went swimming in the hotel pool, sailed on Lake Mead, and drove through the desert on her day off. She became thinner, and this improved her figure. She was still voluptuous, but more in the American than the old Italian style. She worked in the public relations section of the hotel as a receptionist and had nothing to do with Freddie, though when he saw her he would stop and chat a little. She was surprised at the change in Freddie. He had become a ladies' man, dressed beautifully, and seemed to have a real flair for running a gambling resort. He controlled the hotel side, something not usually done by casino owners. With the long, very hot summer seasons, or perhaps his more active sex life, he too had become thinner, and Hollywood tailoring made him look almost debonair in a deadly sort of way. It was after six months that Tom Hagen came out to see how she was doing. She had been receiving a check for $600 a month, every month, in addition to her salary. Hagen explained that this money had to be shown as coming from someplace and asked her to sign complete powers of attorney so that he could channel the money properly. He also told her that as a matter of form, she would be listed as owner of five points in the hotel in which she worked. She would have to go through all the legal formalities required by the Nevada laws, but everything would be taken care of for her and her own personal inconvenience would be at a minimum. However, she was not to discuss this arrangement with anyone without his consent. She would be protected legally in every way, and her money every month would be assured. If the authorities or any law enforcement agencies ever questioned her, she was to simply refer them to her lawyer, and she would not be bothered any further. Lucy agreed. She understood what was happening, but had no objection to how she was being used. It seemed a reasonable favor. But when Hagen asked her to keep her eyes open around the hotel, keep an eye on Freddie and on Freddie's boss, the man who owned and operated the hotel as a major stockholder, she said to him, Oh, Tom, you don't want me to spy on Freddy. Hagen smiled. His father worries about Freddy. He's in fast company with Mo Green, and we just want to make sure he doesn't get into any trouble. He didn't bother to explain to her that the Don had backed the building of this hotel in the desert of Las Vegas not only to supply a haven for his son, but to get a foot in the door for bigger operations. It was shortly after this interview that Dr. Jules Siegel came to work as the hotel house physician. He was very thin, very handsome and charming, and seemed very young to be a doctor, at least to Lucy. She met him when a lump grew above her wrist on her forearm. She worried about it for a few days, then one morning went to the doctor's suite of offices in the hotel. Two of the showgirls from the chorus line were in the waiting room, gossiping with each other. They had the blonde, peach-colored prettiness Lucy always envied. They looked angelic. But one of the girls was saying, I swear, if I have another dose, I'm giving up dancing. 
When Dr. Jules Siegel opened his office door to motion one of the showgirls inside, Lucy was tempted to leave, and if it had been something more personal and serious, she would have. Dr. Siegel was wearing slacks and an open shirt. The horn-rimmed glasses helped and his quiet, reserved manner, but the impression he gave was an informal one. And like many basically old-fashioned people, Lucy didn't believe that medicine and informality mixed. When she finally got into his office, there was something so reassuring in his manner that all her misgivings fled. He spoke hardly at all, and yet he was not brusque, and he took his time. When she asked him what the lump was, he patiently explained that it was a quite common fibrous growth that could in no way be malignant or a cause for serious concern. He picked up a heavy medical book and said, Hold out your arm. She held out her arms tentatively. He smiled at her for the first time. I'm going to cheat myself out of a surgical fee. I'll just smash it with this book and it will flatten out. It may pop up again, but if I remove it surgically, you'll be out of money and have to wear bandages and all that. Okay? She smiled at him. For some reason, she had an absolute trust in him. Okay. In the next instant, she let out a yell as he brought down the heavy medical volume on her forearm. The lump had flattened out, almost. Did it hurt that much? No. She watched him completing her case history card. Is that all? He nodded. Not paying any more attention to her, she left. A week later, he saw her in the coffee shop and sat next to her at the counter. How's the arm? She smiled at him. Fine. You're pretty unorthodox, but you're pretty good. He grinned at her. You don't know how unorthodox I am. And I didn't know how rich you were. The Vegas Sun just published the list of point owners in the hotel, and Lucy Mancini has a big ten points. I could have made a fortune on that little bump. She didn't answer him, suddenly reminded of Hagen's warnings. He grinned again. Don't worry. I know the score. You're just one of the dummies. Vegas is full of them. How about seeing one of the shows with me tonight, and I'll buy you dinner. I'll even buy you some roulette chips. She was a little doubtful. He urged her. Finally, she said, I'd like to come, but I'm afraid you might be disappointed by how the night ends. I'm not really a swinger like most of the girls here in Vegas. That's why I asked you. I've prescribed a night's rest for myself. Lucy smiled at him and said a little sadly, is it that obvious? He shook his head. Okay, supper then, but I'll buy my own roulette chips. They went to the supper show, and Jules kept her amused by describing different types of bare thighs and breasts in medical terms, but without sneering, all in good humor. Afterward, they played roulette together at the same wheel and won over a hundred dollars. Still later, they drove up to Boulder Dam in the moonlight, and he tried to make love to her, but when she resisted after a few kisses, he knew that she really meant no and stopped. Again, he took his defeat with great good humor. With half-guilty reproach, Lucy said, I told you I wouldn't. You would have been awfully insulted if I didn't even try. And she had to laugh because it was true. The next few months, they became best friends. It wasn't love because they didn't make love. Lucy wouldn't let him. She could see he was puzzled by her refusal, but not hurt the way most men would be, and that made her trust him even more. She found out that beneath his professional doctor's exterior, he was wildly fun-loving and reckless. On weekends, he drove a souped-up MG in the California races. When he took a vacation, he went down into the interior of Mexico, the real wild country, he told her, where strangers were murdered for their shoes, and life was as primitive as a thousand years ago. Quite accidentally, she learned that he was a surgeon and had been connected with a famous hospital in New York. All this made her more puzzled than ever at his having taken the job at the hotel. When she asked him about it, Jules said, You tell me your dark secret, and I'll tell you mine. She blushed and let the matter drop. Jules didn't pursue it either, and their relationship continued, a warm friendship that she counted on more than she realized. Now, sitting at the side of the pool, with Jules' blonde head in her lap, she felt an overwhelming tenderness for him. Her loins ached, and without realizing it, her fingers sensuously stroked the skin of his neck. He seemed to be sleeping, not noticing, and she became excited just by the feel of him against her. Suddenly, he raised his head from her lap and stood up. He took her by the hand and led her over the grass onto the cement walk. She followed him dutifully, even when he led her into one of the cottages that held his private apartment. When they were inside, he fixed them both big drinks. After the blazing sun and her own sensuous thoughts, the drink went to her head and made her dizzy. Then Jules had his arms around her, and their bodies, naked except for scanty bathing suits, were pressed against each other. Lucy was murmuring, Don't. But there was no conviction in her voice, and Jules paid no attention to her. He quickly stripped her bathing bra off so that he could fondle her heavy breasts, kissed them, and then stripped off her bathing trunks, and as he did so, kept kissing her body, her rounded belly, and the insides of her thighs. He stood up, struggling out of his own bathing shorts and embracing her. 
And then, naked in each other's arms, they were lying on the bed, and she could feel him entering her, and it was enough, just the slight touch, for her to reach her climax, and then in the second afterward, she could read in the motions of his body, his surprise. She felt the overwhelming shame she had felt before she knew Sonny. But Jules was twisting her body over the edge of the bed, positioning her legs a certain way, and she let him control her limbs and her body, and then he was entering her again and kissing her, and this time she could feel him. But more important, she could tell that he was feeling something too and coming to his climax. When he rolled off her body, Lucy huddled into one corner of the bed and began to cry. She felt so ashamed. And then she was shockingly surprised to hear Jules laugh softly and say, You poor benighted Italian girl. So that's why you kept refusing me all these months. <laughs> you dope. He said, You dope, with such friendly affection that she turned toward him and he took her naked body against his. You are medieval. You are positively medieval. But the voice was soothingly comforting as she continued to weep. Jules lit a cigarette and put it in her mouth so that she choked on the smoke and had to stop crying. Now listen to me. If you had had a decent modern raising with a family culture that was part of the 20th century, your problem would have been solved years ago. Now let me tell you what your problem is. It's not the equivalent of being ugly, of having bad skin and squinty eyes that facial surgery really doesn't solve. Your problem is like having a wart or a mole on your chin or an improperly formed ear. Stop thinking of it in sexual terms. Stop thinking in your head that you have a big box no man can love because it won't give his penis the necessary friction. What you have is a pelvic malformation and what we surgeons call a weakening of the pelvic floor. It usually comes after childbearing, but it can be simply bad bone structure. It's a common condition and many women live a life of misery because of it when a simple operation could fix them up. Some women even commit suicide because of it. But I never figured you for that condition because you have such a beautiful body. I thought it was psychological, since I know your story. You told it to me often enough, you and Sonny. But let me give you a thorough physical examination, and I can tell you just exactly how much work will have to be done. Now, go in and take a shower. Lucy went in and took her shower. Patiently, and over her protests, Jules made her lie on the bed, legs spread apart. He had an extra doctor's bag in his apartment, and it was open. He also had a small glass-topped table by the bed, which held some other instruments. He was all business now, examining her, sticking his fingers inside her and moving them around. She was beginning to feel humiliated when he kissed her on the navel and said, almost absent-mindedly, First time I've enjoyed my work. Then he flipped her over and thrust a finger in her rectum, feeling around, but his other hand was stroking her neck affectionately. When he was finished, he turned her right side up again, kissed her tenderly on the mouth, and said, Baby, I'm going to build you a whole new thing down there, and then I'll try it out personally. It will be a medical first. I'll be able to write a paper on it for the official journals. Jules did everything with such good-humored affection. He so obviously cared for her that Lucy got over her shame and embarrassment. He even had the medical textbook down off its shelf to show her a case like her own and the surgical procedure to correct it. She found herself quite interested. It's a health thing, too. If you don't get it corrected, you're going to have a hell of a lot of trouble later on with your whole plumbing system. The structure becomes progressively weaker unless it's corrected by surgery. It's a damn shame that old-fashioned prudery keeps a lot of doctors from properly diagnosing and correcting the situation and a lot of women from complaining about it. Don't talk about it. Please, don't talk about it. He could see that she was still, to some extent, ashamed of her secret, embarrassed by her ugly defect though to his medically trained mind this seemed the height of silliness. He was sensitive enough to identify with her. It also put him on the right track to making her feel better. Okay, I know your secret, so now I'll tell you mine. You always ask me what I'm doing here in this town, one of the youngest and most brilliant surgeons in the East. He was mocking some newspaper reports about himself. The truth is that I'm an abortionist, which in itself is not so bad, so is half the medical profession. But I got caught. I had a friend, a doctor named Kennedy. We interned together. And he's really a straight guy, but he said he'd help me. I understand Tom Hagen had told him if he ever needed help on anything, the Corleone family was indebted to him. So he spoke to Hagen. The next thing I know, the charges were dropped, but the Medical Association and the Eastern Establishment had me blacklisted. So the Corleone family got me this job out here. I make a good living. I do a job that has to be done. 
These showgirls are always getting knocked up, and aborting them is the easiest thing in the world if they come to me right away. I curet them, like you scrape a frying pan. Freddy Corleone is a real terror. By my count, he's knocked up fifteen girls while I've been here. I've seriously considered giving him a father-to-son talk about sex, especially since I've had to treat him three times for clap and once for syphilis. Freddy is the original bareback rider. Jules stopped talking. He had been deliberately indiscreet, something he never did, so that Lucy would know that other people, including someone she knew and feared a little like Freddy Corleone, also had shameful secrets. Think of it as a piece of elastic in your body that has lost its elasticity. By cutting out a piece, you make it tighter, snappier. I'll think about it. But she was sure she was going to go through with it. She trusted Jules absolutely. Then she thought of something else. How much will it cost? Jules frowned. I haven't the facilities here for surgery like that, and I'm not the expert at it. But I have a friend in Los Angeles who's the best in the field and has facilities at the best hospital. In fact, he tightens up all the movie stars when those dames find out that getting their faces and breasts lifted isn't the whole answer to making a man love them. He owes me a few favors, so it won't cost anything. I do his abortions for him. Listen, if it weren't unethical, I'd tell you the names of some of the movie sex queens who've had the operation. She was immediately curious. Oh, come on, tell me. Come on. It would be a delicious piece of gossip, and one of the things about Jules was that she could show her feminine love of gossip without him making fun of it. I'll tell you if you have dinner with me and spend the night with me. We have a lot of lost time to make up for because of your silliness. Lucy felt an overwhelming affection to him for being so kind, and she was able to say, You don't have to sleep with me. You know you won't enjoy it the way I am now. Jules burst out laughing. You dope. You incredible dope. Didn't you ever hear of any other way of making love far more ancient, far more civilized? Are you really that innocent? Oh, that. Oh, that. Nice girls don't do that. Manly men don't do that even in the year 1948. Well, baby, I can take you to the house of a little old lady right here in Las Vegas, who was the youngest madam of the most popular whorehouse in the Wild West days, back in 1880, I think it was. She likes to talk about the old days. You know what she told me? That those gunslingers, those manly, virile, straight-shooting cowboys would always ask the girls for a French, what we doctors call fellatio, what you call, oh, that. Did you ever think of doing Oh That with your beloved Sonny? For the first time, she truly surprised him. She turned on him with what he could think of only as a Mona Lisa smile, his scientific mind immediately darting off on a tangent. Could this be the solving of that centuries-old mystery? And said quietly, I did everything with Sonny. It was the first time she had ever admitted anything like that to anyone. Two weeks later, Jules Siegel stood in the operating room of the Los Angeles hospital and watched his friend, Dr. Frederick Kellner, perform the specialty. Before Lucy was put under anesthesia, Jules leaned over. I told him you were my special girl, so he's going to put in some real tight walls. But the preliminary pill had already made her dopey, and she didn't laugh or smile. His teasing remark did take away some of the terror of the operation. Dr. Kellner made his incision with the confidence of a pool shark making an easy shot. The technique of any operation to strengthen the pelvic floor required the accomplishment of two objectives. The musculofibrous pelvic sling had to be shortened so that the slack was taken up. And of course, the vaginal opening, the weak spot itself in the pelvic floor, had to be brought forward, brought under the pubic arch, and so relieved from the line of direct pressure above. Repairing the pelvic sling was called perinchorophy. Suturing the vaginal wall was called colporophy. Jules saw that Dr. Kellner was working carefully now. The big danger in the cutting was going too deep and hitting the rectum. It was a fairly uncomplicated case. Jules had studied all the x-rays and tests. Nothing should go wrong, except that in surgery, something could always go wrong. Kellner was working on the diaphragm sling. The T-forceps held the vaginal flap and exposing the ani muscle and the fasci, which formed its sheath. Kellner's gauze-covered fingers were pushing aside loose connective tissue. Jules kept his eyes on the vaginal wall for the appearance of the veins, the telltale danger signal of injuring the rectum. But old Kellner knew his stuff. He was building a new snatch as easily as a carpenter nails together two-by-four studs. Kellner was trimming away the excess vaginal wall, using the fastening down stitch to close the bite taken out of the tissue of the redundant angle, ensuring that no troublesome projections would form. Kellner was trying to insert three fingers into the narrowed opening of the lumen, then two, 
He just managed to get two fingers in, probing deeply, and for a moment he looked up at Jules, and his china-blue eyes over the gauze mask twinkled as though asking if that was narrow enough. Then he was busy again with his sutures. It was all over. They wheeled Lucy out to the recovery room, and Jules talked to Kellner. Kellner was cheerful, the best sign that everything had gone well. No complications at all, my boy. Nothing growing in there. Very simple case. She has wonderful body tone, unusual in these cases, and now she's in first-class shape for fun and games. I envy you, my boy. Of course, you'll have to wait a little while, but then I guarantee you'll like my work. Jules laughed. You're a true Pygmalion, Doctor. Really, you are marvelous. Dr. Kellner grunted. That's all child's play, like your abortions. If society would only be realistic, people like you and I, really talented people, could do important work and leave this stuff for the hacks. By the way, I'll be sending you a girl next week. A very nice girl. They seem to be the ones who always get in trouble. That'll make us all square for this job today. Jules shook his hand. Thanks, Doctor. Come out yourself sometime, and I'll see that you get all the courtesies of the house. Kellner gave him a wry smile. I gamble every day. I don't need your roulette wheels and crap tables. I knock heads with fate too often as it is. You're going to waste out there, Jules. Another couple of years and you can forget about serious surgery. You won't be up to it. He turned away. Jules knew it was not meant as a reproach, but as a warning. Yet it took the heart out of him anyway. Since Lucy wouldn't be out of the recovery room for at least 12 hours, he went out on the town and got drunk. Part of the getting drunk was his feeling of relief that everything had worked out so well with Lucy. The next morning when he went to the hospital to visit her, he was surprised to find two men at her bedside and flowers all over the room. Lucy was propped up on pillows, her face radiant. Jules was surprised because Lucy had broken with her family and had told him not to notify them unless something went wrong. Of course, Freddy Corleone knew she was in the hospital for a minor operation. That had been necessary so that they could both get time off. And Freddy had told Jules that the hotel would pick up all the bills for Lucy. Lucy was introducing them, and one of the men Jules recognized instantly, the famous Johnny Fontaine. The other was a big, muscular, snotty-looking Italian guy whose name was Nino Valenti. They both shook hands with Jules and then paid no further attention to him. They were kidding Lucy, talking about the old neighborhood in New York, about people and events Jules had no way of sharing. So he said to Lucy, I'll drop by later. I have to see Dr. Kellner anyway. But Johnny Fontaine was turning the charm on him. Hey, buddy, we have to leave ourselves. You keep Lucy company. Take good care of her, Doc. Jules noticed a peculiar hoarseness in Johnny Fontaine's voice and remembered suddenly that the man hadn't sung in public for over a year now, that he had won the Academy Award for his acting. Could the man's voice have changed so late in life and the papers keeping it a secret, everybody keeping it a secret? Jules loved inside gossip, and he kept listening to Fontaine's voice in an attempt to diagnose the trouble. It could be simple strain or too much booze and cigarettes or even too much women. The voice had an ugly timber to it. He could never be called the sweet crooner anymore. Jules said to Johnny Fontaine, You sound like you have a cold. Just strain. I tried to sing last night. I guess I just can't accept the fact that my voice changed. Getting old, you know. He gave Jules a what-the-hell grin. Didn't you get a doctor to look at it? Maybe it's something that can be fixed. Fontaine was not so charming now. He gave Jules a long, cool look. That's the first thing I did nearly two years ago. Best specialists. My own doctor who's supposed to be the top guy out here in California. They told me to get a lot of rest. Nothing wrong, just getting older. A man's voice changes when he gets older. Fontaine ignored him after that, paying attention to Lucy, charming her as he charmed all women. Jules kept listening to the voice. There had to be a growth on those vocal cords. But then, why the hell hadn't the specialists spotted it? Was it malignant and inoperable? Then there was other stuff. He interrupted Fontaine to ask, When was the last time you got examined by a specialist? Fontaine was obviously irritated, but trying to be polite for Lucy's sake. About 18 months ago. Does your own doctor take a look once in a while? Sure he does. He gives me a codeine spray and checks me out. He told me it's just my voice aging, that all the drinking and smoking and other stuff. Maybe you know more than he does. What's his name? Fontaine said with just a faint flicker of pride. Tucker. Dr. James Tucker. What do you think of him? The name was familiar, linked to famous movie stars, female, and to an expensive health farm. With a grin, Jules said, He's a sharp dresser. Fontaine was angry now. You think you're a better doctor than he is? Jules laughed. Are you a better singer than Carmen Lombardo? He was surprised to see Nino Valenti break up in laughter, banging his head on his chair. The joke hadn't been that good. Then, on the wings of those guffaws, he caught the smell of bourbon and knew that even this early in the morning, Mr. Valenti, whoever the hell he was, was at least half drunk. 
Fontaine was grinning at his friend. Hey, you're supposed to be laughing at my jokes, not his. Meanwhile, Lucy stretched out her hand to Jules and drew him to her bedside. He looks like a bum, but he's a brilliant surgeon. If he says he's better than Dr. Tucker, then he's better than Dr. Tucker. You listen to him, Johnny. The nurse came in and told him they would have to leave. The resident was going to do some work on Lucy and needed privacy. Jules was amused to see Lucy turn her head away, so when Johnny Fontaine and Nino Valenti kissed her, they would hit her cheek instead of her mouth. But they seemed to expect it. She let Jules kiss her on the mouth and whispered, Come back this afternoon, please. He nodded. Out in the corridor, Valenti asked him, What was the operation for? Anything serious? Jules shook his head. Just a little female plumbing. Absolutely routine. Please believe me. I'm more concerned than you are. I hope to marry the girl. They were looking at him appraisingly, so he asked, How did you find out she was in the hospital? Freddy called us and asked us to look in. We all grew up in the same neighborhood. Lucy was maid of honor when Freddy's sister got married. Oh. He didn't let on that he knew the whole story, perhaps because they were so cagey about protecting Lucy and her affair with Sonny. As they walked down the corridor, Jules said to Fontaine, I have visiting doctor's privileges here. Why don't you let me have a look at your throat? Fontaine shook his head. I'm in a hurry. That's a million dollar throat. He can't have cheap doctors looking down it. Jules saw Valenti was grinning at him, obviously on his side. I'm no cheap doctor. I was the brightest young surgeon and diagnostician on the East Coast until they got me on the abortion rap. As he had known it would, that made them take him seriously. By admitting his crime, he inspired belief in his claim of high competence. Valenti recovered first. If Johnny can't use you, I got a girlfriend I want you to look at. Not at her throat, though. How long will you take? Ten minutes. It was a lie, but he believed in telling lies to people. Truth-telling and medicine just didn't go together, except in dire emergencies, if then. Okay. His voice was darker, hoarser with fright. Jules recruited a nurse and a consulting room. He didn't have everything he needed, but there was enough. In less than ten minutes, he knew there was a growth on the vocal cords. That was easy. Tucker, that incompetent sartorial son of a bitch of a Hollywood phony, should have been able to spot it. Christ, maybe the guy didn't even have a license, and if he did, it should be taken away from him. Jules didn't pay any attention to the two men now. He picked up the phone and asked for the throat man at the hospital to come down. Then he swung around and said to Nino Valenti, I think it might be a long wait for you. You'd better leave. Fontaine stared at him in utter disbelief. You son of a bitch! You think you're gonna keep me here? You think you're gonna fuck around with my throat? Jules, with more pleasure than he would have thought possible, gave it to him straight between the eyes. You can do whatever you like. You've got a growth of some sort on your vocal cords, in your larynx. If you stay here the next few hours, we can nail it down, whether it's malignant or non-malignant. We can make a decision for surgery or treatment. I can give you the whole story. I can give you the name of the top specialist in America, and we can have him out here on the plane tonight. With your money, that is, and if I think it necessary. But you can walk out of here and see your quack buddy, or sweat while you decide to see another doctor, or get referred to somebody incompetent. Then, if it's malignant and gets big enough, they'll cut out your whole larynx, or you'll die. Or you can just sweat. Stick here with me, and we can get it all squared away in a few hours. You got anything more important to do? Let's stick around, Johnny. What the hell? I'll go down the hall and call the studio. I won't tell them anything, just that we're held up. Then I'll come back here and keep you company. It proved to be a very long afternoon, but a rewarding one. The diagnosis of the staff throat man was perfectly sound as far as Jules could see after the x-rays and swab analysis. Halfway through, Johnny Fontaine, his mouth soaked with iodine, retching over the roll of gauze stuck in his mouth, tried to quit. Nino Valenti grabbed him by the shoulders and slammed him back into the chair. When it was all over, Jules grinned at Fontaine and said, Warts. Fontaine didn't grasp it. Just some warts. We'll slice them right off like skin off bologna. In a few months, you'll be okay. Valenti let out a yell, but Fontaine was still frowning. How about singing afterward? How will it affect my singing? Jules shrugged. On that, there's no guarantee. But since you can't sing now, what's the difference? Fontaine looked at him with distaste. Kid, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You act like you're giving me good news when what you're telling me is maybe I won't sing anymore. Is that right? Maybe I won't sing anymore? Finally, Jules was disgusted. He'd operated as a real doctor, and it had been a pleasure. He had done this bastard a real favor, and he was acting as if he'd been done dirt. Listen, Mr. Fontaine, I'm a doctor of medicine, and you can call me doctor, not kid. And I did give you very good news. When I brought you down here, I was certain that you had a malignant growth in your larynx, which would entail cutting out your whole voice box, or which could kill you. 
I was worried that I might have to tell you that you were a dead man. And I was so delighted when I could say the word warts, because your singing gave me so much pleasure. Helped me seduce girls when I was younger. And you're a real artist. But also, you're a very spoiled guy. Do you think because you're Johnny Fontaine you can't get cancer? Or a brain tumor that's inoperable? Or a failure of the heart? Do you think you're never going to die? Well, it's not all sweet music. And if you want to see real trouble, take a walk through this hospital and you'll sing a love song about warts. So just stop the crap and get on with what you have to do. Your Adolf Manju medical man can get you the proper surgeon, but if he tries to get into the operating room, I suggest you have him arrested for attempted murder. Jules started to walk out of the room when Valenti said, boy, Doc, that's telling him. Jules whirled around. Do you always get loop before noontime? Sure. Valenti grinned at him, and with such good humor that Jules said more gently than he had meant to. You have to figure you'll be dead in five years if you keep that up. Valenti was lumbering up to him with little dancing steps. He threw his arms around Jules. His breath stank of bourbon. He was laughing very hard. He asked, still laughing, Five years? Is it going to take that long? A month after her operation, Lucy Mancini sat beside the Vegas Hotel pool, one hand holding a cocktail, the other hand stroking Jules' head, which lay in her lap. Jules said teasingly, You don't have to build up your courage. I have champagne waiting in our suite. Are you sure it's okay? So soon? I'm the doctor. Tonight's the big night. Do you realize I'll be the first surgeon in medical history who tried out the results of his medical first operation? You know, the before and after? I'm going to enjoy writing it up for the journals. Let's see. While the before was distinctly pleasurable for psychological reasons and the sophistication of the surgeon instructor, the post-operative coitus was extremely rewarding strictly for its neurological. He stopped talking because Lucy had yanked on his hair hard enough for him to yell with pain. She smiled down at him. If you're not satisfied tonight, I can really say it's your fault. I guarantee my work. I planned it, even though I just let old Kellner do the manual labor. Now, let's just rest up. We have a long night of research ahead. When they went up to their suite, they were living together now, Lucy found a surprise waiting, a gourmet supper, and next to her champagne glass, a jeweler's box with a huge diamond engagement ring inside it. That shows you how much confidence I have in my work. Now let's see you earn it. He was very tender, very gentle with her. She was a little scary at first, her flesh jumping away from his touch. But then, reassured, she felt her body building up to a passion she had never known. And when they were done the first time and Jules whispered, I do good work, she whispered back, Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. And they both laughed to each other as they started making love again. Book 6, Chapter 23 After five months of exile in Sicily, Michael Corleone came finally to understand his father's character and his destiny. He came to understand men like Luca Brasi, the ruthless capo regime Clemenza, his mother's resignation and acceptance of her role. For in Sicily, he saw what they would have been if they had chosen not to struggle against their fate. He understood why the Don always said, a man has only one destiny. He came to understand the contempt for authority and legal government, the hatred for any man who broke omerta, the law of silence. Dressed in old clothes and a billed cap, Michael had been transported from the ship docked at Palermo to the interior of the Sicilian island, to the very heart of a province controlled by the Mafia, where the local capo mafioso was greatly indebted to his father for some past service. The province held the town of Corleone, whose name the Don had taken when he emigrated to America so long ago. But there were no longer any of the Don's relatives alive. The women had died of old age. All the men had been killed in vendettas, or had also emigrated, either to America, Brazil, or to some other province on the Italian mainland. He was to learn later that this small, poverty-stricken town had the highest murder rate of any place in the world. Michael was installed as a guest in the home of a bachelor uncle of the capo mafioso. The uncle in his seventies was also the doctor for the district. The capo mafioso was a man in his late fifties named Don Tomasino, and he operated as the Gabellotto for a huge estate belonging to one of Sicily's most noble families. The Gabellotto, a sort of overseer to the estates of the rich, also guaranteed that the poor would not try to claim land not being cultivated, would not try to encroach in any way on the estate by poaching or trying to farm it as squatters. In short, the Gabellotto was a mafioso, 
who for a certain sum of money protected the real estate of the rich from all claims made on it by the poor, legal or illegal. When any poor peasant tried to implement the law which permitted him to buy uncultivated land, the gobelato frightened him off with threats of bodily harm or death. It was that simple. Don Tomasino also controlled the water rights in the area and vetoed the local building of any new dams by the Roman government. Such dams would ruin the lucrative business of selling water from the artesian wells he controlled, make water too cheap, ruin the whole important water economy so laboriously built up over hundreds of years. However, Don Tomasino was an old-fashioned mafia chief and would have nothing to do with dope traffic or prostitution. In this, Don Tomasino was at odds with a new breed of mafia leaders springing up in big cities like Palermo. New men who, influenced by American gangsters deported to Italy, had no such scruples. The mafia chief was an extremely portly man, a man with a belly, literally, as well as in the figurative sense that meant a man able to inspire fear in his fellow men. Under his protection, Michael had nothing to fear. Yet it was considered necessary to keep the fugitive's identity a secret. And so, Michael was restricted to the walled estate of Dr. Taza, the Don's uncle. Dr. Taza was tall for a Sicilian, almost six feet, and had ruddy cheeks and snow-white hair. Though in his seventies, he went every week to Palermo to pay his respects to the younger prostitutes of that city. The younger, the better. Dr. Taza's other vice was reading. He read everything and talked about what he read to his fellow townsmen, patients who were illiterate peasants, the estate shepherds. And this gave him a local reputation for foolishness. What did books have to do with them? In the evenings, Dr. Taza, Don Tomasino, and Michael sat in the huge garden populated with those marble statues that on this island seemed to grow out of the garden as magically as the black, heady grapes. Dr. Taza loved to tell stories about the Mafia and its exploits over the centuries, and in Michael Corleone, he had a fascinated listener. There were times when even Don Tomasino would be carried away by the balmy air, the fruity, intoxicating wine, the elegant and quiet comfort of the garden, and tell a story from his own practical experience. The doctor was the legend, the Don, the reality. In this antique garden, Michael Corleone learned about the roots from which his father grew, that the word mafia had originally meant place of refuge. Then it became the name for the secret organization that sprang up to fight against the rulers that had crushed the country and its people for centuries. Sicily was a land that had been more cruelly raped than any other in history. The Inquisition had tortured rich and poor alike. The landowning barons and the princes of the Catholic Church exercised absolute power over the shepherds and farmers. The police were the instruments of their power, and so identified with them that to be called a policeman is the foulest insult one Sicilian can hurl at another. Faced with the savagery of this absolute power, the suffering people learned never to betray their anger and their hatred for fear of being crushed. They learned never to make themselves vulnerable by uttering any sort of threat, since giving such a warning ensured a quick reprisal. They learned that society was their enemy, and so, when they sought redress for their wrongs, they went to the rebel underground, the Mafia. And the Mafia cemented its power by originating the law of silence, the Omerta. In the countryside of Sicily, a stranger asking directions to the nearest town will not even receive the courtesy of an answer. And the greatest crime any member of the Mafia could commit would be to tell the police the name of the man who had just shot him or done him any kind of injury. Omerta became the religion of the people. A woman whose husband has been murdered would not tell the police the name of her husband's murderer, not even of her child's murderer, her daughter's raper. Justice had never been forthcoming from the authorities, and so the people had always gone to the Robin Hood Mafia, and to some extent the Mafia still fulfilled this role. People turned to their local capo mafioso for help in every emergency. He was their social worker, their district captain, ready with a basket of food and a job, their protector. But what Dr. Taza did not add, what Michael learned on his own in the months that followed, was that the mafia in Sicily had become the illegal arm of the rich and even the auxiliary police of the legal and political structure. It had become a degenerate capitalist structure, anti-communist, anti-liberal, placing its own taxes on every form of business endeavor, no matter how small. Michael Corleone understood for the first time why men like his father chose to become thieves and murderers rather than members of the legal society. The poverty and fear and degradation were too awful to be acceptable to any man of spirit. And in America, some emigrating Sicilians had assumed there would be an equally cruel authority. Dr. Taza offered to take Michael into Palermo with him on his weekly visit to the bordello, but Michael refused. His flight to Sicily had prevented him from getting proper medical treatment for his smashed jaw, and he now carried a memento from Captain McCluskey on the left side of his face. 
The bones had knitted badly, throwing his profile askew, giving him the appearance of depravity when viewed from that side. He had always been vain about his looks, and this upset him more than he thought possible. The pain that came and went, he didn't mind at all. Dr. Taza gave him some pills that deadened it. Taza offered to treat his face, but Michael refused. He had been there long enough to learn that Dr. Taza was perhaps the worst physician in Sicily. Dr. Taza read everything but his medical literature, which he admitted he could not understand. He had passed his medical exams through the good offices of the most important mafia chief in Sicily, who had made a special trip to Palermo to confer with Taza's professors about what grades they should give him. And this, too, showed how the mafia in Sicily was cancerous to the society it inhabited. Merit meant nothing. Talent meant nothing. Work meant nothing. The mafia godfather gave you your profession as a gift. Michael had plenty of time to think things out. During the day, he took walks in the countryside, always accompanied by two of the shepherds attached to Don Tomasino's estate. The shepherds of the island were often recruited to act as the mafia's hired killers and did their job simply to earn money to live. Michael thought about his father's organization. If it continued to prosper, it would grow into what had happened here on this island, so cancerous that it would destroy the whole country. Sicily was already a land of ghosts, its men emigrating to every other country on earth to be able to earn their bread, or simply to escape being murdered for exercising their political and economic freedoms. On his long walks, the most striking thing in Michael's eyes was the magnificent beauty of the country. He walked through the orange orchards that formed shady deep caverns through the countryside, with their ancient conduits splashing water out of the fanged mouths of great snake stones carved before Christ. Houses built like ancient Roman villas, with huge marble portals and great vaulted rooms, falling into ruins or inhabited by stray sheep. On the horizon, the bony hills shone like picked bleached bones piled high. Gardens and fields, sparkly green, decorated the desert landscape like bright emerald necklaces. And sometimes he walked as far as the town of Corleone, its 18,000 people strung out in dwellings that pitted the side of the nearest mountain, the mean hovels built out of black rock quarried from that mountain. In the last year, there had been over 60 murders in Corleone, and it seemed that death shadowed the town. Further on, the wood of Ficuzza broke the savage monotony of arable plain. His two shepherd bodyguards always carried their lupatas with them when accompanying Michael on his walks. The deadly Sicilian shotgun was the favorite weapon of the Mafia. Indeed, the police chief sent by Mussolini to clean the Mafia out of Sicily had, as one of his first steps, ordered all stone walls in Sicily to be knocked down to not more than three feet in height, so that murderers with their lupatas could not use the walls as ambush points for their assassinations. This didn't help much, and the police minister solved his problem by arresting and deporting to penal colonies any male suspected of being a mafioso. When the island of Sicily was liberated by the Allied armies, the American military government officials believed that anyone imprisoned by the fascist regime was a Democrat, and many of these mafiosi were appointed as mayors of villages or interpreters to the military government. This good fortune enabled the mafia to reconstitute itself and become more formidable than ever before. The long walks, a bottle of strong wine at night with a heavy plate of pasta and meat enabled Michael to sleep. There were books in Italian in Dr. Taz's library, and though Michael spoke dialect Italian and had taken some college courses in Italian, his reading of these books took a great deal of effort and time. His speech became almost accentless, and though he could never pass as a native of the district, it would be believed that he was one of those strange Italians from the far north of Italy bordering the Swiss and Germans. The distortion of the left side of his face made him more native. It was the kind of disfigurement common in Sicily because of the lack of medical care, the little injury that cannot be patched up simply for lack of money. Many children, many men, bore disfigurements that in America would have been repaired by minor surgery or sophisticated medical treatments. Michael often thought of Kay, of her smile, her body, and always felt a twinge of conscience at leaving her so brutally without a word of farewell. Oddly enough, his conscience was never troubled by the two men he had murdered, Salazzo had tried to kill his father. Captain McCluskey had disfigured him for life. Dr. Taza always kept after him about getting surgery done for his lopsided face, especially when Michael asked him for pain-killing drugs, the pain getting worse as time went on, and more frequent. Taza explained that there was a facial nerve below the eye, from which radiated a whole complex of nerves. Indeed, this was the favorite spot for mafia torturers, who searched it out on the cheeks of their victims with the needle-fine point of an ice pick. That particular nerve in Michael's face had been injured, or perhaps there was a splinter of bone lanced into it. Simple surgery in a Palermo hospital would permanently relieve the pain. Michael refused. When the doctor asked why, Michael grinned and said, It's something from home. 
and he really didn't mind the pain, which was more an ache, a small throbbing in his skull, like a motored apparatus running in liquid to purify it. It was nearly seven months of leisurely, rustic living before Michael felt real boredom. At about this time, Don Tomasino became very busy and was seldom seen at the villa. He was having his troubles with the new mafia springing up in Palermo, young men who were making a fortune out of the post-war construction boom in that city. With this wealth, they were trying to encroach on the country fiefs of old-time mafia leaders whom they contemptuously labeled Mustache Pete's. Don Tomasino was kept busy defending his domain. And so, Michael was deprived of the old man's company and had to be content with Dr. Taz's stories, which were beginning to repeat themselves. One morning, Michael decided to take a long hike to the mountains beyond Corleone. He was, naturally, accompanied by the two shepherd bodyguards. This was not really a protection against enemies of the Corleone family. It was simply too dangerous for anyone not a native to go wandering about by himself. It was dangerous enough for a native. The region was loaded with bandits, with mafia partisans fighting against each other and endangering everybody else in the process. He might also be mistaken for a Pagliaio thief. A Pagliaio is a straw-thatched hut erected in the fields to house farming tools and to provide shelter for the agricultural laborers so that they will not have to carry them on the long walk from their homes in the village. In Sicily, the peasant does not live on the land he cultivates. It is too dangerous, and any arable land, if he owns it, is too precious. Rather, he lives in his village, and at sunrise, begins his voyage out to work in distant fields, a commuter on foot. A worker who arrived at his palio and found it looted was an injured man indeed. The bread was taken out of his mouth for that day. The mafia, after the law proved helpless, took this interest of the peasant under its protection and solved the problem in typical fashion. It hunted down and slaughtered all Pagliaio thieves. It was inevitable that some innocent suffered. It was possible that if Michael wandered past a Pagliaio that had just been looted, he might be adjudged the criminal, unless he had somebody to vouch for him. So, on one sunny morning, he started hiking across the fields, followed by his two faithful shepherds. One of them was a plain, simple fellow, almost moronic, silent as the dead, and with a face as impassive as an Indian. He had the wiry, small build of the typical Sicilian before they ran to the fat of middle age. His name was Kahlo. The other shepherd was more outgoing, younger, and had seen something of the world, mostly oceans, since he had been a sailor in the Italian Navy during the war, and had just had time enough to get himself tattooed before his ship was sunk and he was captured by the British. But the tattoo made him a famous man in his village. Sicilians do not often let themselves be tattooed. They do not have the opportunity, nor the inclination. The shepherd, Fabrizio, had done so primarily to cover a splotchy red birthmark on his belly, and yet the Mafia market carts had gaily painted scenes on their sides, beautiful primitive paintings done with loving care. In any case, Fabrizio, back in his native village, was not too proud of that tattoo on his chest, though it showed a subject dear to the Sicilian honor, a husband stabbing a naked man and woman entwined together on the hairy floor of his belly. Fabrizio would joke with Michael and ask questions about America, for of course it was impossible to keep them in the dark about his true nationality. Still, they did not know exactly who he was, except that he was in hiding, and there could be no babbling about him. Fabrizio sometimes brought Michael a fresh cheese, still sweating the milk that formed it. They walked along dusty country roads, passing donkeys, pulling gaily painted carts. The land was filled with pink flowers, orange orchards, groves of almond and olive trees, all blooming. That had been one of the surprises. Michael had expected a barren land because of the legendary poverty of Sicilians, and yet he had found it a land of gushing plenty, carpeted with flowers scented by lemon blossoms. It was so beautiful that he wondered how its people could bear to leave it. How terrible man had been to his fellow man could be measured by the great exodus from what seemed to be a Garden of Eden. He had planned to walk to the coastal village of Mazara, and then take a bus back to Corleone in the evening, and so tire himself out and be able to sleep. The two shepherds wore rucksacks filled with bread and cheese they could eat on the way. They carried their lupatas quite openly, as if out for a day's hunting. It was a most beautiful morning. Michael felt as he had felt when, as a child, he had gone out early on a summer day to play ball. Then, each day had been freshly washed, freshly painted, and so it was now. Sicily was carpeted in gaudy flowers, the scent of orange and lemon blossoms so heavy that even with his facial injury, which pressed on the sinuses, he could smell it. The smashing on the left side of his face had completely healed, but the bone had formed improperly, and the pressure on his sinuses made his left eye hurt. It also made his nose run continually. He filled up handkerchiefs with mucus, and often blew his nose out onto the ground as the local peasants did, a habit that had disgusted him when he was a boy, and had seen old Italians disdaining handkerchiefs as English foppery blow out their noses in the asphalt gutters. 
His face, too, felt heavy. Dr. Taza had told him that this was due to the pressure on his sinuses caused by the badly healed fracture. Dr. Taza called it an eggshell fracture of the zygoma, that if it had been treated before the bones knitted, it could have been easily remedied by a minor surgical procedure using an instrument like a spoon to push out the bone to its proper shape. Now, however, said the doctor, he would have to check into a Palermo hospital and undergo a major procedure called maxillofacial surgery, where the bone would be broken again. That was enough for Michael. He refused. And yet, more than the pain, more than the nose dripping, he was bothered by the feeling of heaviness in his face. He never reached the coast that day. After going about 15 miles, he and his shepherd stopped in the cool, green, watery shade of an orange grove to eat lunch and drink their wine. Fabrizio was chattering about how he would someday get to America. After drinking and eating, they lolled in the shade, and Fabrizio unbuttoned his shirt and contracted his stomach muscles to make the tattoo come alive. The naked couple on his chest writhed in a lover's agony, and the dagger thrust by the husband quivered in their transfixed flesh. It amused them. It was while this was going on that Michael was hit with what Sicilians call the thunderbolt. Beyond the orange grove lay the green ribboned fields of a baronial estate. Down the road from the grove was a villa so Roman it looked as if it had been dug up from the ruins of Pompeii. It was a little palace with a huge marble portico and fluted Grecian columns, and through those columns came a bevy of village girls flanked by two stout matrons clad in black. They were from the village, and had obviously fulfilled their ancient duty to the local baron by cleaning his villa and otherwise preparing it for his winter sojourn. Now they were going into the fields to pick the flowers with which they would fill the rooms. They were gathering the pink sulla, purple wisteria, mixing them with orange and lemon blossoms. The girls, not seeing the men resting in the orange grove, came closer and closer. They were dressed in cheap, gaily printed frocks that clung to their bodies. They were still in their teens, but with the full womanliness sun-drenched flesh ripened into so quickly. Three or four of them started chasing one girl, chasing her toward the grove. The girl being chased held a bunch of huge purple grapes in her left hand, and with her right hand was picking grapes off the cluster and throwing them at her pursuers. She had a crown of ringleted hair as purple-black as the grapes, and her body seemed to be bursting out of its skin. Just short of the grove, she poised, startled, her eyes having caught the alien color of the men's shirts. She stood there, up on her toes, poised like a deer to run. She was very close now, close enough for the men to see every feature of her face. She was all ovals, oval-shaped eyes, the bones of her face, the contour of her brow. Her skin was an exquisite dark creaminess, and her eyes enormous, dark violet or brown, but dark with long, heavy lashes, shadowed her lovely face. Her mouth was rich without being gross, sweet without being weak, and dyed dark red with the juice of the grapes. She was so incredibly lovely that Fabrizio murmured, Jesus Christ, take my soul, I'm dying, as a joke, but the words came out a little too hoarsely. As if she had heard him, the girl came down off her toes and whirled away from them and fled back to her pursuers. Her haunches moved like an animal's beneath the tight print of her dress, as pagan and as innocently lustful. When she reached her friends, she whirled around again, and her face was like a dark hollow against the field of bright flowers. She extended an arm, the hand full of grapes, pointed toward the grove. The girls fled laughing, with the black-clad, stout matrons scolding them on. As for Michael Corleone, he found himself standing, his heart pounding in his chest. He felt a little dizzy. The blood was surging through his body, through all its extremities and pounding against the tips of his fingers, the tips of his toes. All the perfumes of the island came rushing in on the wind, orange, lemon blossoms, grapes, flowers. It seemed as if his body had sprung away from him, out of himself. And then he heard the two shepherds laughing. Clapping him on the shoulder, Fabrizio said, You got a hit by the thunderbolt, eh? Even Kahlo became friendly, patting him on the arm and saying, Easy, man, easy but with affection, as if Michael had been hit by a car. Fabrizio handed him a wine bottle, and Michael took a long slug. It cleared his head. He said, What the hell are you damn sheep lovers talking about? Both men laughed. Kahlo, his honest face filled with the utmost seriousness, said, You can't hide the thunderbolt. When it hits you, everybody can see it. Christ, man, don't be ashamed of it. Some men pray for the thunderbolt. You're a lucky fellow. Michael wasn't too pleased about his emotions being so easily read. But this was the first time in his life such a thing had happened to him. It was nothing like his adolescent crushes. It was nothing like the love he'd had for Kay, a love based as much on her sweetness, her intelligence, and the polarity of the fair and dark. This was an overwhelming desire for possession. This was an inerasable printing of the girl's face on his brain, and he knew she would haunt his memory every day of his life if he did not possess her. 
His life had become simplified, focused on one point. Everything else was unworthy of even a moment's attention. During his exile, he had always thought of Kay, though he felt they could never again be lovers or even friends. He was, after all was said, a murderer, a mafioso who had made his bones. But now, Kay was wiped completely out of his consciousness. Fabrizio said briskly, I'll go to the village. We'll find out about her. Who knows? She may be more available than we think. There's only one cure for the thunderbolt, eh, Carlo? The other shepherd nodded his head gravely. Michael didn't say anything. He followed the two shepherds as they started down the road to the nearby village into which the flock of girls had disappeared. The village was grouped around the usual central square with its fountain, but it was on a main route, so there were some stores, wine shops, and one little cafe with three tables out on a small terrace. The shepherds sat at one of the tables, and Michael joined them. There was no sign of the girls, not a trace. The village seemed deserted except for small boys and a meandering donkey. The proprietor of the cafe came to serve them. He was a short, burly man, almost dwarfish, but he greeted them cheerfully and set a dish of chickpeas at their table. You're strangers here, so let me advise you, try my wine. The grapes come from my own farm, and it is made by my sons themselves. They mix it with oranges and lemons. It's the best wine in Italy. They let him bring the wine in a jug, and it was even better than he claimed, dark purple and as powerful as a brandy. Fabrizio said to the cafe proprietor, You know all of the girls here, I'll bet. We saw some beauties coming down the road. One in particular got a friend here hit with the thunderbolt. He motioned to Michael. The cafe owner looked at Michael with new interest. The cracked face had seemed quite ordinary to him before, not worth a second glance. But a man hit with a thunderbolt was another matter. You had better bring a few bottles home with you, my friend. You'll need help in getting to sleep tonight. Michael asked the man. Do you know a girl with her hair all curly? Very creamy skin, very big eyes, very dark eyes. Do you know a girl like that in the village? No, I don't know any girl like that. He vanished from the terrace into his cafe. The three men drank their wine slowly, finished off the jug, and called for more. The owner did not reappear. Fabrizio went into the cafe after him. When Fabrizio came out, he grimaced and said to Michael, Just as I had thought. It's his daughter we were talking about, and now he's in the back, boiling up his blood to do us a mischief. I think we'd better start walking toward Corleone. Despite his months on the island, Michael still could not get used to the Sicilian touchiness on matters of sex. And this was extreme, even for a Sicilian. But the two shepherds seemed to take it as a matter of course. They were waiting for him to leave. Fabrizio said, The old bastard mentioned he has two sons, big, tough lads that he has only to whistle up. Let's get going. This is the end of disc number nine. Please insert disc number ten. Despite his months on the island, Michael still could not get used to the Sicilian touchiness on matters of sex. And this was extreme, even for a Sicilian. But the two shepherds seemed to take it as a matter of course. They were waiting for him to leave. Fabrizio said, The old bastard mentioned he has two sons, big, tough lads that he has only to whistle up. Let's get going. Michael gave him a cold stare. Up to now, he had been a quiet, gentle young man, a typical American, except that, since he was hiding in Sicily, he must have done something manly. This was the first time the shepherds had seen the Corleone stare. Don Tomasino, knowing Michael's true identity and deed, had always been wary of him, treating him as a fellow man of respect. But these unsophisticated sheep herders had come to their own opinion of Michael, and not a wise one. The cold look, Michael's rigid white face, his anger that came off him like cold smoke off ice, sobered their laughter and snuffed out their familiar friendliness. When he saw he had their proper, respectful attention, Michael said to them, Get that man out here to me. They didn't hesitate. They shouldered their lupatas and went into the dark coolness of the cafe. A few seconds later, they reappeared with the cafe owner between them. The stubby man looked in no way frightened, but his anger had a certain wariness about it. Michael leaned back in his chair and studied the man for a moment. Then he said very quietly, I understand that I've offended you by talking about your daughter. I offer you my apologies. I'm a stranger in this country. I don't know the customs that well. Let me say this. I meant no disrespect to you or her. The shepherd bodyguards were impressed. Michael's voice had never sounded like this before when speaking to them. There was command and authority in it, though he was making an apology. The cafe owner shrugged, more wary still, 
knowing he was not dealing with some farm boy. Who are you? And what do you want from my daughter? Without even hesitating, Michael said, I'm an American hiding in Sicily, from the police of my country. My name is Michael. You can inform the police and make your fortune, but then your daughter would lose a father rather than gain a husband. In any case, I want to meet your daughter. With your permission and under the supervision of your family, with all decorum, with all respect. I'm an honorable man, and I don't think of dishonoring your daughter. I want to meet her, talk to her, and then, if it hits us both right, we'll marry. If not, you'll never see me again. She may find me unsympathetic, after all, and no man can remedy that. But when the proper time comes, I'll tell you everything about me that a wife's father should know. All three men were looking at him with amazement. Fabrizio whispered in awe, It's the real thunderbolt. The cafe owner, for the first time, didn't look so confident or contemptuous. His anger was not so sure. Finally he asked, Are you a friend of the friends? Since the word mafia could never be uttered aloud by the ordinary Sicilian, this was as close as the cafe owner could come to asking if Michael was a member of the mafia. It was the usual way of asking if someone belonged, but it was ordinarily not addressed to the person directly concerned. No, I'm a stranger in this country. The cafe owner gave him another look, the smashed left side of his face, the long legs rare in Sicily. He took a look at the two shepherds carrying their lupatas quite openly, without fear, and remembered how they had come into his cafe and told him their padrone wanted to talk to him. The cafe owner had snarled that he wanted the son of a bitch out of his terrace, and one of the shepherds had said, Take my word, it's best you go out and speak to him yourself. And something had made him come out. Now something made him realize that it would be best to show this stranger some courtesy. He said grudgingly, Come Sunday afternoon. My name is Vitelli, and my house is up there on the hill above the village. But come here to the cafe, and I'll take you up. Fabrizio started to say something, but Michael gave him one look and the shepherd's tongue froze in his mouth. This was not lost on Vitelli. So when Michael stood up and stretched out his hand, the cafe owner took it and smiled. He would make some inquiries, and if the answers were wrong, he could always greet Michael with his two sons bearing their own shotguns. The cafe owner was not without his contacts among the friends of the friends. But something told him this was one of those wild strokes of good fortune that Sicilians always believed in. Something told him that his daughter's beauty would make her fortune and her family secure. And it was just as well. Some of the local youths were already beginning to buzz around, and this stranger with his broken face could do the necessary job of scaring them off. Vitelli, to show his goodwill, sent the strangers off with a bottle of his best and coldest wine. He noticed that one of the shepherds paid the bill. This impressed him even more, made it clear that Michael was the superior of the two men who accompanied him. Michael was no longer interested in his hike. They found a garage and hired a car and driver to take them back to Corleone. And, some time before supper, Dr. Taza must have been informed by the shepherds of what had happened. That evening, sitting in the garden, Dr. Taza said to Don Tomasino, Our friend got hit by a thunderbolt today. Don Tomasino did not seem surprised. He grunted. I wish some of those young fellows in Palermo would get a thunderbolt. Maybe I could get some peace. He was talking about the new-style mafia chiefs rising in the big cities of Palermo and challenging the power of old regime stalwarts like himself. Michael said to Tomasino, I want you to tell those two sheep herders to leave me alone Sunday. I'm going to go to this girl's family for dinner and I don't want them hanging around. Don Tomasino shook his head. I'm responsible to your father for you. Don't ask me that. Another thing. I hear you've even talked marriage. I can't allow that until I've sent somebody to speak to your father. Michael Corleone was very careful. This was, after all, a man of respect. Don Tomasino, you know my father. He's a man who goes deaf when somebody says the word no to him. And he doesn't get his hearing back until they answer him with a yes. Willie has heard my no many times. I understand about the two guards. I don't want to cause you trouble. They can come with me Sunday. But if I want to marry, I'll marry. Surely if I don't permit my own father to interfere with my personal life, it would be an insult to him to allow you to do so. The capo mafioso sighed. Well, then marriage it will have to be. I know your thunderbolt. She is a good girl from a respectable family. 
You can't dishonor them without the father trying to kill you. And then you'll have to shed blood. Besides, I know the family well. I can't allow it to happen. She may not be able to stand the sight of me. And she's a very young girl. She'll think me old. He saw the two men smiling at him. I'll need some money for presents, and I think I'll need a car. The Don nodded. Fabrizio will take care of everything. He's a clever boy. They taught him mechanics in the Navy. I'll give you some money in the morning, and I'll let your father know what's happening. That I must do. Michael said to Dr. Taza, Have you got anything that can dry up this damn snot always coming out of my nose? I can't have that girl seeing me wiping it all the time. Dr. Taza said, I'll cool it with a drug before you have to see her. It makes your flesh a little numb, but don't worry. You won't be kissing her for a while yet. Both Dr. and Don smiled at this witticism. By Sunday, Michael had an Alfa Romeo, battered but serviceable. He had also made a bus trip to Palermo to buy presents for the girl and her family. He had learned that the girl's name was Apollonia, and every night he thought of her lovely face and her lovely name. He had to drink a good deal of wine to get some sleep, and orders were given to the old women servants in the house to leave a chilled bottle at his bedside. He drank it empty every night. On Sunday, to the tolling of church bells that covered all of Sicily, he drove the Alfa Romeo to the village and parked it just outside the cafe. Carlo and Fabrizio were in the back seat with their lupatas, and Michael told them they were to wait in the cafe. They were not to come to the house. The cafe was closed, but Vitelli was there waiting for them, leaning against the railing of his empty terrace. They shook hands all around, and Michael took the three packages, the presents, and trudged up the hill with Vitelli to his home. This proved to be larger than the usual village hut. The Vitellis were not poverty-stricken. Inside, the house was familiar with statues of the Madonna entombed in glass, votive lights flickering redly at their feet. The two sons were waiting, also dressed in their Sunday black. They were two sturdy young men, just out of their teens, but looking older because of their hard work on the farm. The mother was a vigorous woman, as stout as her husband. There was no sign of the girl. After the introductions, which Michael did not even hear, they sat in the room that might possibly have been a living room, or just as easily the formal dining room. It was cluttered with all kinds of furniture, and not very large, but for Sicily it was middle-class splendor. Michael gave Signor Vitelli and Signora Vitelli their presents. For the father, it was a gold cigar cutter. For the mother, a bolt of the finest cloth purchasable in Palermo. He still had one package for the girl. His presents were received with reserved thanks. The gifts were a little too premature. He should not have given anything until his second visit. The father said to him, in man-to-man, -man, country fashion, Don't think we're so of no account to welcome strangers into our house so easily. But Don Tomasino vouched for you personally, and nobody in this province would ever doubt the word of that good man. And so we make you welcome. But I must tell you, that if your intentions are serious about my daughter, we will have to know a little more about you and your family. You can understand. Your family is from this country. Michael nodded and said politely, I will tell you anything you wish to know, any time. Signor Vitelli held up a hand. I'm not a nosy man. Let's see if it's necessary first. Right now, you are welcome in my house as a friend of Don Tomasino. Despite the drug painted inside his nose, Michael actually smelled the girl's presence in the room. He turned, and she was standing in the arched doorway that led to the back of the house. The smell was of fresh flowers and lemon blossoms, but she wore nothing in her hair of jet black curls, nothing on her plain, severe black dress, obviously her Sunday best. She gave him a quick glance and a tiny smile before she cast her eyes down demurely and sat down next to her mother. Again, Michael felt that shortness of breath, that flooding through his body of something that was not so much desire as an insane possessiveness, he understood for the first time the classical jealousy of the Italian male. He was, at that moment, ready to kill anyone who touched this girl, who tried to claim her, take her away from him. He wanted to own her as wildly as a miser wants to own gold coins, as hungrily as a sharecropper wants to own his own land. Nothing was going to stop him from owning this girl, possessing her, locking her in a house, and keeping her prisoner only for himself. He didn't want anyone even to see her. When she turned to smile at one of her brothers, Michael gave that young man a murderous look without even realizing it. The family could see it was a classical case of the thunderbolt, and they were reassured. This young man would be putty in their daughter's hands until they were married. After that, of course, things would change, but it wouldn't matter. 
Michael had bought himself some new clothes in Palermo and was no longer the roughly dressed peasant, and it was obvious to the family that he was a don of some kind. His smashed face did not make him as evil-looking as he believed, because his other profile was so handsome it made the disfigurement interesting even. And in any case, this was a land where to be called disfigured you had to compete with a host of men who had suffered extreme physical misfortune. Michael looked directly at the girl, the lovely ovals of her face. Her lips now, he could see, were almost blue, so dark was the blood pulsating in them. He said, not daring to speak her name, I saw you by the orange groves the other day, when you ran away. I hope I didn't frighten you. The girl raised her eyes to him, for just a fraction. She shook her head, but the loveliness of those eyes had made Michael look away. The mother said tartly, Apollonia, speak to the poor fellow. He's come miles to see you. But the girl's long jet lashes remained closed like wings over her eyes. Michael handed her the present wrapped in gold paper, and the girl put it in her lap. The father said, Open it, girl. But her hands did not move. Her hands were small and brown, and urchin's hands. The mother reached over and opened the package impatiently, yet careful not to tear the precious paper. The red velvet jeweler's box gave her pause. She had never held such a thing in her hands and didn't know how to spring its catch. But she got it open on pure instinct, and then took out the present. It was a heavy gold chain to be worn as a necklace, and it awed them not only because of its obvious value, but because the gift of gold in this society was a statement of the most serious intentions. It was no less than a proposal of matrimony, or rather the signal that there was the intention to propose matrimony. They could no longer doubt the seriousness of this stranger, and they could not doubt his substance. Apollonia still had not touched her present. Her mother held it up for her to see, and she raised those long lashes for a moment, and then she looked directly at Michael, her doe-like brown eyes grave, and said, Grazia. It was the first time he had heard her voice. It had all the velvety softness of youth and shyness, and it set Michael's ears ringing. He kept looking away from her and talking to the father and mother simply because looking at her confused him so much. But he noticed that despite the conservative looseness of her dress, her body almost shone through the cloth with sheer sensuality. And he noticed the darkening of her skin blushing, the dark, creamy skin going darker with the blood surging to her face. Finally, Michael rose to go, and the family rose too. They said their goodbyes formally, the girl at last confronting him as they shook hands, and he felt the shock of her skin on his skin, her skin, warm and rough, peasant skin. The father walked down the hill with him to his car and invited him to Sunday dinner the next week. Michael nodded, but he knew he couldn't wait a week to see the girl again. He didn't. The next day, without his shepherds, he drove to the village and sat on the garden terrace of the cafe to chat with her father. Signor Vitelli took pity on him and sent for his wife and daughter to come down to the cafe to join them. This meeting was less awkward. The girl Apollonia was less shy and spoke more. She was dressed in her everyday print frock, which suited her coloring much better. The next day the same thing happened, only this time Apollonia was wearing the gold chain he had given her. He smiled at her then, knowing that this was a signal to him. He walked with her up the hill, her mother close behind them. But it was impossible for the two young people to keep their bodies from brushing against each other, and once Apollonia stumbled and fell against him so that he had to hold her, and her body so warm and alive in his hand started a deep wave of blood rising in his body. They could not see the mother behind them smiling because her daughter was a mountain goat and had not stumbled on this path since she was an infant in diapers, and smiling because this was the only way this young man was going to get his hands on her daughter until the marriage. This went on for two weeks. Michael brought her presents every time he came, and gradually she became less shy. But they could never meet without a chaperone being present. She was just a village girl, barely literate, with no idea of the world. But she had a freshness, an eagerness for life that, with the help of the language barrier, made her seem interesting. Everything went very swiftly at Michael's request, and because the girl was not only fascinated by him, but knew he must be rich, a wedding date was set for the Sunday two weeks away. Now Don Tomasino took a hand. He had received word from America that Michael was not subject to orders, but that all elementary precautions should be taken. So Don Tomasino appointed himself the parent of the bridegroom to ensure the presence of his own bodyguards. Carlo and Fabrizio were also members of the wedding party from Corleone, as was Dr. Taza. The bride and groom would live in Dr. Taza's villa, surrounded by its stone wall. The wedding was the usual peasant one. The villagers stood in the streets and threw flowers as the bridal party, principals and guests, went on foot from the church to the bride's home. 
The wedding procession pelted the neighbors with sugar-coated almonds, the traditional wedding candies, and with candies left over, made sugary white mountains on the bride's wedding bed. In this case, only a symbolic one, since the first night would be spent in the villa outside Corleone. The wedding feast went on until midnight, but bride and groom would leave before that in the Alfa Romeo. When that time came, Michael was surprised to find that the mother was coming with them to the Corleone Villa at the request of the bride. The father explained, the girl was young, a virgin, a little frightened. She would need someone to talk to on the morning following her bridal night, to put her on the right track if things went wrong. These matters could sometimes get very tricky. Michael saw Apollonia looking at him with doubt in her huge doe brown eyes. He smiled at her and nodded. And so it came about that they drove back to the villa outside Corleone with the mother-in-law in the car, but the older woman immediately put her head together with the servants of Dr. Taza, gave her daughter a hug and a kiss, and disappeared from the scene. Michael and his bride were allowed to go to their huge bedroom alone. Apollonia was still wearing her bridal costume with a cloak thrown over it. Her trunk and case had been brought up to the room from the car. On a small table was a bottle of wine and a plate of small wedding cakes. The huge canopied bed was never out of their vision. The young girl in the center of the room waited for Michael to make the first move. And now that he had her alone, now that he legally possessed her, now that there was no barrier to his enjoying that body and face he had dreamed about every night, Michael could not bring himself to approach her. He watched as she took off the bridal shawl and draped it over a chair and placed the bridal crown on the small dressing table. That table had an array of perfumes and creams that Michael had had sent from Palermo, the girl tallied them with her eyes for a moment. Michael turned off the lights, thinking the girl was waiting for some darkness to shield her body while she undressed. But the Sicilian moon came through the unshuttered windows, bright as gold, and Michael went to close the shutters, but not all the way. The room would be too warm. The girl was still standing by the table, and so Michael went out of the room and down the hall to the bathroom. He and Dr. Taza and Don Tomasino had taken a glass of wine together in the garden while the women had prepared themselves for bed. He had expected to find Apollonia in her nightgown when he returned, already between the covers. He was surprised that the mother had not done this service for her daughter. Maybe Apollonia had wanted him to help her to undress. But he was certain she was too shy, too innocent, for such forward behavior. Coming back into the bedroom, he found it completely dark. Someone had closed the shutters all the way. He groped his way toward the bed and could make out the shape of Apollonia's body lying under the covers, her back to him, her body curved away from him, and huddled up. He undressed and slipped naked beneath the sheets. He stretched out one hand and touched silky, naked skin. She had not put on her gown, and this boldness delighted him. Slowly, carefully, he put one hand on her shoulder and pressed her body gently so that she would turn to him. She turned slowly, and his hand touched her breast soft, full. And then she was in his arms so quickly that their bodies came together in one line of silken electricity, and he finally had his arms around her, was kissing her warm mouth deeply, was crushing her body and breasts against him, and then rolling his body on top of hers. Her flesh and hair, taut silk, now she was all eagerness, surging against him wildly in a virginal, erotic frenzy. When he entered her, she gave a little gasp, and was still for just a second, and then, in a powerful forward thrust of her pelvis, she locked her satiny legs around his hips. When they came to the end, they were locked together so fiercely, straining against each other so violently, that falling away from each other was like the tremble before death. That night and the weeks that followed, Michael Corleone came to understand the premium put on virginity by socially primitive people. It was a period of sensuality that he had never before experienced, a sensuality mixed with a feeling of masculine power. Apollonia in those first days became almost his slave. Given trust, given affection, a young, full-blooded girl aroused from virginity to erotic awareness was as delicious as an exactly ripe fruit. She, on her part, brightened up the rather gloomy, masculine atmosphere of the villa. She had packed her mother off the very next day after her bridal night and presided at the communal table with bright, girlish charm. Don Tomasino dined with them every night, and Dr. Taza told all his old stories as they drank wine in the garden full of statues garlanded with blood-red flowers. And so the evenings passed pleasantly enough. At night in their bedroom, the newly married couple spent hours of feverish lovemaking. Michael could not get enough of Apollonia's beautifully sculpted body, her honey-colored skin, her huge brown eyes glowing with passion. 
She had a wonderfully fresh smell, a fleshy smell perfumed by her sex, yet almost sweet and unbearably aphrodisiacal. Her virginal passion matched his nuptial lust, and often it was dawn when they fell into an exhausted slumber. Sometimes, spent but not yet ready for sleep, Michael sat on the window ledge and stared at Apollonia's naked body while she slept. Her face, too, was lovely in repose, a perfect face he had seen before only in art books of painted Italian Madonnas, who by no stretch of the artist's skill could be thought virginal. In the first week of their marriage, they went on picnics and small trips in the Alfa Romeo. But then, Don Tomasino took Michael aside and explained that the marriage had made his presence and identity common knowledge in that part of Sicily, and precautions had to be taken against the enemies of the Corleone family, whose long arms also stretched to this island refuge. Don Tomasino put armed guards around his villa, and the two shepherds, Calo and Fabrizio, were fixtures inside the walls. So Michael and his wife had to remain on the villa grounds. Michael passed the time by teaching Apollonia to read and write English and to drive the car along the inner walls of the villa. About this time, Don Tomasino seemed to be preoccupied in poor company. He was still having trouble with the new mafia in the town of Palermo, Dr. Tassa said. One night in the garden, an old village woman who worked in the house as a servant brought a dish of fresh olives and then turned to Michael and said, Is it true what everybody is saying, that you are the son of Don Corleone in New York City, the godfather? Michael saw Don Tomasino shaking his head in disgust at the general knowledge of their secret. But the old crone was looking at him in so concerned a fashion, as if it was important for her to know the truth, that Michael nodded. Do you know my father? The woman's name was Philomena, and her face was as wrinkled and brown as a walnut, her brown-stained teeth showing through the shell of her flesh. For the first time since he had been in the villa, she smiled at him. The godfather saved my life once, and my brains too. She made a gesture toward her head. She obviously wanted to say something else, so Michael smiled to encourage her. She asked, almost fearfully, Is it true that Luca Brasi is dead? Michael nodded again and was surprised at the look of release on the old woman's face. Philomena crossed herself. God forgive me, but may his soul roast in hell for eternity. Michael remembered his old curiosity about Brasi and had the sudden intuition that this woman knew the story Hagen and Sonny had refused to tell him. He poured the woman a glass of wine and made her sit down. Tell me about my father and Luca Brasi. I know some of it, but how did they become friends, and why was Brasi so devoted to my father? Don't be afraid. Come, tell me. Filomena's wrinkled face, her raisin black eyes, turned to Don Tomasino, who in some way signaled his permission. And so Filomena passed the evening for them, by telling her story. Thirty years before, Philomena had been a midwife in New York City on 10th Avenue, servicing the Italian colony. The women were always pregnant, and she prospered. She taught doctors a few things when they tried to interfere in a difficult birth. Her husband was then a prosperous grocery store owner. Dead now, poor soul, she blessed him, though he had been a card player and wencher who never thought to put aside for hard times. In any event, one cursed night thirty years ago, when all honest people were long in their beds, there came a knocking on Philomena's door. She was by no means frightened. It was the quiet hour babes prudently chose to enter safely into this sinful world. And so she dressed and opened the door. Outside, it was Luca Brasi, whose reputation even then was fearsome. It was known also that he was a bachelor. And so Philomena was immediately frightened. She thought he had come to do her husband harm, that perhaps her husband had foolishly refused Brasi some small favor. But Brasi had come on the usual errand. He told Philomena that there was a woman about to give birth, that the house was out of the neighborhood some distance away, and that she was to come with him. Philomena immediately sensed something amiss. Brasi's brutal face looked almost like that of a madman that night. He was obviously in the grip of some demon. She tried to protest that she attended only women whose history she knew, but he shoved a handful of green dollars in her hand and ordered her roughly to come along with him. She was too frightened to refuse. In the street was a Ford, its driver of the same feather as Luca Brasi. The drive was no more than 30 minutes to a small frame house in Long Island City right over the bridge, a two-family house, but obviously now tenanted only by Brasi and his gang. For there were some other ruffians in the kitchen playing cards and drinking. Brasi took Philomena up the stairs to a bedroom. In the bed was a young, pretty girl who looked Irish, her face painted, her hair red, and with a belly swollen like a sow. The poor girl was so frightened. 
When she saw Brazi, she turned her head away in terror. Yes, terror. And indeed, the look of hatred on Brazi's evil face was the most frightening thing she had ever seen in her life. Here, Philomena crossed herself again. To make a long story short, Brazi left the room. Two of his men assisted the midwife, and the baby was born. The mother was exhausted and went into a deep sleep. Brazi was summoned, and Philomena, who had wrapped the newborn child in an extra blanket, extended the bundle to him and said, If you're the father, take her. My work is finished. Brazi glared at her, malevolent, insanity stamped on his face. Yes, I'm the father, he said, but I don't want any of that race to live. Take it down to the basement and throw it into the furnace. For a moment, Philomena thought she had not understood him properly. She was puzzled by his use of the word race. Did he mean because the girl was not Italian, or did he mean because the girl was obviously of the lowest type, a whore in short? Or did he mean that anything springing from his loins he forbade to live? And then she was sure he was making a brutal joke. She said shortly, It's your child. Do what you want. And she tried to hand him the bundle. At this time the exhausted mother awoke and turned on her side to face them. She was just in time to see Brazi thrust violently at the bundle, crushing the newborn infant against Philomena's chest. She called out weakly, Luke, Luke, I'm sorry. And Brazi turned to face her. It was terrible, Philomena said now, so terrible. They were like two mad animals. They were not human. The hatred they bore each other blazed through the room. Nothing else, not even the newborn infant, existed for them at that moment. And yet there was a strange passion, a bloody, demonical lust so unnatural you knew they were damned forever. Then Luca Brasi turned back to Philomena and said harshly, Do what I tell you. I'll make you rich. Philomena could not speak in her terror. She shook her head. Finally, she managed to whisper, You do it. You're the father. Do it, if you like. But Brazi didn't answer. Instead, he drew a knife from inside his shirt. I'll cut your throat, he said. She must have gone into shock then, because the next thing she remembered, they were all standing in the basement of the house in front of a square iron furnace. Philomena was still holding the blanketed baby, which had not made a sound. Maybe if it had cried. Maybe if I had been shrewd enough to pinch it, Philomena said, that monster would have shown mercy. One of the men must have opened the furnace door. The fire now was visible. And then she was alone with Brazi in that basement with its sweating pipes, its mousy odor. Brazi had his knife out again, and there could be no doubting that he would kill her. There were the flames. There were Brazi's eyes. His face was the gargoyle of the devil. It was not human. It was not sane. He pushed her toward the open furnace door. At this point, Philomena fell silent. She folded her bony hands in her lap and looked directly at Michael. He knew what she wanted, how she wanted to tell him, without using her voice. He asked gently, Did you do it? She nodded. It was only after another glass of wine and crossing herself and muttering a prayer that she continued her story. She was given a bundle of money and driven home. She understood that if she uttered a word about what had happened, she would be killed. But two days later, Brazi murdered the young Irish girl, the mother of the infant, and was arrested by the police. Philomena, frightened out of her wits, went to the godfather and told her story. He ordered her to keep silent, that he would attend to everything. At that time, Brazi did not work for Don Corleone. Before Don Corleone could set matters aright, Luca Brazi tried to commit suicide in his cell, hacking at his throat with a piece of glass. He was transferred to the prison hospital, and by the time he recovered, Don Corleone had arranged everything. The police did not have a case they could prove in court, and Luca Brasi was released. Though Don Corleone assured Filomena that she had nothing to fear from either Luca Brasi or the police, she had no peace. Her nerves were shattered, and she could no longer work at her profession. Finally, she persuaded her husband to sell the grocery store, and they returned to Italy. Her husband was a good man, had been told everything, and understood. But he was a weak man and in Italy squandered the fortune they had both slaved in America to earn. And so, after he died, she had become a servant. So Philomena ended her story. She had another glass of wine and said to Michael, I bless the name of your father. He always sent me money when I asked. He saved me from Brasi. Tell him I say a prayer for his soul every night, and that he shouldn't fear dying. After she had left, Michael asked Don Tomasino, Is her story true? The capo mafioso nodded, and Michael thought, no wonder nobody had wanted to tell him the story. Some story. Some Luca. 
The next morning, Michael wanted to discuss the whole thing with Don Tomasino, but learned that the old man had been called to Palermo by an urgent message delivered by a courier. That evening, Don Tomasino returned and took Michael aside. News had come from America, he said. News that it grieved him to tell. Santino Corleone had been killed. Chapter 24 The Sicilian sun, early morning, lemon-colored, filled Michael's bedroom. He awoke, and feeling Apollonia's satiny body against his own sleep-warm skin, made her come awake with love. When they were done, even all the months of complete possession could not stop him from marveling at her beauty and her passion. She left the bedroom to wash and dress in the bathroom down the hall. Michael, still naked, the morning sun refreshing his body, lit a cigarette and relaxed on the bed. This was the last morning they would spend in this house and the villa. Don Tomasino had arranged for him to be transferred to another town on the southern coast of Sicily. Apollonia, in the first month of pregnancy, wanted to visit with her family for a few weeks and would join him at the new hiding place after the visit. The night before, Don Tomasino had sat with Michael in the garden after Apollonia had gone to bed. The Don had been worried and tired and admitted that he was concerned about Michael's safety. Your marriage brought you into sight. I'm surprised your father hasn't made arrangements for you to go someplace else. In any case, I'm having my own troubles with the young Turks in Palermo. I've offered some fair arrangements so that they can wet their beaks more than they deserve. But those scum want everything. I can't understand their attitude. They've tried a few little tricks, but I'm not so easy to kill. They must know I'm too strong for them to hold me so cheaply. But uh, that's the trouble with young people, no matter how talented. They don't reason things out, and they want all the water in the well. And then Don Tomasino had told Michael that the two shepherds, Fabrizio and Calo, would go with him as bodyguards in the Alfa Romeo. Don Tomasino would say his goodbyes tonight, since he would be off early in the morning at dawn to see to his affairs in Palermo. Also, Michael was not to tell Dr. Taza about the move, since the doctor planned to spend the evening in Palermo and might blab. Michael had known Don Tomasino was in trouble. Armed guards patrolled the walls of the villa at night, and a few faithful shepherds with their lupatas were always in the house. Don Tomasino himself went heavily armed, and a personal bodyguard attended him at all times. The morning sun was now too strong. Michael stubbed out his cigarette and put on work pants, work shirt, and the peaked cap most Sicilian men wore. Still barefooted, he leaned out his bedroom window and saw Fabrizio sitting in one of the garden chairs. Fabrizio was lazily combing his thick, dark hair. His lupata was carelessly thrown across the garden table. Michael whistled, and Fabrizio looked up to his window. Michael called down to him. Get the car! I'll be leaving in five minutes. Where's Carlo? Fabrizio stood up. His shirt was open, exposing the blue and red lines of the tattoo on his chest. Carlo is having a cup of coffee in the kitchen. Is your wife coming with you? Michael squinted down at him. It occurred to him that Fabrizio had been following Apollonia too much with his eyes the last few weeks. Not that he would dare ever to make an advance toward the wife of a friend of the Dons. In Sicily, there was no surer road to death. No, she's going home to her family first. She'll join us in a few days. He watched Fabrizio hurry into the stone hut that served as a garage for the Alfa Romeo. Michael went down the hall to wash. Apollonia was gone. She was most likely in the kitchen preparing his breakfast with her own hands to wash out the guilt she felt because she wanted to see her family one more time before going so far away to the other end of Sicily. Don Tomasino would arrange transportation for her to where Michael would be. Down in the kitchen, the old woman, Philomena, brought him his coffee and shyly bid him a goodbye. I'll remember you to my father. And she nodded. Carlo came into the kitchen and said to Michael, The car's outside. Shall I get your bag? No, I'll get it. Where's Apollo? Carlo's face broke into an amused grin. She's sitting in the driver's seat of the car, dying to step out of the gas. She'll be a real American woman before she gets to America. It was unheard of for one of the peasant women in Sicily to attempt driving a car. But Michael sometimes let Apollonia guide the Alfa Romeo around the inside of the villa walls. Always beside her, however, because she sometimes stepped on the gas when she meant to step on the brake. Michael said to Carlo, Get Fabrizio and wait for me in the car. He went out of the kitchen and ran up the stairs to the bedroom. His bag was already packed. Before picking it up, he looked out the window and saw the car parked in front of the portico steps rather than the kitchen entrance. Apollonio was sitting in the car, 
her hands on the wheel like a child playing. Kahlo was just putting the lunch basket in the rear seat. And then Michael was annoyed to see Fabrizio disappearing through the gates of the villa on some errand outside. What the hell was he doing? He saw Fabrizio take a look over his shoulder, a look that was somehow furtive. He'd have to straighten that damn shepherd out. Michael went down the stairs and decided to go through the kitchen to see Philomena again and give her a final farewell. He asked the old woman, Is Dr. Taza still sleeping? Philomena's wrinkled face was sly. All roosters can't greet the sun. The doctor went to Palermo last night. Michael laughed. He went out the kitchen entrance, and the smell of lemon blossoms penetrated even his sinus-filled nose. He saw Apollonia wave to him from the car just ten paces up the villa's driveway, and then he realized she was motioning him to stay where he was, that she meant to drive the car to where he stood. Kahlo stood grinning beside the car, his lupata dangling in his hand. But there was still no sign of Fabrizio. At that moment, without any conscious reasoning process, everything came together in his mind, and Michael shouted to the girl, No! No! But his shout was drowned in the roar of the tremendous explosion as Apollonia switched on the ignition. The kitchen door shattered into fragments, and Michael was hurled along the wall of the villa for a good ten feet. Stones tumbling from the villa roof hit him on the shoulders, and one glanced off his skull as he was lying on the ground. He was conscious just long enough to see that nothing remained of the Alfa Romeo but its four wheels and the steel shafts which held them together. He came to consciousness in a room that seemed very dark, and heard voices that were so low that they were pure sound rather than words. Out of animal instinct he tried to pretend he was still unconscious, but the voices stopped, and someone was leaning from a chair close to his bed, and the voice was distinct now, saying, Well, he's uh, with us uh, finally. A lamp went on, its light like white fire on his eyeballs, and Michael turned his head. It felt very heavy, numb. And then he could see the face over his bed was that of Dr. Taza. Let me look at you a minute and I'll uh, put the light out. He was busy shining a small pencil flashlight into Michael's eyes. He'll be all right. Dr. Taza turned to someone else in the room. You can uh, speak to him. It was Don Tomasino sitting on a chair near his bed. Michael could see him clearly now. Michael? Michael, can I talk to you? Do you want to rest? It was easier to raise a hand to make a gesture, and Michael did so, and Don Tomasino said, Did Fabrizio bring the car from the garage? Michael, without knowing he did so, smiled. It was in some strange way a chilling smile of assent. Fabrizio has vanished. Listen to me, Michael. You've been unconscious for nearly a week. Do you understand? Everybody thinks you're dead, so you're safe now. They've stopped looking for you. I've sent messages to your father, and he sent back instructions. It won't be long now. You'll be back in America. Meanwhile, you'll rest here, quietly. You're safe up in the mountains in a special farmhouse I own. The Palermo people have made their peace with me, now that you are supposed to be dead. So it was you they were after all the time. They wanted to kill you while making people think it was me they were after. That's something you should know. As for everything else, leave it all to me. You recover your strength and be tranquil. Michael was remembering everything now. He knew his wife was dead, that Kahlo was dead. He thought of the old woman in the kitchen. He couldn't remember if she'd come outside with him. He whispered, Philomena? She wasn't hurt. Just a bloody nose from the blast. Don't worry about her. Fabrizio, let your shepherds know that the one who gives me Fabrizio will own the finest pastures in Sicily. Both men seemed to sigh with relief. Don Tomasino lifted a glass from a nearby table and drank from it an amber fluid that jolted his head up. Dr. Taza sat on the bed. You know, uh, you're a widower. That's rare in Sicily. As if the distinction might comfort him. Michael motioned to Don Tomasino to lean closer. The Don sat on the bed and bent his head. Tell my father to get me home. Tell my father I wish to be his son. But it was to be another month before Michael recovered from his injuries, and another two months after that before all the necessary papers and arrangements were ready. 
Then he was flown from Palermo to Rome and from Rome to New York. In all that time, no trace had been found of Fabrizio. Book 7, Chapter 25 when Kay Adams received her college degree, she took a job teaching grade school in her New Hampshire hometown. The first six months after Michael vanished, she made weekly telephone calls to his mother asking about him. Mrs. Corleone was always friendly and always wound up saying, You were uh, very, very nice a girl. You forget about Mikey and find a nice a husband. Kay was not offended at her bluntness and understood that the mother spoke out of concern for her as a young girl in an impossible situation. When her first school term ended, she decided to go to New York to buy some decent clothes and see some old college girlfriends. She thought also about looking for some sort of interesting job in New York. She had lived like a spinster for almost two years, reading and teaching, refusing dates, refusing to go out at all, even though she had given up making calls to Long Beach. She knew she couldn't keep that up. She was becoming irritable and unhappy. But she had always believed Michael would write her or send her a message of some sort. That he had not done so humiliated her. It saddened her that he was so distrustful, even of her. She took an early train and was checked into her hotel by mid-afternoon. Her girlfriends worked, and she didn't want to bother them at their jobs. She planned to call them at night. And she didn't really feel like going shopping after the exhausting train trip. Being alone in the hotel room, remembering all the times she and Michael had used hotel rooms to make love, gave her a feeling of desolation. It was that, more than anything else, that gave her the idea of calling Michael's mother out in Long Beach. The phone was answered by a rough, masculine voice with a typical, to her, New York accent. Kay asked to speak to Mrs. Corleone. There was a few minutes' silence, and then Kay heard the heavily accented voice asking who it was. Kay was a little embarrassed now. This is Kay Adams, Mrs. Corleone. Do you remember me? Sure, sure I remember you. How come you no call up no more? You get married. Oh, no. I've been busy. She was surprised at the mother obviously being annoyed that she had stopped calling. Have you heard anything from Michael? Is he all right? There was silence at the other end of the phone, and then Mrs. Corleone's voice came strong. Mikey is home. He no call you up? He no see you? Kay felt her stomach go weak from shock and a humiliating desire to weep. Her voice broke a little when she asked, How long has he been home? Six a months. Oh, I see. And she did. She felt hot waves of shame that Michael's mother knew he was treating her so cheaply. And then she was angry. Angry at Michael, at his mother, angry at all foreigners, Italians who didn't have the common courtesy to keep up a decent show of friendship, even if a love affair was over. Didn't Michael know she would be concerned for him as a friend, even if he no longer wanted her for a bed companion, even if he no longer wanted to marry her? Did he think she was one of those poor, benighted Italian girls who would commit suicide or make a scene after giving up her virginity and then being thrown over? But she kept her voice as cool as possible. I see. Thank you very much. I'm glad Michael's home again and all right. I just wanted to know. I won't call you again. Mrs. Corleone's voice came impatiently over the phone, as if she had heard nothing that Kay had said. You want to see Mikey? You come out here now. Give him a nice surprise. You take a taxi and tell the man at the gate to pay the taxi for you. You tell the taxi man he gets two times his clock. Otherwise, he no come way out of Long Beach. But don't you pay. My husband's a man at the gate pay the taxi. I couldn't do that, Mrs. Corleone. If Michael wanted to see me, he would have called me at home before this. Obviously, he doesn't want to resume our relationship. You are a very nice girl. You got a nice legs, but you no got a much brains. She chuckled. You come out to see me, not Mikey. I want to talk to you. You come right now and no pay the taxi. I wait for you. The phone clicked. Mrs. Corleone had hung up. Kay could have called back and said she wasn't coming, but she knew she had to see Michael to talk to him, even if it was just polite talk. If he was home now, openly, that meant he was no longer in trouble. He could live normally. She jumped off the bed and started to get ready to see him. She took a great deal of care with her makeup and dress. When she was ready to leave, she stared at her reflection in the mirror. Was she better looking than when Michael had disappeared? Or would he find her unattractively older? 
Her figure had become more womanly, her hips rounder, her breasts fuller. Italians like that, supposedly, though Michael had always said he loved her being so thin. It didn't matter, really. Michael obviously didn't want anything to do with her anymore. Otherwise, he most certainly would have called in the six months he had been home. The taxi she hailed refused to take her to Long Beach until she gave him a pretty smile and told him she would pay double the meter. It was nearly an hour's ride, and the mall in Long Beach had changed since she last saw it. There were iron fences around it, and an iron gate barred the mall entrance. A man wearing slacks and a white jacket over a red shirt opened the gate, poked his head into the cab to read the meter, and gave the cab driver some bills. Then, when Kay saw the driver was not protesting and was happy with the money paid, she got out and walked across the mall to the central house. Mrs. Corleone herself opened the door and greeted Kay with a warm embrace that surprised her. Then she surveyed Kay with an appraising eye. You are beautiful, girl. I have a stupid sons. She pulled Kay inside the door and led her to the kitchen, where a platter of food was already set out and a pot of coffee perked on the stove. Michael comes home pretty soon. You surprise him. They sat down together, and the old woman forced Kay to eat, meanwhile asking questions with great curiosity. She was delighted that Kay was a schoolteacher and that she had come to New York to visit old girlfriends and that Kay was only 24 years old. She kept nodding her head as if all the facts accorded with some private specifications in her mind. Kay was so nervous that she just answered the questions, never saying anything else. She saw him first through the kitchen window. A car pulled up in front of the house and two other men got out. Then, Michael. He straightened up to talk with one of the other men. His profile, the left one, was exposed to her view. It was cracked, indented, like the plastic face of a doll that a child has wantonly kicked. In a curious way, it did not mar his handsomeness in her eyes, but moved her to tears. She saw him put a snow-white handkerchief to his mouth and nose and hold it there for a moment while he turned away to come into the house. She heard the door open and his footsteps in the hall turning into the kitchen, and then... He was in the open space, seeing her and his mother. He seemed impassive, and then he smiled ever so slightly, the broken half of his face halting the widening of his mouth. And Kay, who had meant just to say, Hello, how are you, in the coolest possible way, slipped out of her seat to run into his arms, bury her face against his shoulder. He kissed her wet cheek and held her until she finished weeping, and then he walked her out to his car, waved his bodyguard away, and drove off with her beside him, she repairing her makeup by simply wiping what was left of it away with her handkerchief. I never meant to do that. It's just that nobody told me how badly they hurt you. Michael laughed and touched the broken side of his face. You mean this? That's nothing. It just gives me sinus trouble. Now that I'm home, I'll probably get it fixed. I couldn't write you or anything. You, you have to understand that before anything else. Okay. I've got a place in the city. Is it all right if we go there, or should it be dinner and drinks at a restaurant? I'm not hungry. They drove toward New York in silence for a while. Did you get your degree? Yes. I'm teaching grade school in my hometown now. Did they find the man who really killed the policeman? Is that why you were able to come home? For a moment, Michael didn't answer. Yes, they did. It was in all the New York papers. Didn't you read about it? Kay laughed with the relief of him denying he was a murderer. We only get the New York Times up in our town. I guess it was buried back in page 89. If I'd read about it, I'd have called your mother sooner. She paused and then said, It's funny, the way your mother used to talk. I almost believed you'd done it. And just before you came, while we were drinking coffee, she told me about that crazy man who confessed. Maybe my mother did believe it at first. Your own mother? Michael grinned. Mothers are like cops. They always believe the worst. Michael parked the car in a garage on Mulberry Street, where the owner seemed to know him. He took Kay around the corner to what looked like a fairly decrepit brownstone house, which fitted into the rundown neighborhood. Michael had a key to the front door, and when they went inside, Kay saw that it was as expensively and comfortably furnished as a millionaire's townhouse. Michael led her to the upstairs apartment, which consisted of an enormous living room, a huge kitchen and door that led to the bedroom. In one corner of the living room was a bar, and Michael mixed them both a drink. They sat on a sofa together, and Michael said quietly, We might as well go into the bedroom. Kay took a long pull from her drink and smiled at him. Yes. 
For Kay, the lovemaking was almost like it had been before, except that Michael was rougher, more direct, not as tender as he had been, as if he were on guard against her, but she didn't want to complain. It would wear off. In a funny way, men were more sensitive in a situation like this, she thought. She had found making love to Michael after a two-year absence the most natural thing in the world. It was as if he had never been away. You could have written me. You could have trusted me, she said, nestling against his body. I would have practiced the New England omerta. Yankees are pretty close-mouthed, too, you know. Michael laughed softly in the darkness. I never figured you to be waiting. I never figured you to wait after what happened. I never believed you killed those two men. Except maybe when your mother seemed to think so. But I never believed it in my heart. I know you too well. She could hear Michael give a sigh. It doesn't matter whether I did or not. You have to understand that. Kay was a little stunned by the coldness in his voice. So just tell me now, did you or didn't you? Michael sat up on his pillow, and in the darkness a light flared as he got a cigarette going. If I asked you to marry me, would I have to answer that question first before you'd give me an answer to mine? I don't care. I love you. I don't care. If you loved me, you wouldn't be afraid to tell me the truth. You wouldn't be afraid I might tell the police. That's it, isn't it? You're really a gangster then, isn't that so? But I really don't care. What I care about is that you obviously don't love me. You didn't even call me up when you got back home. Michael was puffing on his cigarette, and some burning ashes fell on Kay's bare back. She flinched a little. Stop torturing me. I won't talk. Michael didn't laugh. His voice sounded absent-minded. You know, when I came home, I wasn't that glad when I saw my family, my father, my mother, my sister Connie, and, and Tom. It was nice, but I didn't really give a damn. Then I came home tonight, and I saw you in the kitchen, and I was glad. Is that what you mean by love? That's close enough for me. They made love again for a while. Michael was more tender this time, and then he went out to get them both a drink. When he came back, he sat on an armchair, facing the bed. Let's get serious. How do you feel about marrying me? Kay smiled at him and motioned him into the bed. Michael smiled back at her. Be serious. I can't tell you about anything that happened. I'm working for my father now. I'm being trained to take over the family olive oil business. But you know my family has enemies. My father has enemies. You might be a very young widow. There's a chance, not much of one, but it could happen. And I won't be telling you what happened at the office every day. I won't be telling you anything about my business. You'll be my wife, but you won't be my partner in life, as I think they say. Not an equal partner. That can't be. Kay sat up in bed. She switched on a huge lamp standing on the night table, and then she lit a cigarette. She leaned back on the pillows. You're telling me you're a gangster, isn't that it? You're telling me that you're responsible for people being killed and other sundry crimes related to murder. And that I'm not ever to ask about that part of your life, not even to think about it. Just like in the horror movies when the monster asked the beautiful girl to marry him. Michael grinned, the cracked part of his face turned toward her. And Kay said, in contrition, Oh, Mike, I don't even notice that stupid thing. I swear I don't. I know. I like having it now, except that it makes the snot trip out of my nose. You said be serious. If we get married, what kind of a life am I supposed to lead? Like your mother? Like an Italian housewife with just the kids and home to take care of? And what about if something happens? I suppose you could wind up in jail someday. No, that's not possible. Killed, yes. Jail, no. Kay laughed at this confidence. It was a laugh that had a funny mixture of pride with its amusement. But how can you say that? Really? Michael sighed. These are all the things I can't talk to you about. I don't want to talk to you about. Kay was silent for a long time. Why do you want me to marry you after never calling me all these months? Am I so good in bed? Michael nodded gravely. Sure. But I'm getting it for nothing, so why should I marry you for that? Look, I don't want an answer now. We're going to keep seeing each other. You can talk it over with your parents. I hear your father's a real tough guy in his own way. Listen to his advice. You haven't answered why. Why you want to marry me. Michael took a white handkerchief from the drawer of the night table and held it to his nose. He blew into it and then wiped. And that's the best reason for not marrying me. How would that be, having a guy around who always has to blow his nose? Come on, be serious. I asked you a question. Michael held the handkerchief in his hand. Okay, this one time. You're the only person I felt any affection for that I care about. I didn't call you because it never occurred to me that you'd still be interested in me after everything that's happened. Sure, I could have chased you. I could have conned you. But I didn't want to do that. 
Now here's something I'll trust you with, and I don't want you to repeat it even to your father. If everything goes right, the Corleone family will be completely legitimate in about five years. Some very tricky things have to be done to make that possible. That's when you may become a wealthy widow. Now what do I want you for? Well, because I want you, and I want a family. I want kids. It's time. And I don't want those kids to be influenced by me the way I was influenced by my father. I don't mean my father deliberately influenced me. He never did. He never even wanted me in the family business. He wanted me to become a professor or a doctor, something like that. But things went bad, and I had to fight for my family. I had to fight because I love and admire my father. I never knew a man more worthy of respect. He was a good husband and a good father and a good friend to people who are not so fortunate in life. There's another side to him, but that's not relevant to me as his son. Anyway, I don't want that to happen to my kids. I want them to be influenced by you. I want them to grow up to be all-American kids, real all-American, the whole works. Maybe they or their grandchildren will go into politics. Michael grinned. Maybe one of them will be president of the United States. Why the hell not? In my history course at Dartmouth, we did some background on all the presidents, and they had fathers and grandfathers who were lucky they didn't get hanged. But I'll settle for my kids being doctors or musicians or teachers. They'll never be in the family business. By the time they're that old, I'll be retired anyway. And you and I will be part of some country club crowd. The good, simple life of well-to-do Americans. How does that strike you for a proposition? Marvelous. But you sort of skipped over the widow part. There's not much chance of that. I just mentioned it to give you a fair presentation. Michael patted his nose with a handkerchief. I can't believe it. I can't believe you're a man like that. You're just not. Her face had a bewildered look. I just don't understand the whole thing, how it could possibly be. Well, I'm not giving any more explanations. You know, you don't have to think about any of this stuff. It has nothing to do with you, really, or with our life together if we get married. Kay shook her head. How can you want to marry me? How can you hint that you love me? You never say the word, but you just now said you loved your father. You never said you loved me. How could you, if you distrust me so much, you can't tell me about the most important things in your life? How can you want to have a wife you can't trust? Your father trusts your mother, I know that. Sure, but that doesn't mean he tells her everything. And you know, he has reason to trust her, not because they got married and she's his wife, but she bore him four children in times when it was not that safe to bear children. She nursed and guarded him when people shot him. She believed in him. He was always her first loyalty for forty years. After you do that, maybe I'll tell you a few things you really don't want to hear. Will we have to live in the mall? Michael nodded. We'll have our own house. It won't be so bad. My parents don't meddle. Our lives will be our own. But until everything gets straightened out, I have to live in the mall. Because it's dangerous for you to live outside it. For the first time since she had come to know him, she saw Michael angry. It was cold, chilling anger that was not externalized in any gesture or change in voice. It was a coldness that came off him like death. And Kay knew that it was this coldness that would make her decide not to marry him, if she so decided. The trouble is all that damn trash in the movies and the newspapers. You've got the wrong idea of my father and the Corleone family. I'll make a final explanation, and this one will be really final. My father is a businessman trying to provide for his wife and children, and those friends he might need someday in a time of trouble. He doesn't accept the rules of the society we live in, because those rules would have condemned him to a life not suitable to a man like himself, a man of extraordinary force and character. What you have to understand is that he considers himself the equal of all those great men like presidents and prime ministers and supreme court justices and governors of the states. He refuses to accept their will over his own. He refuses to live by rules set up by others, rules which condemn him to a defeated life. His ultimate aim is to enter that society with a certain power, since society doesn't really protect its members who do not have their own individual power. In the meantime, he operates on a code of ethics he considers far superior to the legal structures of society. Kay was looking at him incredulously. But that's ridiculous. What if everybody felt the same way? How could society ever function? We'd be back in the times of the cavemen. Mike, you don't believe what you're saying, do you? Michael grinned at her. I'm just telling you what my father believes. I just want you to understand that whatever else he is, he's not irresponsible or at least not in the society which he has created. He's not a crazy machine-gunning mobster, as you seem to think. He's a responsible man in his own way. And what do you believe? Michael shrugged. I believe in my family. 
I believe in you and the family we may have. I don't trust society to protect us. I have no intention of placing my fate in the hands of men whose only qualification is that they manage to con a block of people to vote for them. But that's for now. My father's time is done. The things he did can no longer be done except with a great deal of risk. Whether we like it or not, the Corleone family has to join that society. But when they do, I'd like us to join it with plenty of our own power, that is, money and ownership of other valuables. I'd like to make my children as secure as possible before they join that general destiny. But you volunteered to fight for your country. You were a war hero. What happened to make you change? This is really getting us no place. But maybe I'm just one of those real old-fashioned conservatives that grow up in your hometown. I take care of myself, individual. Governments really don't do much for their people. That's what it comes down to. But that's not it, really. All I can say... I have to help my father. I have to be on his side. And you have to make your decision about being on my side. He smiled at her. I guess getting married was a bad idea. Kay patted the bed. I don't know about marrying, but I've gone without a man for two years, and I'm not letting you off so easy now. Come on in here. When they were in bed together, the light out, she whispered to him. Do you believe me about not having a man since you left? I believe you. Did you? Yes. He felt her stiffen a little. But not in the last six months. It was true. Kay was the first woman he had made love to since the death of Apollonia. Chapter 26 The garish suite overlooked the fake fairyland grounds in the rear of the hotel. Transplanted palm trees lit up by climbers of orange lights. Two huge swimming pools shimmering dark blue by the light of the desert stars. On the horizon were the sand and stone mountains that ringed Las Vegas, nestling in its neon valley. Johnny Fontaine let the heavy, richly embroidered gray drape fall and turned back to the room. A special detail of four men, a pit boss, a dealer, extra relief man, and a cocktail waitress in her scanty nightclub costume were getting things ready for private action. Nino Valenti was lying on the sofa in the living room part of the suite, a water glass of whiskey in his hand. He watched the people from the casino setting up the blackjack table with the proper six padded chairs around its horseshoe outer rim. He said in a slurred voice that was not quite drunken, That's great, that's great. Johnny, come on and gamble with me against these bastards. I got the luck. We'll beat their crullers in. Johnny sat on a footstool opposite the couch. You know I don't gamble. How you feeling, Nino? Nino Valenti grinned at him. Great. I got broads coming up at midnight, then some supper, then back to the blackjack table. You know, I got the house beat for almost 50 grand, and they've been grinding me for a week. Yeah. Who do you want to leave it to when you croak? Nino drained his glass empty. Johnny, where the hell do you get your rep as a swinger? You're a deadhead, Johnny. Christ, the tourists in this town have more fun than you do. Yeah. You want to lift to that blackjack table? Nino struggled erect on the sofa and planted his feet firmly on the rug. I can make it. He let the glass slip to the floor and got up and walked quite steadily to where the blackjack table had been set up. The dealer was ready. The pit boss stood behind the dealer, watching. The relief dealer sat on a chair away from the table. The cocktail waitress sat on another chair in a line of vision so that she could see any of Nino Valenti's gestures. Nino rapped on the green bays with his knuckles. Chips. The pit boss took a pad from his pocket and filled out a slip and put it in front of Nino with a small fountain pen. Here you are, Mr. Valenti. The usual 5,000 to start. Nino scrawled his signature on the bottom of the slip, and the pit boss put it in his pocket. He nodded to the dealer. The dealer, with incredibly deft fingers, took stacks of black and gold $100 chips from the built-in racks before him. In not more than five seconds, Nino had five even stacks of $100 chips before him. Each stack had ten chips. There were six squares, a little larger than playing card shapes, etched in white on the green bays, each square placed to correspond to where a player would sit. Now, Nino was placing bets on three of these squares, single chips, and so playing three hands each for $100. He refused to take a hit on all three hands because the dealer had a six-up, a bust card, and the dealer did bust. Nino raked in his chips and turned to Johnny Fontaine. That's how to start the night, huh, Johnny? Johnny smiled. It was unusual for a gambler like Nino to have to sign a chit while gambling. A word was usually good enough for the high rollers. Maybe they were afraid Nino wouldn't remember his takeout because of his drinking. They didn't know that Nino remembered everything. 
Nino kept winning, and after the third round, lifted a finger at the cocktail waitress. She went to the bar at the end of the room and brought him his usual rye in a water glass. Nino took the drink, switched it to his other hand so he could put an arm around the waitress. Sit with me, honey. Play a few hands. Bring me luck. The cocktail waitress was a very beautiful girl, but Johnny could see she was all cold hustle, no real personality, though she worked at it. She was giving Nino a big smile, but her tongue was hanging out for one of those black and gold chips. What the hell, Johnny thought. Why shouldn't she get some of it? He just regretted that Nino wasn't getting something better for his money. Nino let the waitress play his hands for a few rounds and then gave her one of the chips and a pat on the behind to send her away from the table. Johnny motioned to her to bring him a drink. She did so, but she did it as if she were playing the most dramatic moment in the most dramatic movie ever made. She turned all her charm on the great Johnny Fontaine. She made her eyes sparkle with invitation. Her walk was the sexiest walk ever walked. Her mouth was very slightly parted, as if she were ready to bite the nearest object of her obvious passion. She resembled nothing so much as a female animal in heat, but it was a deliberate act. Johnny Fontaine thought, Ah, Christ, one of them. It was the most popular approach of women who wanted to take him to bed. It only worked when he was very drunk, and he wasn't drunk now. He gave the girl one of his famous grins. Thank you, honey. The girl looked at him and parted her lips in a thank-you smile. Her eyes went all smoky, her body tensed with a torso leaning slightly back from the long, tapering legs in their mesh stockings. An enormous tension seemed to be building up in her body. Her breasts seemed to grow fuller and swell burstingly against her thin, scantily cut blouse. Then her whole body gave a slight quiver that almost let off a sexual twang. The whole impression was one of a woman having an orgasm simply because Johnny Fontaine had smiled at her and said, Thank you, honey. It was very well done. It was done better than Johnny had ever seen it done before, but by now he knew it was fake, and the odds were always good that the broads who did it were a lousy lay. He watched her go back to her chair and nursed his drink slowly. He didn't want to see that little trick again. He wasn't in the mood for it tonight. It was an hour before Nino Valenti began to go. He started leaning first, wavered back, then plunged off the chair straight to the floor. But the pit boss and the relief dealer had been alerted by the first weave and caught him before he hit the ground. They lifted him and carried him through the parted drapes that led to the bedroom of the suite. Johnny kept watching as the cocktail waitress helped the other two men undress Nino and shove him under the bed covers. The pit boss was counting Nino's chips and making a note on his pad of chits, then guarding the table with its dealer's chips. Johnny said to him, How long has that been going on? The pit boss shrugged. He went early tonight. The first time we got the house dock and he fixed Mr. Valenti up with something and gave him some sort of a lecture. Then Nino told us that we shouldn't call the dock when that happened. Just put him to bed and he'd be okay in the morning. So that's what we do. He's pretty lucky. He was a winner again tonight. Almost three grand. Well, let's get the house dock up here tonight, okay? Page the casino floor if you have to. It was almost 15 minutes before Jules Siegel came into the suite. Johnny noted with irritation that this guy never looked like a doctor. Tonight he was wearing a blue, loose-knit polo shirt with white trim, some sort of white suede shoes and no socks. He looked funny as hell carrying the traditional black doctor's bag. Johnny said, You ought to figure out a way to carry your stuff in a cut-down golf bag. Jules grinned understandingly. Yeah, this medical school carry-all is a real drag. Scares the hell out of people. They should change the color anyway. He went over to where Nino was lying in bed. As he opened his bag, he said to Johnny, Thanks for that check you sent me as a consultant. It was excessive. I didn't do that much. Like hell you didn't. Anyway, forget that. That was a long time ago. What's with Nino? Jules was making a quick examination of heartbeat, pulse, and blood pressure. He took a needle out of his bag and shoved it casually into Nino's arm and pressed the plunger. Nino's sleeping face lost its waxy paleness. Color came into the cheeks, as if the blood had started pumping faster. Very simple diagnosis. I had a chance to examine him and run some tests when he first came here and fainted. I had him moved to the hospital before he regained consciousness. He's got diabetes, mild adult stabile, which is no problem if you take care of it with medication and diet and so forth. He insists on ignoring it. Also, he is firmly determined to drink himself to death. His liver is going, and his brain will go. Right now he's in a mild diabetic coma. My advice is to have him put away. Johnny felt a sense of relief. It couldn't be too serious. All Nino had to do was take care of himself. You mean in one of those joints where they dry you out? Jules went over to the bar in the far corner of the room and made himself a drink. No, I mean committed. You know, the crazy house. Don't be funny. I'm not joking. I'm not up on all the psychiatric jazz, but I know something about it, part of my trade. Your friend Nino, 
can be put back into fairly good shape, unless the liver damage has gone too far, which we can't know until an autopsy, really. But the real disease is in his head. In essence, he doesn't care if he dies. Maybe he even wants to kill himself. Until that is cured, there's no hope for him. That's why I say have him committed, and then he can undergo the necessary psychiatric treatment. There was a knock on the door, and Johnny went to answer it. It was Lucy Mancini. She came into Johnny's arms and kissed him. Oh, Johnny, it's so good to see you. It's been a long time. He noticed that Lucy had changed. She had gotten much slimmer, her clothes were a hell of a lot better, and she wore them better. Her hairstyle fitted her face in a sort of boyish cut. She looked younger and better than he had ever seen her, and the thought crossed his mind that she could keep him company here in Vegas. It would be a pleasure hanging out with a real broad. But before he could turn on the charm, he remembered she was the doc's girl. So it was out. He made his smile just friendly and said, What are you doing coming to Nino's apartment at night, eh? She punched him in the shoulder. I heard Nino was sick and the jewels came up. I just wanted to see if I could help. Nino's okay, isn't he? Sure, he'll be fine. Jules Siegel had sprawled out on the couch. Like hell he is. I suggest we all sit here and wait for Nino to come too. And then we all talk him into committing himself. Lucy, he likes you. Maybe you can help. Johnny, if you're a real friend of his, you'll go along. Otherwise, old Nino's liver will shortly be Exhibit A in some university medical lab. Johnny was offended by the doctor's flippant attitude. Who the hell did he think he was? He started to say so, but Nino's voice came from the bed. Hey, old buddy, how about a drink? Nino was sitting up in bed. He grinned at Lucy. Hey, baby, come to old Nino. He held his arms wide open. Lucy sat on the edge of the bed and gave him a hug. Oddly enough, Nino didn't look bad at all now, almost normal. Nino snapped his fingers. Come on, Johnny, give me a drink. The night's young yet. Where the hell's my blackjack table? Jules took a long slug from his own glass and said to Nino, You can't have a drink. Your doctor forbids it. Nino scowled. Screw my doctor. Then a play-acting look of contrition came on his face. Hey, Julie, that's you. You're my doctor, right? I don't mean you, old buddy. Jules took a long slug from his own glass and said to Nino, You can't have a drink. Your doctor forbids it. Nino scowled. Screw my doctor. Then, a play-acting look of contrition came on his face. Hey, Julie, that's you. You're my doctor, right? I don't mean you, old buddy. Johnny, get me a drink or I get up out of bed and get it myself. Johnny shrugged and moved toward the bar. Jules said indifferently, I'm saying he shouldn't have it. Johnny knew why Jules irritated him. The doctor's voice was always cool. The words never stressed, no matter how dire. The voice always low and controlled. If he gave a warning, the warning was in the words alone. The voice itself was neutral, as if uncaring. It was this that made Johnny sore enough to bring Nino his water glass of whiskey. Before he handed it over, he said to Jules, This won't kill him, right? No, it won't kill him. Lucy gave him an anxious glance, started to say something, then kept still. Meanwhile, Nino had taken the whiskey and poured it down his throat. Johnny was smiling down at Nino. They had shown the punk doctor. Suddenly, Nino gasped. His face seemed to turn blue. He couldn't catch his breath and was choking for air. His body leapt upward like a fish. His face was gorged with blood, his eyes bulging. Jules appeared on the other side of the bed, facing Johnny and Lucy. He took Nino by the neck and held him still and plunged the needle into the shoulder, near where it joined the neck. Nino went limp in his hands. The heaves of his body subsided, and after a moment, he slumped down back into his pillow. His eyes closed in sleep. Johnny, Lucy, and Jules went back into the living room part of the suite and sat around the huge, solid coffee table. Lucy picked up one of the aqua marine phones and ordered coffee and some food to be sent up. Johnny had gone over to the bar and mixed himself a drink. Did you know he would have that reaction from the whiskey? Jules shrugged. I was pretty sure he would. Then why didn't you warn me? I warned you. You didn't warn me right. You are really one hell of a doctor. You don't give a shit. You tell me to get Nino in a crazy house. You don't bother to use a nice word like sanatorium. You really like to stick it to people, right? Lucy was staring down in her lap. Jules kept smiling at Fontaine. Nothing was going to stop you from giving Nino that drink. You had to show you didn't have to accept my warnings, my orders. Remember when you offered me a job as your personal physician after that throat business? I turned you down because I knew we could never get along. A doctor thinks he's God. He's the high priest in modern society. That's one of his rewards. But you would never treat me that way. I'd be a flunky God to you, like those doctors you guys have in Hollywood. 
Where do you get those people from, anyway? Christ, don't they know anything? Or don't they just care? They must know what's happening to Nino. But they just give him all kinds of drugs to keep him going. They wear those silk suits and they kiss your ass because you're a power movie man, and so you think they are great doctors. Showbiz, docs, you gotta have heart, right? But they don't give a fuck if you live or die. Well, my little hobby, unforgivable as it is, is to keep people alive. I let you give Nino that drink to show you what could happen to him. Jules leaned toward Johnny Fontaine, his voice still calm, unemotional. Your friend is almost terminal. Do you understand that? He hasn't got a chance without therapy and strict medical care. His blood pressure and diabetes and bad habits can cause a cerebral hemorrhage in this very next instant. His brain will blow itself apart. Is that vivid enough for you? Sure, I said crazy house. I want you to understand what's needed, or you won't make a move. I'll put it to you straight. You can save your buddy's life by having him committed. Otherwise, kiss him goodbye. Jules, darling, Jules, don't be so tough. Just tell him. Jules stood up. His usual cool was gone. Johnny Fontaine noticed with satisfaction. His voice, too, had lost its quiet, unaccented monotone. Do you think this is the first time I've had to talk to people like you in a situation like this? I did it every day. Lucy says don't be so tough, but she doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, I used to tell people, don't eat so much or you'll die. Don't smoke so much or you'll die. Don't work so much or you'll die. Don't drink so much or you'll die. Nobody listens. You know why? Because I don't say you will die tomorrow. Well, I can tell you that Nino may very well die tomorrow. Jules went over to the bar and mixed himself another drink. How about it, Johnny? Are you going to get Nino committed? I don't know. Jules took a quick drink at the bar and filled his glass again. You know, it's a funny thing. You can smoke yourself to death, drink yourself to death, work yourself to death, and even eat yourself to death. But that's all acceptable. The only thing you can't do medically is screw yourself to death, and yet that's where they put all the obstacles. He paused to finish his drink. But even that's trouble, for women anyway. I used to have women who weren't supposed to have any more babies. It's dangerous, I'd tell them. You could die, I'd tell them. And a month later, they pop in, their faces all rosy, and say, Doctor, I think I'm pregnant. And sure enough, they'd kill the rabbit. But it's dangerous, I'd tell them. My voice used to have expression in those days. And they'd smile at me and say, But my husband and I are very strict Catholic, they'd say. There was a knock on the door, and two waiters wheeled in a cart covered with food and silver service coffee pods. They took a portable table from the bottom of the cart and set it up. Then Johnny dismissed them. They sat at the table and ate the hot sandwiches Lucy had ordered and drank the coffee. Johnny leaned back and lit up a cigarette. So you save lives. How come you became an abortionist? Lucy spoke for the first time. He wanted to help girls in trouble. Girls who might commit suicide or do something dangerous to get rid of the baby. Jewel smiled at her and sighed. It's not that simple. I became a surgeon, finally. I've got the good hands, as ballplayers say. But I was so good, I scared myself silly. I'd open up some poor bastard's belly and know he was going to die. I'd operate and know that the cancer or tumor would come back. But I'd send them off home with a smile and a lot of bullshit. Some poor broad comes in and I slice off one tit. A year later, she's back and I slice off the other tit. A year after that, I scoop out her insides like you scoop the seeds out of a cantaloupe. After all that, she dies anyway. Meanwhile, husbands keep calling up and asking, What do the tests show? What do the tests show? So I hired an extra secretary to take all those calls. I saw the patient only when she was fully prepared for examination, tests, or operation. I spent the minimum possible time with the victim, because I was, after all, a busy man. And then finally... I'd let the husband talk to me for two minutes. It's terminal, I'd say. And they could never hear that last word. They understood what it meant, but they never heard it. I thought at first that unconsciously I was dropping my voice on the last word, so I consciously said it louder. But still, they never heard it. One guy even said, What the hell do you mean it's germinal? Jules started to laugh. Germinal, terminal, what the hell? I started to do abortions. Nice and easy. Everybody happy, like washing the dishes and leaving a clean sink. That was my class. I loved it. I loved being an abortionist. I don't believe that a two-month fetus is a human being, so no problems there. I was helping young girls and married women who were in trouble. I was making good money. I was out of the front lines. 
When I got caught, I felt like a deserter that has been hauled in. But I was lucky. A friend pulled some strings and got me off, but now the big hospitals won't let me operate. So, here I am, giving good advice again, which is being ignored, just like in the old days. I'm not ignoring it. I'm thinking it over. Lucy finally changed the subject. What are you doing in Vegas, Johnny? Relaxing from your duties as big-time Hollywood wheel or working? Johnny shook his head. Mike Corleone wants to see me and have a talk. He's flying in tonight with Tom Hagen. Tom said they'll be seeing you, Lucy. You know what it's all about? Lucy shook her head. We're all having dinner together tomorrow night. Freddy, too. I think it might have something to do with the hotel. The casino has been dropping money lately, which shouldn't be. The Don might want Mike to check it out. I hear Mike finally got his face fixed. Lucy laughed. I guess Kay talked him into it. He wouldn't do it when they were married. I wonder why. It looked so awful and made his nose drip. He should have had it done sooner. She paused for a moment. Jules was called in by the Corleone family for that operation. They used him as a consultant and an observer. Johnny nodded. I recommended him for it. Oh. Anyway, Mike said he wanted to do something for Jules. That's why he's having us to dinner tomorrow night. Jules said musingly, He didn't trust anybody. He warned me to keep track of what everybody did. It was fairly straight, ordinary surgery. Any competent man could do it. There was a sound from the bedroom of the suite, and they looked toward the drapes. Nino had become conscious again. Johnny went and sat on the bed. Jules and Lucy went over to the foot of the bed. Nino gave them a wan grin. Okay, I'll stop being a wise guy. I feel really lousy. Johnny, remember about a year ago? What happened when we were with those two broads down in Palm Springs? I swear to you, I wasn't jealous about what happened. I was glad. You believe me, Johnny. Sure, Nino. I believe you. Lucy and Jules looked at each other. From everything they had heard and knew about Johnny Fontaine, it seemed impossible that he would take a girl away from a close friend like Nino. And why was Nino saying he wasn't jealous a year after it happened? The same thought crossed both their minds, that Nino was drinking himself to death romantically because a girl had left him to go with Johnny Fontaine. Jules checked Nino again. I'll get a nurse to be in the room with you tonight. You really have to stay in bed for a couple of days. No kidding. Nino smiled. Okay, Doc, just don't make the nurse too pretty. Jules made a call for the nurse, and then he and Lucy left. Johnny sat in a chair near the bed to wait for the nurse. Nino was falling asleep again, an exhausted look on his face. Johnny thought about what he had said about not being jealous about what had happened over a year ago with those two broads down in Palm Springs. The thought had never entered his head that Nino might be jealous. A year ago, Johnny Fontaine had sat in his plush office, the office of a movie company he headed, and felt so lousy as he had ever felt in his life, which was surprising, because the first movie he had produced, with himself as star, and Nino in a featured part, was making tons of money. Everything had worked. Everybody had done their job. The picture was brought in under budget, everybody was going to make a fortune out of it, and Jack Waltz was losing ten years of his life. Now, Johnny had two more pictures in production, one starring himself, one starring Nino, Nino was great on the screen as one of those charming, dopey lover boys that women love to shove between their tits. Little boy lost. Everything he touched made money. It was rolling in. The godfather was getting his percentage through the bank, and that made Johnny feel really good. He had justified his godfather's faith. But today, that wasn't helping much. And now that he was a successful independent movie producer, he had as much power, maybe more, than he had ever had as a singer. Beautiful broads fell all over him, just like before, though for a more commercial reason. He had his own plane, he lived more lavishly even, with the special tax benefits a businessman had that artists didn't get. Then, what the hell was bothering him? He knew what it was. The front of his head hurt, his nasal passages hurt, his throat itched. The only way he could scratch and relieve that itch was by singing, and he was afraid to even try. He had called Jules Siegel about it when it would be safe to try to sing, and Jules had said, any time he felt like it. So he'd tried, and sounded so hoarse and lousy he'd given up, and his throat would hurt like hell the next day, hurt in a different way than before the warts had been taken off, hurt worse, burning. He was afraid to keep singing, afraid that he'd lose his voice forever or ruin it. And if he couldn't sing, what the hell was the use of everything else? Everything else was just bullshit. Singing was the only thing he really knew. Maybe he knew more about singing and his kind of music than anybody else in the world. 
He was that good, he realized now. All those years had made him a real pro. Nobody could tell him the right and the wrong. He didn't have to ask anybody. He knew. What a waste. What a damn waste. It was a Friday, and he decided to spend the weekend with Virginia and the kids. He called her up, as he always did, to tell her he was coming. Really, to give her a chance to say no. She never said no. Not in all the years they had been divorced, because she would never say no to a meeting of her daughters and their father. What a broad, Johnny thought. He'd been lucky with Virginia, and though he knew he cared more about her than any other woman he knew, it was impossible for them ever to live together sexually. Maybe when they were 65, like when you retire, they'd retire together, retire from everything. But reality shattered these thoughts when he arrived there and found Virginia was feeling a little grouchy herself and the two girls not that crazy to see him because they had been promised a weekend visit with some girlfriends on a California ranch where they could ride horses. He told Virginia to send the girls off to the ranch and kiss them goodbye with an amused smile. He understood them so well. What kid wouldn't rather go riding horses on a ranch than hang around with a grouchy father who picked his own spots as a father? He said to Virginia, I'll have a few drinks, and then I'll shove off, too. All right. She was having one of her bad days, rare but recognizable. It wasn't too easy for her, leading this kind of life. She saw him taking an extra-large drink. What are you cheering yourself up for? Everything is going so beautifully for you. I never dreamed you had it in you to be such a good businessman. Johnny smiled at her. It's not so hard. At the same time, he was thinking... So that's what was wrong. He understood women, and he understood now that Virginia was down because she thought he was having everything his own way. Women really hated seeing their men doing too well. It irritated them. It made them less sure of the hold they exerted over them through affection, sexual custom, or marriage ties. So, more to cheer her up than voice his own complaints, Johnny said, What the hell difference does it make if I can't sing? Oh, Johnny, you're not a kid anymore. You're over 35. Why do you keep worrying about that silly singing stuff? You make more money as a producer anyhow. Johnny looked at her curiously. I'm a singer. I love to sing. What's being old got to do with that? Virginia was impatient. I never liked your singing anyway. Now that you've shown you can make movies, I'm glad you can't sing anymore. They were both surprised when Johnny said with fury, That's a fucking lousy thing to say. He was shaken. How could Virginia feel like that? How could she dislike him so much? Virginia smiled at his being hurt, and because it was so outrageous that he should be angry at her, she said, How do you think I felt when all those girls came running after you because of the way you sang? How would you feel if I went ass naked down the street to get men running after me? That's what your singing was, and I used to wish you'd lose your voice and could never sing again. But that was before we got divorced. Johnny finished his drink. You don't understand a thing. Not a damn thing. He went into the kitchen and dialed Nino's number. He quickly arranged for them both to go down to Palm Springs for the weekend and gave Nino the number of a girl to call, a real fresh young beauty he'd been meaning to get around to. She'll have a friend for you. I'll be at your place in an hour. Virginia gave him a cool goodbye when he left. He didn't give a damn. It was one of the few times he was angry with her. The hell with it. He'd just tear loose for the weekend and get all the poison out of his system. Sure enough, everything was fine down in Palm Springs. Johnny used his own house down there, was always kept open and staffed this time of the year. The two girls were young enough to be great fun and not too rapacious for some kind of favor. Some people came over to keep them company at the pool until supper time. Nino went to his room with his girl to get ready for supper and a quick bang while he was still warm from the sun. Johnny wasn't in the mood, so he sent his girl, a short, fan box blonde named Tina, up to shower by herself. He never could make love to another woman after he'd had a fight with Virginia. He went into the glass-walled patio living room that held a piano. When singing with the band, he'd fool around with a piano just for laughs so he could pick out a song in a fake, moonlight, soft ballad style. He sat down now and hummed along a little bit with the piano, very softly, muttering a few words but not really singing. Before he knew it, Tina was in the living room making him a drink and sitting beside him at the piano. He played a few tunes and she hummed with him. He left her at the piano and went up to take his shower. In the shower, he sang short phrases, more like speaking. He got dressed and went back down. Tina was still alone. Nino was really working his girl over or getting drunk. Johnny sat down at the piano again while Tina wandered off outside to watch the pool. He started singing one of his old songs. There was no burning in his throat. 
The tones were coming out muted, but with proper body. He looked at the patio. Tina was still out there. The glass door was closed. She wouldn't hear him. For some reason, he didn't want anybody to hear him. He started off fresh on an old ballad that was his favorite. He sang full out, as if he were singing in public, letting himself go, waiting for the familiar burning rasp in his throat. But there was none. He listened to his voice. It was different, somehow, but he liked it. It was darker. It was a man's voice, not a kid's. Rich, he thought, dark rich. He finished the song, easing up, and sat there at the piano thinking about it. Behind him, Nino said, Not bad, old buddy, not bad at all. Johnny swiveled his body around. Nino was standing in the doorway alone. His girl wasn't with him. Johnny was relieved. He didn't mind Nino hearing him. Yeah, let's get rid of those two broads. Send them home. You send them home. They're nice kids. I'm not going to hurt their feelings. Besides, I just banged mine twice. How would it look if I sent her away without even giving her dinner? The hell with it, Johnny thought. Let the girls listen, even if he sounded lousy. He called up a band leader he knew in Palm Springs and asked him to send over a mandolin for Nino. The band leader protested. Hell, nobody plays a mandolin in California. Johnny yelled, just get one. The house was loaded with recording equipment, and Johnny had the two girls work the turnoff in volumes. After they had dinner, Johnny went to work. He had Nino playing the mandolin as accompaniment and sang all his old songs. He sang them all the way out, not nursing his voice at all. His throat was fine. He felt that he could sing forever. In the months he had not been able to sing, he had often thought about singing, planned out how he would phrase lyrics differently now than as a kid. He had sung the songs in his head with more sophisticated variations of emphasis. Now he was doing it for real. Sometimes it would go wrong in the actual singing. Stuff that had sounded good when he heard it just in his head didn't work out when he tried it really singing out loud. Out loud, he thought. He wasn't listening to himself now. He was concentrating on performing. He fumbled a little on timing, but that was okay, just rusty. He had a metronome in his head that would never fail him. Just a little practice was all he needed. Finally, he stopped singing. Tina came over to him with eyes shining and gave him a long kiss. Now I know why Mother goes to all your movies. It was the wrong thing to say at any time except this. Johnny and Nino laughed. They played the feedback, and now Johnny could really listen to himself. His voice had changed, changed a hell of a lot, but was still, unquestionably, the voice of Johnny Fontaine. It had become much richer and darker, as he had noticed before, but there was also the quality of a man singing rather than a boy. The voice had more true emotion, more character, and the technical part of his singing was far superior to anything he had ever done. It was nothing less than masterful. And if he was that good now, rusty as hell, how good would he be when he got in shape again? Johnny grinned at Nino. Is that as good as I think it is? Nino looked at his happy face thoughtfully. It's very damn good, but let's see how you sing tomorrow. Johnny was hurt that Nino should be so downbeat. You son of a bitch. You know you can't sing like that. Don't worry about tomorrow. I feel great. But he didn't sing anymore that night. He and Nino took the girls to a party, and Tina spent the night in his bed... But he wasn't much good there. The girl was a little disappointed, but what the hell, you couldn't do everything all in one day, Johnny thought. He woke up in the morning with a sense of apprehension, with a vague terror that he had dreamed his voice had come back. Then, when he was sure it was not a dream, he got scared that his voice would be shot again. He went to the window and hummed a bit. Then he went down to the living room, still in his pajamas. He picked out a tune on the piano, and after a while tried singing with it. He sang mutedly, but there was no pain, no hoarseness in his throat. So he turned it on. The chords were true and rich. He didn't have to force it at all. Easy, easy, just pouring out. Johnny realized that the bad time was over. He had it all now. And it didn't matter a damn if he fell on his face with movies. It didn't matter if he couldn't get it up with Tina the night before. It didn't matter that Virginia would hate him being able to sing again. For a moment, he had just one regret. If only his voice had come back to him while trying to sing for his daughters. How lovely that would have been. That would have been so lovely. The hotel nurse had come into the room wheeling a cart loaded with medication. Johnny got up and stared down at Nino, who was sleeping, or maybe dying. He knew Nino wasn't jealous of his getting his voice back. He understood that Nino was only jealous because he was so happy about getting his voice back that he cared so much about singing. For what was very obvious now was that Nino Valenti 
didn't care enough about anything to make him want to stay alive. Chapter 27 Michael Corleone arrived late in the evening and by his own order was not met at the airport. Only two men accompanied him, Tom Hagen and a new bodyguard named Albert Neri. The most lavish suite of rooms in the hotel had been set aside for Michael and his party. Already waiting in that suite were the people it would be necessary for Michael to see. Freddy greeted his brother with a warm embrace. Freddy was much stouter, more benevolent looking, cheerful, and far more dandified. He wore an exquisitely tailored gray silk suit and accessories to match. His hair was razor cut and arranged as carefully as a movie star's. His face glowed with perfect barbering and his hands were manicured. He was an altogether different man than the one who had been shipped out of New York four years before. He leaned back and surveyed Michael fondly. You look a hell of a lot better now that you got your face fixed. Your wife finally talked you into it, huh? How is Kay? When's she gonna come out and visit us out here? Michael smiled at his brother. You're looking pretty good, too. Kay would have come out this time, but she's carrying another kid, and she has the baby to look after. Besides, this is business, Freddy. I have to fly back tomorrow night or the morning after. You have to eat something first. We've got a great chef in the hotel. You'll get the best food you ever ate. Go take your shower and change, and everything will be set up right here. I have all the people you want to see lined up. They'll be waiting around when you're ready. I just have to call them. Let's save Mo Green to the end, okay? Ask Johnny Fontaine and Nino up to eat with us. And Lucy and her doctor friend. We can talk while we eat. He turned to Hagen. Anybody you want to add to that, Tom? Hagen shook his head. Freddy had greeted him much less affectionately than Michael, but Hagen understood. Freddy was on his father's shit list, and Freddy naturally blamed the consigliere for not straightening things out. Hagen would gladly have done so, but he didn't know why Freddy was in his father's bad graces. The Don did not give voice to specific grievances. He just made his displeasure felt. It was after midnight before they gathered around the special dinner table set up in Michael's suite. Lucy kissed Michael and didn't comment on his face looking so much better after the operation. Jules Siegel boldly studied the repaired cheekbone. A good job. It's knitted nicely. Is the sinus okay? Fine. Thanks for helping out. Dinner focused on Michael as they ate. They all noted his resemblance in speech and manner to the Don. In some curious way, he inspired the same respect, the same awe, and yet he was perfectly natural, at pains to put everyone at their ease. Hagen, as usual, remained in the background. The new man they did not know. Albert Neri was also very quiet and unobtrusive. He had claimed he was not hungry and sat in an armchair close to the door reading a local newspaper. After they had had a few drinks and food, the waiters were dismissed. Michael spoke to Johnny Fontaine. Hear your voices back as good as ever. You got all your old fans back? Congratulations. Thanks. He was curious about exactly why Michael wanted to see him. What favor would be asked? Michael addressed them all in general. The Corleone family is thinking of moving out here to Vegas, selling out all our interest in the olive oil business and settling here. The Don and Hagen and myself have talked it over, and we think here is where the future is for the family. That doesn't mean right now or next year. It may take two, three, even four years to get things squared away, but that's the general plan. Some friends of ours own a good percentage of this hotel and casino, so that will be our foundation. Mo Green will sell us his interests so it can be wholly owned by friends of the family. Freddy's moon face was anxious. Mike, you sure about Mo Green selling? He never mentioned it to me, and he loves the business. I really don't think he'll sell. I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. The words were said in an ordinary voice, yet the effect was chilling, perhaps because it was a favorite phrase of the Don's. Michael turned to Johnny Fontaine. The Don is counting on you to help us get started. It's been explained to us that entertainment will be the big factor in drawing gamblers. We hope you'll sign a contract to appear five times a year for maybe a week-long engagement. We hope your friends in movies do the same. You've done them a lot of favors. Now you can call them in. Sure, I'll do anything for my godfather. You know that, Mike. But there was just the faint shadow of doubt in his voice. Michael smiled. You won't lose money on the deal, and neither will your friends. You get points in the hotel. And if there's somebody else you think important enough, they get some points, too. Maybe you don't believe me. So let me say I'm speaking the Don's words. I believe you, Mike. But there's ten more hotels and casinos being built on the Strip right now. When you come in, the market may be glutted. You may be too late with all that competition already there. Tom Hagen spoke up. The Corleone family has friends who are financing three of those hotels. Johnny understood immediately that he meant the Corleone family owned the three hotels with their casinos and that there would be plenty of points to give out. I'll start working on it. Michael turned to Lucy and Jules Siegel. I owe you. 
I hear you want to go back to cutting people up, and that hospitals won't let you use their facilities because of that old abortion business. I have to know from you, is that what you want? Jules smiled. I guess so. But you don't know the medical setup. Whatever power you have doesn't mean anything to them. I'm afraid you can't help me in that. Michael nodded absentmindedly. Sure, you're right. But some friends of mine, pretty well-known people, are going to build a big hospital for Las Vegas. The town will need it the way it's growing and the way it's projected to grow. Maybe they'll let you into the operating room if it's put to them right. Hell, how many surgeons as good as you can they get to come out to this desert? Or any half as good? We'll be doing the hospital a favor, so stick around. I hear you and Lucy are going to get married. Jewel shrugged. When I see that I have any future... Mike, if you don't build that hospital, I'll die an old maid. They all laughed, all except Jules. He said to Michael, If I took a job like that, there couldn't be any strings attached. No strings. I just owe you and I want to even out. Mike, don't get sore. Michael smiled at her. I'm not sore. He turned to Jules. That was a dumb thing for you to say. The Corleone family has pulled some strings for you. Do you think I'm so stupid I'd ask you to do things you'd hate to do? But if I did, so what? Who the hell else ever lifted a finger to help you when you were in trouble? When I heard you wanted to get back to being a real surgeon, I took a lot of time to find out if I could help. I can. I'm not asking you for anything. But at least you could consider our relationship friendly. And I assume you would do for me what you do for any good friend. That's my string. But you can refuse it. Tom Hagen lowered his head and smiled. Not even the Don himself could have done it any better. Jules was flushing. Mike, I didn't mean it that way at all. I'm very grateful to you and your father. Forget I said it. Michael nodded. Fine. Until the hospital gets built and opens up, you'll be medical director for the four hotels. Get yourself a staff. Your money goes up too, but you can discuss that with Tom at a later time. And Lucy, I want you to do something more important. Maybe coordinate all the shops that will be opening up in the hotel arcades, on the financial side. Or maybe hiring the girls we need to work in the casino, something like that. So if Jules doesn't marry you, you can be a rich old maid. Freddy had been puffing on his cigar angrily. Michael turned to him. I'm just the errand boy for the Don, Freddy. What he wants you to do, he'll tell you himself, naturally. But I'm sure it'll be something big enough to make you happy. Everybody tells us what a great job you've been doing out here. Then why is he sore at me? Just because the casino's been losing money? I don't control that end. Mo Green does. What the hell does the old man want from me? Don't worry about it. He turned to Johnny Fontaine. Where's Nino? I was looking forward to seeing him again. Johnny shrugged. Nino is pretty sick. A nurse is taking care of him in his room. But the doc here says he should be committed, that he's trying to kill himself. Nino. Michael said thoughtfully, really surprised. Nino was always a real good guy. I never knew him to do anything lousy, say anything to put anybody down. He never gave a damn about anything, except the booze. Yeah. The money is rolling in, he could get a lot of work singing or in the movies. He gets fifty grand a picture now and he blows it. He doesn't give a damn about being famous. All the years we've been buddies, I've never known him to do anything creepy. And the son of a bitch is drinking himself to death. Jules was about to say something when there was a knock on the door of the suite. He was surprised when the man in the armchair, the man nearest the door, did not answer it, but kept reading the newspaper. It was Hagen who went to open it and was almost brushed aside when Mo Green came striding into the room, followed by his two bodyguards. Mo Green was a handsome hood who had made his rep as a murder incorporated executioner in Brooklyn. He had branched out into gambling and gone west to seek his fortune, had been the first person to see the possibilities of Las Vegas, and built one of the first hotel casinos on the Strip. He still had murderous tantrums and was feared by everyone in the hotel, not excluding Freddie, Lucy, and Jules Siegel. They always stayed out of his way whenever possible. His handsome face was grim now. He said to Michael Corleone, I've been waiting around to talk to you, Mike. I got a lot of things to do tomorrow, so I figured I'd catch you tonight. How about it? Michael Corleone looked at him with what seemed to be friendly astonishment. Sure. He motioned in Hagen's direction. Get Mr. Green a drink, Tom. Jules noticed that the man called Albert Neri was studying Mo Green intently, not paying any attention to the bodyguards who were leaning against the door. He knew there was no chance of any violence, not in Vegas itself. That was strictly forbidden, as fatal to the whole project of making Vegas the legal sanctuary of American gamblers. Mo Green said to his bodyguards, Draw some chips for all these people so they can gamble on a house. He obviously meant Jules, Lucy, Johnny Fontaine, and Michael's bodyguard, Albert Neri. Michael Corleone nodded agreeably. That's a good idea. 
It was only then that Neri got out of his chair and prepared to follow the others out. After the goodbyes were said, there were Freddy, Tom Hagen, Mo Green, and Michael Corleone left in the room. Green put his drink down on the table. What's this I hear the Corleone family's gonna buy me out? I'll buy you out. You don't buy me out. Your casino has been losing money against all the odds. There's something wrong with the way you operate. Maybe we can do better. Green laughed harshly. <laughs> you goddamn dagos. I do your favor and take Freddy in when you're having a bad time, and now you push me out. That's what you think. I don't get pushed out by nobody, and I got friends that'll back me up. Michael was still quietly reasonable. You took Freddy in because the Corleone family gave you a big chunk of money to finish furnishing your hotel and bankroll your casino, and because the Molinari family on the coast guaranteed his safety and gave you some service for taking him in. The Corleone family and you are evened out. I don't know what you're getting sore about. We'll buy your share at any reasonable price you name. What's wrong with that? What's unfair about that? With your casino losing money, we're doing you a favor. Green shook his head. The Corleone family don't have that much muscle anymore. The Godfather's sick. You're getting chased out of New York by the other families, and you think you can find easy pickings here. I'll give you some advice, Mike. Don't try. Is that why you thought you could slap Freddy around in public? Tom Hagen, startled, turned his attention to Freddy. Freddy Corleone's face was getting red. Ah, Mike, that wasn't anything. Mo didn't mean anything. He flies off the handle sometimes, but me and him are good friends, right, Mo? Green was wary. Yeah, sure. Sometimes I gotta kick asses to make this place run right. I got sword Freddy because he was banging all the cocktail waitresses and letting them goof off on the job. We had a little argument, and I straightened them out. Michael's face was impassive when he said to his brother, You straightened out, Freddy? Freddy stared sullenly at his younger brother. He didn't answer. Green laughed. <laughs> this son of a bitch was taking him to bed two at a time, the old sandwich job. Freddy, I gotta admit, you really put it to those broads. Nobody else could make him happy after you got through with him. Hagen saw that this had caught Michael by surprise. They looked at each other. This was perhaps the real reason the Don was displeased with Freddy. The Don was straight-laced about sex. He would consider such cavorting by his son Freddy, two girls at a time, as degeneracy. Allowing himself to be physically humiliated by a man like Mo Green would decrease respect for the Corleone family. That, too, would be part of the reason for being in his father's bad books. Michael, rising from his chair, said in a tone of dismissal, I have to get back to New York tomorrow. So think about your price. You son of a bitch. You think you can just brush me off like that? I killed more men than you before I could jerk off. I'll fly to New York and talk to the Don himself. I'll make him an offer. Tom, you're the conciliary. You can talk to the Don and advise him. It was then that Michael turned the full, chilly blast of his personality on the two Vegas men. The Don has sort of semi-retired. I'm running the family business now, and I've removed Tom from the conciliary spot. He'll be strictly my lawyer here in Vegas. He'll be moving out with his family in a couple of months to get all the legal work started. So anything you have to say, say it to me. Nobody answered. Freddy, you're my older brother. I have respect for you. But don't ever take sides with anybody against the family again. I won't even mention it to the Don. He turned to Mo Green. Don't insult people who are trying to help you. You do better to use your energy to find out why the casino is losing money. The Corleone family has big dough invested here, and we're not getting our money's worth. But I still didn't come here and abuse you. I offer a helping hand. Well, if you prefer to spit on that helping hand, that's your business. I can't say any more. He had not once raised his voice, but his words had a sobering effect on both Green and Freddy. Michael stared at both of them, moving away from the table to indicate that he expected them both to leave. Hagen went to the door and opened it. Both men left without saying goodnight. The next morning, Michael Corleone got the message from Mo Green. He would not sell his share of the hotel at any price. It was Freddy who delivered the message. Michael shrugged and said to his brother, I want to see Nino before I go back to New York. In Nino's suite, they found Johnny Fontaine sitting on the couch eating breakfast. Jules was examining Nino behind the closed drapes of the bedroom. Finally, the drapes were drawn back. Michael was shocked at how Nino looked. The man was visibly disintegrating. The eyes were dazed, the mouth loose, all the muscles of his face slack. Michael sat on his bedside. Nino, it's good to catch up with you. The Don always asks about you. Nino grinned. It was the old grin. Tell them I'm dying. Tell them show business is more dangerous than the olive oil business. You'll be okay. 
If there's anything bothering you that the family can help, just tell me. Nino shook his head. There's nothing. Nothing. Michael chatted for a few more moments and then left. Freddy accompanied him and his party to the airport, but at Michael's request didn't hang around for departure time. As they boarded the plane with Tom Hagen and Al Neri, Michael turned to Neri and said, Did you make him good? Neri tapped his forehead. I got Mo Green mugged and numbered up here. Chapter 28 On the plane ride back to New York, Michael Corleone relaxed and tried to sleep. It was useless. The most terrible period of his life was approaching, perhaps even a fatal time. It could no longer be put off. Everything was in readiness. All precautions had been taken. Two years of precautions. There could be no further delay. Last week, when the Don had formally announced his retirement to the Capo Regime and the other members of the Corleone family, Michael knew that this was his father's way of telling him the time was ripe. It was almost three years now since he had returned home, and over two years since he had married Kay. The three years had been spent in learning the family business. He had put in long hours with Tom Hagen, long hours with the Don. He was amazed at how wealthy and powerful the Corleone family truly was. It owned tremendously valuable real estate in Midtown New York, whole office buildings. It owned, through fronts, partnerships in two Wall Street brokerage houses, pieces of banks on Long Island, partnerships in some garment center firms, all this in addition to its illegal operations in gambling. The most interesting thing Michael Corleone learned in going back over past transactions of the Corleone family was that the family had received some protection income shortly after the war from a group of music record counterfeiters. The counterfeiters duplicated and sold phonograph records of famous artists, packaging everything so skillfully they were never caught. Naturally, on the records they sold to stores, the artists and original production company received not a penny. Michael Corleone noticed that Johnny Fontaine had lost a lot of money owing to this counterfeiting, because at that time, just before he lost his voice, his records were the most popular in the country. He asked Tom Hagen about it. Why did the Don allow the counterfeiters to cheat his godson? Hagen shrugged. Business was business. Besides, Johnny was in the Don's bad graces. Johnny having divorced his childhood sweetheart to marry Margot Ashton. This had displeased the Don greatly. How come these guys stopped their operation? The cops got onto them? Hagen shook his head. The Don withdrew his protection. That was right after Connie's wedding. It was a pattern he was to see often. The Don helping those in misfortune whose misfortune he had partly created. Not perhaps out of cunning or planning, but because of his variety of interests, or perhaps because of the nature of the universe, the interlinking of good and evil, natural of itself. Michael had married Kay up in New England, a quiet wedding with only her family and a few of her friends present. Then they had moved into one of the houses on the mall in Long Beach. Michael was surprised at how well Kay got along with his parents and the other people living on the mall. And of course, she had gotten pregnant right away, like a good old-style Italian wife was supposed to, and that helped. The second kid on the way in two years was just icing. Kay would be waiting for him at the airport. She always came to meet him. She was always so glad when he came back from a trip. And he was too, except now. For the end of this trip meant that he finally had to take the action he had been groomed for over the last three years. The Don would be waiting for him. The Capo Regime would be waiting for him. And he, Michael Corleone, would have to give the orders, make the decisions which would decide his and his family's fate. Every morning when Kay Adams Corleone got up to take care of the baby's early feeding, she saw Mama Corleone, the Don's wife, being driven away from the mall by one of the bodyguards to return an hour later. Kay soon learned that her mother-in-law went to church every single morning. Often on her return, the old woman stopped by for morning coffee and to see her new grandchild. Mama Corleone always started off by asking Kay why she didn't think of becoming a Catholic, ignoring the fact that Kay's child had already been baptized a Protestant. So Kay felt it was proper to ask the old woman why she went to church every morning, whether that was a necessary part of being a Catholic. As if she thought that this might have stopped Kay from converting, the old woman said, Oh, no, no. Some Catholics only go to church on Easter and Christmas. You go when you feel like going. Kay laughed. Then why do you go every single morning? In a completely natural way, Mama Corleone said, I go for my husband. She pointed down toward the floor. So he don't go down there. 
I say prayers for his soul every day so he go up there. She pointed heavenward. She said this with an impish smile, as if she were subverting her husband's will in some way, or as if it were a losing cause. It was said jokingly almost, in her grim, Italian, old crone fashion. And as always, when her husband was not present, there was an attitude of disrespect to the great Don. How is your husband feeling? Mama Corleone shrugged. He's not the same man since they shot him. He lets Michael do all of the work. He just plays the fool with his garden, his peppers, his tomatoes, as if he were some peasant still. But men are always like that. Later in the morning, Connie Corleone would walk across the mall with her two children to pay Kay a visit and chat. Kay liked Connie, her vivaciousness, her obvious fondness for her brother Michael. Connie had taught Kay how to cook some Italian dishes, but sometimes brought her own more expert concoctions over for Michael to taste. Now, this morning, as she usually did, she asked Kay what Michael thought of her husband, Carlo. Did Michael really like Carlo, as he seemed to? Carlo had always had a little trouble with the family, but now, over the last years, he had straightened out. He was really doing well in the labor union, but he had to work so hard, such long hours. Carlo really liked Michael, Connie always said. But then, everybody liked Michael, just as everybody liked her father. Michael was the Don all over again. It was the best thing that Michael was going to run the family olive oil business. Kay had observed before that when Connie spoke about her husband in relation to the family, she was always nervously eager for some word of approval for Carlo. Kay would have been stupid if she had not noticed that almost terrified concern Connie had for whether Michael liked Carlo or not. One night, she spoke to Michael about it and mentioned the fact that nobody ever spoke about Sonny Corleone. Nobody even referred to him, at least not in her presence. Kay had once tried to express her condolences to the Don and his wife, and had been listened to with almost rude silence, and then ignored. She had tried to get Connie talking about her older brother without success. Sonny's wife, Sandra, had taken her children and moved to Florida, where her parents now lived. Certain financial arrangements had been made so that she and her children could live comfortably, but Sonny had left no estate. Michael reluctantly explained what had happened the night Sonny was killed, that Carlo had beaten his wife, and Connie had called them all, and Sonny had taken the call and rushed out in a blind rage. So naturally, Connie and Carlo were always nervous that the rest of the family blamed her for indirectly causing Sonny's death, or blamed her husband, Carlo. But this wasn't the case. The proof was that they had given Connie and Carlo a house in the mall itself and promoted Carlo to an important job in the labor union setup. And Carlo had straightened out, stopped drinking, stopped whoring, stopped trying to be a wise guy. The family was pleased with his work and attitude for the last two years. Nobody blamed him for what had happened. Then why don't you invite them over some evening and you can reassure your sister? Kay said. The poor thing is always so nervous about what you think of her husband. Tell her and tell her to put these silly worries out of her head. I can't do that. We don't talk about those things in our family. Do you want me to tell her what you've told me? She was puzzled because he took such a long time thinking over a suggestion that was obviously the proper thing to do. Finally, he said, I don't think you should, Kay. I, I don't think it will do any good. She'll worry anyway. It's something nobody can do anything about. Kay was amazed. She realized that Michael was always a little colder to his sister Connie than he was to anyone else, despite Connie's affection. Surely you don't blame Connie for Sonny being killed. Michael sighed. Of course not. She's my kid's sister and I'm very fond of her. I feel sorry for her. Carlos straightened out, but he's really the wrong kind of husband. It's just one of those things. Let's forget about it. It was not in Kay's nature to nag. She let it drop. Also, she had learned that Michael was not a man to push, that he could become coldly disagreeable. She knew she was the only person in the world who could bend his will, but she also knew that to do it too often would be to destroy that power, and living with him the last two years had made her love him more. She loved him because he was always fair, an odd thing, but he always was fair to everybody around him, never arbitrary, even in little things. She had observed that he was now a very powerful man. People came to the house to confer with him and ask favors, treating him with deference and respect. But one thing had endeared him to her above everything else. Ever since Michael had come back from Sicily with his broken face, everybody in the family had tried to get him to undergo corrective surgery. Michael's mother was after him constantly. One Sunday dinner, with all the Corleones gathered on the mall, she shouted at Michael, You look like a gangster in the movies. 
Get your fast fixed for the sake of Jesus Christ and your poor wife, and so your nose will stop a running like a drunken Irish. The Don, at the head of the table, watching everything, said to Kay, Does it bother you? Kay shook her head. The Don said to his wife, He's out of your hands. It's no concern of yours. The old woman immediately held her peace, not that she feared her husband, but because it would have been disrespectful to dispute him in such a matter before the others. But Connie, the Don's favorite, came in from the kitchen, where she was cooking the Sunday dinner, her face flushed from the stove. I think he should get his face fixed. He was the most handsome one in the family before he got hurt. Come on, Mike, say you'll do it. Michael looked at her in an absent-minded fashion. It seemed as if he really and truly had not heard anything said. He didn't answer. Connie came to stand beside her father. Make him do it. Her two hands rested affectionately on his shoulders and she rubbed his neck. She was the only one who was ever so familiar with the Don. Her affection for her father was touching. It was trusting, like a little girl's. The Don patted one of her hands. And we're all starving here. Put the spaghetti on the table and then chatter. Connie turned to her husband. Carlo, you tell Mike to get his face fixed. Maybe he'll listen to you. Her voice implied that Michael and Carlo Rizzi had some friendly relationship over and above anyone else's. Carlo, handsomely sunburned, blonde hair neatly cut and combed, sipped at his glass of homemade wine. Nobody can tell Mike what to do. Carlo had become a different man since moving into the mall. He knew his place in the family and kept to it. There was something that Kay didn't understand in all this, something that didn't quite meet the eye. As a woman, she could see that Connie was deliberately charming her father, though it was beautifully done and even sincere. Yet it was not spontaneous. Carlo's reply had been a manly knuckling of his forehead. Michael had absolutely ignored everything. Kay didn't care about her husband's disfigurement, but she worried about his sinus trouble, which sprang from it. Surgery repair of the face would cure the sinus also. For that reason, she wanted Michael to enter the hospital and get the necessary work done. But she understood that in a curious way, he desired his disfigurement. She was sure that the Don understood this too. But after Kay gave birth to her first child, she was surprised by Michael asking her, Do you want me to get my face fixed? Kay nodded. You know how kids are. Your son will feel bad about your face when he gets old enough to understand it's not normal. I just don't want our child to see it. I don't mind at all. Honestly, Michael. Okay. He smiled at her. I'll do it. He waited until she was home from the hospital and then made all the necessary arrangements. The operation was successful. The cheek indentation was now just barely noticeable. Everybody in the family was delighted, but Connie more so than anyone. She visited Michael every day in the hospital, dragging Carlo along. When Michael came home, she gave him a big hug and a kiss and looked at him admiringly. Now you're my handsome brother again. Only the Don was unimpressed, shrugging his shoulders and remarking, Hey, what's the difference? But Kay was grateful. She knew that Michael had done it against all his own inclinations, had done it because she had asked him to, and that she was the only person in the world who could make him act against his own nature. On the afternoon of Michael's return from Vegas, Rocco Lampone drove the limousine to the mall to pick up Kay so that she could meet her husband at the airport. She always met her husband when he arrived from out of town, mostly because she felt lonely without him, living as she did in the fortified mall. She saw him come off the plane with Tom Hagen and the new man he had working for him, Albert Neri. Kay didn't care much for Neri. He reminded her of Luca Brasi in his quiet ferociousness. She saw Neri drop behind Michael and off to the side, saw his quick penetrating glance as his eyes swept over everybody nearby. It was Neri who first spotted Kay and touched Michael's shoulder to make him look in the proper direction. Kay ran into her husband's arms, and he quickly kissed her and let her go. He and Tom Hagen and Kay got into the limousine, and Albert Neri vanished. Kay did not notice that Neri had gotten into another car with two men, and that this car rode behind the limousine until it reached Long Beach. Kay never asked Michael how his business had gone. Even such polite questions were understood to be awkward, not that he wouldn't give her an equally polite answer, but it would remind them both of the forbidden territory their marriage could never include. Kay didn't mind anymore. But when Michael told her he would have to spend the evening with his father to tell him about the Vegas trip, she couldn't help making a little frown of disappointment. Michael said, I'm sorry. Tomorrow night we'll go into New York and see a show and have dinner, okay? He patted her stomach. She was almost seven months pregnant. After the kid comes, you'll be tied down again. 
<laughs> Hell, you're more Italian than Yankee. Two kids in two years. And you're more Yankee than Italian. Your first evening home and you spend it on business. But she smiled at him when she said it. You won't be home late. Before midnight. Don't wait up for me if you feel tired. I'll wait up. At the meeting that night, in the corner room library of Don Corleone's house, were the Don himself, Michael, Tom Hagen, Carlo Rizzi, and the two capo regime, Clemenza and Tessio. The atmosphere of the meeting was by no means so congenial as in former days. Ever since Don Corleone had announced his semi-retirement and Michael's takeover of the family business, there had been some strain. Succession and control of such an enterprise as the family was by no means hereditary. In any other family, powerful capo regime such as Clemenza and Tessio might have succeeded to the position of Don, or at least they might have been allowed to split off and form their own family. Then, too, ever since Don Corleone had made the peace with the five families, the strength of the Corleone family had declined. The Barzini family was now indisputably the most powerful one in the New York area, allied as they were to the Tatalias. They now held the position the Corleone family had once held. Also, they were slyly whittling down the power of the Corleone family, muscling into their gambling areas, testing the Corleone's reactions, and, finding them weak, establishing their own bookmakers. The Barzinis and Tatalias were delighted with the Don's retirement. Michael, formidable as he might prove to be, could never hope to equal the Don in cunning and influence for at least another decade. The Corleone family was definitely in a decline. It had, of course, suffered serious misfortunes. Freddie had proved to be nothing more than an innkeeper and ladies' man, the idiom for ladies' man untranslatable, but connotating a greedy infant always at its mother's nipple, in short, unmanly. Sonny's death, too, had been a disaster. Sonny had been a man to be feared, not to be taken lightly. Of course, he had made a mistake in sending his younger brother, Michael, to kill the Turk and the police captain. Though necessary in a tactical sense as a long-term strategy, it proved to be a serious error. It had forced the Don eventually to rise from his sickbed. It had deprived Michael of two years of valuable experience and training under his father's tutelage. And, of course, an Irish as a consigliere, had been the only foolishness the Don had ever perpetrated. No Irishman could hope to equal a Sicilian for cunning. So went the opinion of all the families, and they were naturally more respectful to the Barzini Italia alliance than to the Corleones. Their opinion of Michael was that he was not equal to Sonny in force, though more intelligent, certainly, but not as intelligent as his father, a mediocre successor and a man not to be feared too greatly. Also, though the Don was generally admired for his statesmanship in making the peace, the fact that he had not avenged Sonny's murder lost the family a great deal of respect. It was recognized that such statesmanship sprang out of weakness. All this was known to the men sitting in the room, and perhaps even believed by a few. Carlo Rizzi liked Michael, but did not fear him as he had feared Sonny. Clemenza, too, though he gave Michael credit for a bravura performance with the Turk and the police captain, could not help thinking Michael too soft to be a Don. Clemenza had hoped to be given permission to form his own family, to have his own empire split away from the Corleone. But the Don had indicated that this was not to be, and Clemenza respected the Don too much to disobey, unless, of course, the whole situation became intolerable. Tessio had a better opinion of Michael. He sensed something else in the young man, a force cleverly kept hidden, a man jealously guarding his true strength from public gaze, following the Don's precept that a friend should always underestimate your virtues and an enemy overestimate your faults. The Don himself and Tom Hagen were, of course, under no illusions about Michael. The Don would never have retired if he had not had absolute faith in his son's ability to retrieve the family position. Hagen had been Michael's teacher for the last two years and was amazed at how quickly Michael grasped all the intricacies of the family business. Truly, his father's son. Clemenza and Tessio were annoyed with Michael because he had reduced the strength of their regime and had never reconstituted Sonny's regime. The Corleone family, in effect, had now only two fighting divisions with less personnel than formerly. Clemenza and Tessio considered this suicidal, especially with the Barzini Tatalia encroachments on their empires. So now they were hopeful these errors might be corrected at this extraordinary meeting convened by the Don. Michael started off by telling them about his trip to Vegas and Mo Green's refusing the offer to buy him out. But we'll make him an offer he can't refuse. You already know the Corleone family plans to move its operations west. We'll have four of the hotel casinos on the Strip, but it can't be right away. We need time to get things straightened out. He spoke directly to Clemenza. Pete, you and Tessio, 
I want you to go along with me for a year without questioning and without reservations. At the end of that year, both of you can split off from the Corleone family and be your own bosses, have your own families. Of course, it goes without saying we'd maintain our friendship. I wouldn't insult you and your respect for my father by thinking otherwise for a minute. But up until that time, I want you just to follow my lead and don't worry. There are negotiations going on that will solve problems that you think are not solvable. So, just be a little patient. Tessio spoke up. If Mo Green wanted to talk to your father, why not let him? The Don could always persuade anybody. There was never anyone who could stand up to his reasonableness. The Don answered this directly. I'm retired. Michael would lose respect if I interfered. And besides, that's a man I'd rather not talk to. Tessio remembered the stories he'd heard about Mo Green slapping Freddy Corleone around one night in the Vegas hotel. He began to smell a rat. He leaned back. Mo Green was a dead man, he thought. The Corleone family did not wish to persuade him. Carlo Rizzi spoke up. Is the Corleone family going to stop operating in New York altogether? Michael nodded. We're selling the olive oil business. Everything we can, we turn over to Tessio and Clemenza. But, Carlo, I don't want you to worry about your job. You grew up in Nevada. You know the state. You know the people. I'm counting on you being my right-hand man when we make our move out there. Carlo leaned back, his face flushed with gratification. His time was coming. He would move in the constellations of power. Michael went on. Tom Hagen is no longer the consigliere. He's going to be our lawyer in Vegas. In about two months, he'll move out there permanently with his family, strictly as a lawyer. Nobody goes to him with any other business as of now, this minute. He's a lawyer, and that's all. No reflection on Tom. That's the way I want it. Besides, if I ever need any advice, who's a better counselor than my father? They all laughed, but they'd gotten the message despite the joke. Tom Hagen was out. He no longer held any power. They all took their fleeting glances to check Hagen's reaction, but his face was impassive. Clemenza spoke up in his fat man's wheeze. Then in a year's time, we're on our own. Is that it? Maybe less. Of course, you can always remain part of the family. That's your choice. But most of our strength will be out west, and maybe you'd do better organized on your own. Tessio said quietly, In that case, I think you should give us permission to recruit new men for our regimes. Those Barzini bastards keep chiseling in on my territory. I think maybe it would be wise to teach him a little lesson in manners. Michael shook his head. No. No good. Just stay still. All that stuff will be negotiated. Everything will be straightened out before we leave. Tessio was not to be so easily satisfied. He spoke to the Don directly, taking a chance on incurring Michael's ill will. Forgive me, Godfather. Let our years of friendship be my excuse. But I think you and your son are all wrong with this Nevada business. How can you hope for success there without your strength here to back you up? The two go hand in hand. And with you gone from here, the Barzini and the Tatalia will be too strong for us. Me and Pete will have trouble. We'll come under their thumb sooner or later. And Barzini is a man not to my taste. I say the Corleone family has to make its move from strength, not from weakness. We should build up our regimes and take back our lost territories in Staten Island at least. The Don shook his head. I made the peace, remember? I can't go back on my word. Tessio refused to be silenced. Everybody knows Barzini gave you provocation since then. And besides, if Michael is the new chief of the Corleone family, what's to stop him from taking any action he sees fit? Your word doesn't strictly bind him. Michael broke in sharply. He said to Tessio, very much the chief now, There are things being negotiated which will answer your questions and resolve your doubts. If my word isn't enough for you, ask your Don. Patesio understood he had finally gone too far. If he dared to question the Don, he would make Michael his enemy. So he shrugged and said, I spoke for the good of the family, not for myself. I can take care of myself. Michael gave him a friendly smile. Tessio, I never doubt you in any way. I never did. But trust in me. Of course I'm not equal to you and Pete in these things. But after all, I have my father to guide me. I won't do too badly. We'll all come out fine. The meeting was over. The big news was that Clemenza and Tessio would be permitted to form their own families from their regime. Tessio would have his gambling in docks in Brooklyn, Clemenza the gambling in Manhattan, and the family contacts in the racing tracks of Long Island. 
The two Cabo regime left not quite satisfied, still a little uneasy. Carlo Rizzi lingered, hoping that the time had come when he finally would be treated as one of the family, but he quickly saw that Michael was not of that mind. He left the Don, Tom Hagen, and Michael alone in the corner library room. Albert Neri ushered him out of the house, and Carlo noticed that Neri stood in the doorway, watching him walk across the floodlit mall. In the library, the three men had relaxed as only people can who have lived years together in the same house, in the same family. Michael served some anisette to the Don and scotch to Tom Hagen. He took a drink for himself, which he rarely did. Tom Hagen spoke up first. Mike, why are you cutting me out of the action? Michael seemed surprised. You'll be my number one man in Vegas. We'll be legitimate all the way, and you're the legal man. What can be more important than that? Hagen smiled a little sadly. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Rocco Lampone building a secret regime without my knowledge. I'm talking about you dealing direct with Neri rather than through me or a copper regime. Unless, of course, you don't know what Lampone's doing. How did you find out about Lampone's regime? Hagen shrugged. Don't worry, there's no leak. Nobody else knows. But in my position, I can see what's happening. You gave Lamponi his own living. You gave him a lot of freedom. So he needs people to help him in his little empire. But everybody he recruits has to be reported to me. And I notice everybody he puts on the payroll is a little too good for that particular job. He's getting a little more money than that particular exercise is worth. You picked the right man when you picked Lamponi, by the way. He's operating perfectly. Michael grimaced. Not so damn perfect if you noticed. Anyway, the Don picked Lamponi. Okay, so why am I cut out of the action? Michael faced him and, without flinching, gave it to him straight. Tom, you're not a wartime consigliere. Things may get tough with this move we're trying to make, and we may have to fight. And I want to get you out of the line of fire, too, just in case. Hagen's face reddened. If the Don had told him the same thing, he would have accepted it humbly. But where the hell did Mike come off making such a snap judgment? Okay, but I happen to agree with Tessio. I think you're going about this all wrong. You're making the move out of weakness, not strength. That's always bad. Barzini is like a wolf, and if he tears you limb from limb, the other families won't come rushing to help the Corleones. The Don finally spoke. Tom, it's not just Michael. I advised him on these matters. There are things that may have to be done that I don't want in any way to be responsible for. That is my wish, not Michael's. I never thought you were a bad consigliere. I thought Santino a bad Don, may his soul rest in peace. He had a good heart, but he wasn't the right man to head the family when I had my little misfortune. And who would have thought that Freda would become a lackey of women, so don't feel badly. Michael has all my confidence, as you do. For reasons which you can't know, you must have no part in what may happen. And by the way, I told Michael that Lamboni's secret regime would not escape your eye. So that shows I have faith in you. Michael laughed. I honestly didn't think you'd pick that up, Tom. Hagen knew he was being mollified. Maybe I can help. Michael shook his head decisively. You're out, Tom. Tom finished his drink, and before he left, he gave Michael a mild reproof. You're nearly as good as your father. But there's one thing you still have to learn. What's that? How to say no. Michael nodded gravely. You're right. I'll remember that. When Hagen had left, Michael said jokingly to his father, So, you've taught me everything else. Tell me how to say no to people in the way they'll like. The Don moved to sit behind the big desk. You cannot say no to the people you love, not often. That's the secret. And then when you do, it has to sound like a yes. Oh, you have to make them say no. You have to take time and trouble. But I'm old-fashioned. You're the new modern generation. Don't listen to me. Michael laughed. Right. You agree about Tom being out, though, don't you? The Don nodded. He can't be involved in this. Michael said quietly, I think it's time for me to tell you that what I'm going to do is not purely out of vengeance for Apollonia and Sonny. It's the right thing to do. Tessio and Tom are right about the Barzinis. Don Corleone nodded. Revenge is the dish that tastes best when it is cold. I would not have made that piece but that I knew you would never come home alive otherwise. I'm surprised, though, that... Barzini still made a last try at you. Maybe it was arranged before the peace talk and he couldn't stop it. Are you sure they were not after Don Tomasino? That's the way it was supposed to look. And it would have been perfect. Even you would never have suspected. Except that I came out alive. I saw Fabrizio going through the gate, running away. And of course, I've checked it all out since I've been back. Have they found that shepherd? I found him. 
I found him a year ago. He's got his own little pizza place up in Buffalo. New name, phony passport and identification. He's doing very well at Fabrizio the Shepherd. The Don nodded. So, it's to no purpose to wait any longer. When will you start? I want to wait until after Kay has the baby. Just in case something goes wrong. And I want Tom settled in Vegas so he won't be concerned in the affair. I think a year from now. You've prepared for everything? The Don did not look at Michael when he said this. You have no part. You're not responsible. I take all responsibility. I would refuse to let you even veto. If you tried to do that now, I would leave the family and go my own way. You're not responsible. The Don was silent for a long time, and then he sighed. So be it. Maybe that's why I retired. Maybe that's why I've turned everything over to you. I've done my share in life. I haven't got the heart anymore. And there are some duties the best of men can assume. That's it then. During that year, Kay Adams Corleone was delivered of a second child, another boy. She delivered easily, without any trouble whatsoever, and was welcomed back to the mall like a royal princess. Connie Corleone presented the baby with a silk layette handmade in Italy, enormously expensive and beautiful. She told Kay, Carlo found it. He shopped all over New York to get something extra special after I couldn't find anything I really liked. Kay smiled her thanks, understood immediately that she was to tell Michael this fine tale. She was on her way to becoming a Sicilian. Also during that year, Nino Valenti died of a cerebral hemorrhage. His death made the front pages of the tabloids because the movie Johnny Fontaine had featured him in had opened a few weeks before and was a smash hit, establishing Nino as a major star. The papers mentioned that Johnny Fontaine was handling the funeral arrangements, that the funeral would be private, only family and close friends to attend. One sensational story even claimed that in an interview, Johnny Fontaine had blamed himself for his friend's death, that he should have forced his friend to place himself under medical care. But the reporter made it sound like the usual self-reproach of the sensitive but innocent bystander to a tragedy. Johnny Fontaine had made his childhood friend, Nino Valenti, a movie star. And what more could a friend do? No member of the Corleone family attended the California funeral except Freddie. Lucy and Jules Siegel attended. The Don himself had wanted to go to California, but had suffered a slight heart attack, which kept him in his bed for a month. He sent a huge floral wreath instead. Albert Neri was also sent west as the official representative of the family. Two days after Nino's funeral, Mo Green was shot to death in the Hollywood home of his movie star mistress. Albert Neri did not reappear in New York until almost a month later. He had taken his vacation in the Caribbean and returned to duty tanned, almost black. Michael Corleone welcomed him with a smile and a few words of praise, which included the information that Neri would, from then on, receive an extra living, the family income from an East Side book considered especially rich. Neri was content, satisfied, that he lived in a world that properly rewarded a man who did his duty. Chapter 29 Michael Corleone had taken precautions against every eventuality. His planning was faultless, his security impeccable. He was patient, hoping to use the full year to prepare. But he was not to get his necessary year because fate itself took a stand against him, and in the most surprising fashion. For it was the godfather, the great Don himself, who failed Michael Corleone. On one sunny Sunday morning, while the women were at church, Don Vito Corleone dressed in his gardening uniform, baggy gray trousers, a faded blue shirt, battered dirty brown fedora decorated by a stained gray silk hat band. The Don had gained considerable weight in the last few years and worked on his tomato vines, he said, for the sake of his health, but he deceived no one. The truth was, he loved tending his garden. He loved the sight of it early on a morning. It brought back his childhood in Sicily 60 years ago, brought it back without the terror, the sorrow of his own father's death. Now the beans in their rows grew little white flowers on top. Strong green stalks of scallion fenced everything in. At the foot of the garden, a spouted barrel stood guard. It was filled with liquidy cow manure, the finest garden fertilizer. Also in that lower part of the garden were the square wooden frames he had built with his own hands, the sticks cross-tied with thick white string. Over these frames crawled the tomato vines. The Don hastened to water his garden. It must be done before the sun waxed too hot and turned the water into a prism of fire that could burn his lettuce leaves like paper. Sun was more important than water. Water also was important, but the two, imprudently mixed, could cause great misfortune. 
The Don moved through his garden hunting for ants. If ants were present, it meant that lice were in his vegetables, and the ants were going after the lice, and he would have to spray. He had watered just in time. The sun was becoming hot, and the Don thought, Prudence, prudence. But there were just a few more plants to be supported by sticks, and he bent down again. He would go back into the house when he finished this last row. Quite suddenly, it felt as if the sun had come down very close to his head. The air was filled with dancing golden specks. Michael's oldest boy came running through the garden toward where the Don knelt, and the boy was enveloped by a yellow shield of blinding light. But the Don was not to be tricked. He was too old a hand. Death hid behind that flaming yellow shield, ready to pounce out on him. And the Don, with a wave of his hand, warned the boy away from his presence. Just in time. The sledgehammer blow inside his chest made him choke for air. The Don pitched forward into the earth. Michael's oldest boy came running through the garden toward where the Don knelt, and the boy was enveloped by a yellow shield of blinding light. But the Don was not to be tricked. He was too old a hand. Death hid behind that flaming yellow shield, ready to pounce out on him. And the Don, with a wave of his hand, warned the boy away from his presence. Just in time. The sledgehammer blow inside his chest made him choke for air. The Don pitched forward into the earth. The boy raced away to call his father. Michael Corleone and some men at the mall gate ran to the garden and found the Don lying prone, clutching handfuls of earth. They lifted the Don up and carried him to the shade of his stone flag patio. Michael knelt beside his father, holding his hand, while the other men called for an ambulance and doctor. With a great effort, the Don opened his eyes to see his son once more. The massive heart attack had turned his ruddy face almost blue. He was an extremist. He smelled the garden. The yellow shield of light smote his eyes, and he whispered, Life is so beautiful. He was spared the sight of his women's tears, dying before they came back from church, dying before the ambulance arrived, or the doctor. He died surrounded by men, holding the hand of the son he had most loved. The funeral was royal. The five families sent their dons and capo regime, as did the Tessio and Clemenza families. Johnny Fontaine made the tabloid headlines by attending the funeral despite the advice of Michael not to appear. Fontaine gave a statement to the newspapers that Vito Corleone was his godfather and the finest man he had ever known, and that he was honored to be permitted to pay his last respects to such a man and didn't give a damn who knew it. The wake was held in the house of the mall in the old-fashioned style. Amerigo Bonacera had never done finer work, had discharged all obligations by preparing his old friend and godfather as lovingly as a mother prepares a bride for her wedding. Everyone commented on how not even death itself had been able to erase the nobility and the dignity of the great Don's countenance. And such remarks made Amerigo Bonacera fill with knowing pride, a curious sense of power. Only he knew what a terrible massacre death had perpetrated on the Don's appearance. All the old friends and servitors came. Nazarene, his wife, his daughter, and her husband and their children. Lucy Mancini came with Freddy from Las Vegas. Tom Hagen and his wife and children. The Dons from San Francisco and Los Angeles, Boston and Cleveland. Rocco Lampone and Albert Neri were pallbearers with Clemenza and Tessio. And, of course, the sons of the Don. The mall and all its houses were filled with floral wreaths. Outside the gates of the mall were the newspapermen and photographers in a small truck that was known to contain FBI men with their movie cameras recording this epic. Some newspapermen who tried to crash the funeral inside found that the gate and fence were manned with security guards who demanded identification and an invitation card. And though they were treated with the utmost courtesy, refreshments sent out to them, they were not permitted inside. They tried to speak with some of the people coming out, but were met with stony stares and not a syllable. Michael Corleone spent most of the day in the corner library room with Kay, Tom Hagen, and Freddie. People were ushered in to see him, to offer their condolences. Michael received them with all courtesy, even when some of them addressed him as Godfather or Don Michael, only Kay noticing his lips tighten with displeasure. Clemenza and Tessio came to join this inner circle, and Michael personally served them with a drink. There was some gossip of business. Michael informed them that the mall and all its houses were to be sold to a development and construction company at an enormous profit, still another proof of the great Don's genius. 
They all understood that now the whole empire would be in the West, that the Corleone family would liquidate its power in New York. Such action had been awaiting the retirement or death of the Don. It was nearly ten years since there had been such a celebration of people in this house, nearly ten years since the wedding of Constanzia Corleone and Carlo Rizzi, so somebody said. Michael walked to the window that looked out on the garden. That long time ago he had sat in the garden with Kay, never dreaming that so curious a destiny was to be his, and his father dying had said, life is so beautiful. Michael could never remember his father ever having uttered a word about death, as if the Don respected death too much to philosophize about it. It was time for the cemetery. It was time to bury the great Don. Michael linked his arm with Kay's and went out into the garden to join the host of mourners. Behind him came the Capo Regime, followed by their soldiers, and then all the humble people the godfather had blessed during his lifetime, the baker Nazarene, the widow Colombo, and her sons, and all the countless others of his world he had ruled so firmly but justly. There were even some who had been his enemies, come to do him honor. Michael observed all this with a tight, polite smile. He was not impressed. Yet he thought, if I can die, saying, life is so beautiful, then nothing else is important. If I can believe in myself that much, nothing else matters. He would follow his father. He would care for his children, his family, his world. But his children would grow in a different world. They would be doctors, artists, scientists, governors, presidents, anything at all. He would see to it that they joined the general family of humanity. But he, as a powerful and prudent parent, would most certainly keep a wary eye on that general family. On the morning after the funeral, all the most important officials of the Corleone family assembled on the mall. Shortly before noon, they were admitted into the empty house of the Don. Michael Corleone received them. They almost filled the corner library room. There were the two capo regime, Clemenza and Tessio, Rocco Lampone with his reasonable, competent air, Carlo Rizzi, very quiet, very much knowing his place, Tom Hagen forsaking his strictly legal role to rally around in this crisis, Albert Neri trying to stay physically close to Michael, lighting his new Don cigarette, mixing his drink, all to show an unswerving loyalty, despite the recent disaster to the Corleone family. The death of the Don was a great misfortune for the family. Without him, it seemed that half their strength was gone, and almost all their bargaining power against the barzini tatalia alliance. Everyone in the room knew this, and they waited for what Michael would say. In their eyes, he was not yet the new Don. He had not earned the position or the title. If the godfather had lived, he might have assured his son's succession. Now it was by no means certain. Michael waited until Neri had served drinks. I just want to tell everybody here that I understand how they feel. I know you all respected my father, but now you have to worry about yourselves and your families. Some of you wonder how what happened is going to affect the planning we've done and the promises I made. Well, the answer to that is nothing. Everything goes on as before. Clemenza shook his great shaggy buffalo head. His hair was an iron gray, and his features more deeply embedded in added layers of fat were unpleasant. The Barzinis and Tatalias are going to move in on us real hard, Mike. You got to fight or we'll have a sit-down with them. Everyone in the room noticed that Clemenza had not used a formal form of address to Michael, much less the title of Don. Let's wait and see what happens. Let them break the peace first. Tessio spoke up in his soft voice. They already have, Mike. They opened up two books in Brooklyn this morning. I got the word from the police captain who runs a protection list at the station house. In a month, I won't have a place to hang my hat in all Brooklyn. Michael stared at him thoughtfully. Have you done anything about it? Tessio shook his small, ferret-like head. No, I didn't want to give you any problems. Good. Just sit tight. And I guess that's what I want to say to all of you. Just sit tight. Don't react to any provocation. Give me a few weeks to straighten things out, to see which way the wind is going to blow. Then I'll make the best deal I can for everybody here. Then we'll have a final meeting and make some final decisions. He ignored their surprise, and Albert Neri started ushering them out. Tom, stick around a few minutes. Hagen went to the window that faced them all. 
He waited until he saw the Capo Regime and Carlo Rizzi and Rocco Lampone being shepherded through the guarded gate by Neri. Then he turned to Michael. Have you got all the political connections wired into you? Michael shook his head regretfully. Not all. I needed about four more months. The Don and I were working on it. But I've got all the judges. We did that first. And some of the more important people in Congress. And the big party boys here in New York were no problem, of course. The Corleone family is a lot stronger than anybody thinks. But I hoped to make it foolproof. He smiled at Hagen. I guess you've figured everything out by now. Hagen nodded. It wasn't hard. Except why you wanted me out of the action. But I put on my Sicilian hat and I finally figured that too. Michael laughed. The old man said you would. But that's a luxury I can't afford anymore. I need you here. At least for the next few weeks. You better phone Vegas and talk to your wife. Just tell her a few weeks. How do you think they'll come at you? Michael sighed. The Don instructed me through somebody close. Barzini will set me up through somebody close that supposedly I won't suspect. Hagen smiled at him. Somebody like me. Michael smiled back. You're Irish. They won't trust you. I'm German-American. To them, that's Irish. They won't go to you, and they won't go to Neri because Neri was a cop. Plus, both of you are too close to me. They can't take that gamble. Rocco Lampone isn't close enough. No. It will be Clemenza, Tessio, or Carlo Rizzi. I'm betting it's Carlo. We'll see. It won't be long. It was the next morning while Hagen and Michael were having breakfast together. Michael took a phone call in the library, and when he came back to the kitchen, he said to Hagen, It's all set up. I'm going to meet Barzini a week from now to make a new piece now that the Don is dead. Michael laughed. Who phoned you? Who made the contact? They both knew that whoever in the Corleone family had made the contact had turned traitor. Michael gave Hagen a sad, regretful smile. Tessio. They ate the rest of their breakfast in silence. Over coffee, Hagen shook his head. I could have sworn it would have been Carlo or maybe Clemenza. I never figured Tessio. He's the best of the lot. He's the most intelligent. And he did what seems to him to be the smart thing. He sets me up for a hit by Barzini and inherits the Corleone family. He sticks with me, and he gets wiped out. He's figuring I can't win. Hagen paused before he asked reluctantly, How right is he figuring? Michael shrugged. It looks bad. But my father was the only one who understood that political connections and power are worth ten regimes. I think I've got most of my father's political power in my hands now. But I'm the only one who really knows that. He smiled at Hagen, a reassuring smile. I'll make them call me Don. But I feel lousy about Tessio. Have you agreed to the meeting with Barzini? Yeah, a week from tonight, in Brooklyn, on Tessio's ground, where I'll be safe. He laughed again. Be careful before then. For the first time, Michael was cold with Hagen. I don't need a conciliary to give me that kind of advice. During the week preceding the peace meeting between the Corleone and Barzini families, Michael showed Hagen just how careful he could be. He never set foot outside the mall and never received anyone without Neri beside him. There was only one annoying complication. Connie, and Carlo's oldest boy, was to receive his confirmation in the Catholic Church, and Kay asked Michael to be the godfather. Michael refused. I don't often beg you, please do this just for me. Connie wants it so much, and so does Carlo. It's very important to them. Please, Michael. She could see he was angry with her for insisting, and expected him to refuse. So she was surprised when he nodded and said, Okay, but I can't leave the mall. Tell them to arrange for the priest to confirm the kid here. I'll pay whatever it costs. If they run into trouble with the church people, Hagen will straighten it out. And so, the day before the meeting with the Barzini family, Michael Corleone stood godfather to the son of Carlo and Connie Rizzi. He presented the boy with an extremely expensive wristwatch and gold band. There was a small party in Carlo's house, to which were invited the Capo Regime, Hagen, Lampone, and everyone who lived on the mall, including, of course, the Don's widow. Connie was so overcome with emotion that she hugged and kissed her brother and Kay all during the evening. And even Carlo Rizzi became sentimental, wringing Michael's hand and calling him godfather at every excuse, old country style. Michael himself had never been so affable, so outgoing. Connie whispered to Kay, I think Carlo and Mike are going to be real friends now. Something like this always brings people together. Kay squeezed her sister-in-law's arm. She said, I'm so glad. 
Book 8, Chapter 30 Albert Neri sat in his Bronx apartment and carefully brushed the blue serge of his old policeman's uniform. He unpinned the badge and set it on the table to be polished. The regulation holster and gun were draped over a chair. This old routine of detail made him happy in some strange way, one of the few times he'd felt happy since his wife had left him, nearly two years ago. He had married Rita when she was a high school kid, and he was a rookie policeman. She was shy, dark-haired, from a straight-laced Italian family who never let her stay out later than ten o'clock at night. Neri was completely in love with her, her innocence, her virtue, as well as her dark prettiness. At first, Rita Neri was fascinated by her husband. He was immensely strong, and she could see people were afraid of him because of that strength and his unbending attitude toward what was right and wrong. He was rarely tactful. If he disagreed with a group's attitude or an individual's opinion, he kept his mouth shut or brutally spoke his contradiction. He never gave a polite agreement. He also had a true Sicilian temper, and his rages could be awesome. But he was never angry with his wife. Neri, in the space of five years, became one of the most feared policemen on the New York City force. Also, one of the most honest. But he had his own ways of enforcing the law. He hated punks, and when he saw a bunch of young rowdies making a disturbance on a street corner at night, disturbing passers-by, he took quick and decisive action. He employed a physical strength that was truly extraordinary, which he himself did not fully appreciate. One night, in Central Park West, he jumped out of the patrol car and lined up six punks in black silk jackets. His partner remained in the driver's seat, not wanting to get involved, knowing Neri. The six boys, all in their late teens, had been stopping people and asking them for cigarettes in a youthfully menacing way, but not doing anyone any real physical harm. They had also teased girls going by with a sexual gesture, more French than American. Neri lined them up against the stone wall that closed off Central Park from 8th Avenue. It was twilight, but Neri carried his favorite weapon, a huge flashlight. He never bothered drawing his gun. It was never necessary. His face, when he was angry, was so brutally menacing, combined with his uniform, that the usual punks were cowed. These were no exception. Neri asked the first youth in the black silk jacket, What's your name? The kid answered with an Irish name. Neri told him, Get off the street. I see you again tonight, I'll crucify you. He motioned with his flashlight, and the youth walked quickly away. Neri followed the same procedure with the next two boys. He let them walk off. But the fourth boy gave an Italian name and smiled at Neri as if to claim some sort of kinship. Neri was unmistakably of Italian descent. Neri looked at this youth for a moment and asked superfluously, You Italian? The boy grinned confidently. Neri hit him a stunning blow on the forehead with his flashlight. The boy dropped to his knees. The skin and flesh of his forehead had cracked open and blood poured down his face. But it was strictly a flesh wound. Neri said to him harshly, You son of a bitch, you're a disgrace to the Italians. You give us all a bad name. Get on your feet. He gave the youth a kick in the side. Not gentle, not too hard. Get home and stay off the street. Don't ever let me catch you wearing that jacket again either. I'll send you to the hospital. Now get home. You're lucky I'm not your father. Neri didn't bother with the other two punks. He just booted their asses down the avenue, telling them he didn't want them on the street that night. In such encounters, all was done so quickly that there was no time for a crowd to gather or for someone to protest his actions. Neri would get into a patrol car and his partner would zoom it away. Of course, once in a while there would be a real hard case who wanted to fight and might even pull a knife. These were truly unfortunate people. Neri would, with awesome, quick ferocity, beat them bloody and throw them into the patrol car. They would be put under arrest and charged with assaulting an officer. But usually their case would have to wait until they were discharged from the hospital. Eventually, Neri was transferred to the beat that held the United Nations building area, mainly because he had not shown his precinct sergeant the proper respect. The United Nations people, with their diplomatic immunity, parked their limousines all over the streets without regard to the police regulations. Neri complained to the precinct and was told not to make waves, to just ignore it. But one night, there was a whole side street that was impassable because of these carelessly parked autos. It was after midnight, so Neri took his huge flashlight from the patrol car and went down the street, smashing windshields to smithereens. It was not easy, even for high-ranking diplomats, to get the windshields repaired in less than a few days. Protests poured into the police precinct station house, demanding protection against this vandalism. 
After a week of windshield smashing, the truth gradually hit somebody about what was actually happening, and Albert Neri was transferred to Harlem. One Sunday shortly afterward, Neri took his wife to visit his widowed sister in Brooklyn. Albert Neri had the fierce, protective affection for his sister, common to all Sicilians, and he always visited her at least once every couple of months to make sure she was all right. She was much older than he was and had a son who was 20. This son, Thomas, without a father's hand, was giving trouble. He had gotten into a few minor scrapes, was running a little wild. Neri had once used his contacts on the police force to keep the youth from being charged with larceny. On that occasion, he had kept his anger in check, but had given his nephew warning. Tommy, you make my sister cry over you, and I'll straighten you out myself. It was intended as a friendly, pally uncle warning, not really as a threat. But even though Tommy was the toughest kid in that tough Brooklyn neighborhood, he was afraid of his Uncle Al. On this particular visit, Tommy had come in very late Saturday night and was still sleeping in his room. His mother went to wake him, telling him to get dressed so that he could eat Sunday dinner with his uncle and aunt. The boy's voice came harshly through the partly open door. I don't give a shit. Let me sleep. His mother came back out into the kitchen, smiling apologetically. So they had to eat their dinner without him. Neri asked his sister if Tommy was giving her any real trouble, and she shook her head. Neri and his wife were about to leave when Tommy finally got up. He barely grumbled a hello and went into the kitchen. Finally, he yelled into his mother, Hey, Ma, how about cooking me something to eat? But it was not a request. It was the spoiled complaint of an indulged child. His mother said shrilly, Get up when it's dinner time, and then you can eat. I'm not going to cook again for you. It was the sort of little ugly scene that was fairly commonplace, but Tommy, still a little irritable from his slumber, made a mistake. Ah, fuck you and your nagging. I'll go out and eat. As soon as he said it, he regretted it. His Uncle Al was on him like a cat on a mouse, not so much for the insult to his sister this particular day, but because it was obvious that he often talked to his mother in such a fashion when they were alone. Tommy never dared say such a thing in front of her brother. This particular Sunday, he had just been careless, to his misfortune. Before the frightened eyes of the two women, Al Neri gave his nephew a merciless, careful, physical beating. At first, the youth made an attempt at self-defense, but soon gave that up and begged for mercy. Neri slapped his face until the lips were swollen and bloody. He rocked the kid's head back and slammed him against the wall. He punched him in the stomach, then got him prone on the floor and slapped his face into the carpet. He told the two women to wait and made Tommy go down the street and get into his car. There, he put the fear of God into him. If my sister ever tells me you talk like that to her again, this beating will seem like kisses from abroad. I want to see you straighten out. Now go up the house and tell my wife I'm waiting for her. It was two months after this that Al Neri got back from a late shift on the force and found his wife had left him. She had packed all her clothes and gone back to her family. Her father told him that Rita was afraid of him, that she was afraid to live with him because of his temper. Al was stunned with disbelief. He had never struck his wife, never threatened her in any way, had never felt anything but affection for her. But he was so bewildered by her action that he decided to let a few days go by before he went over to her family's house to talk to her. It was unfortunate that the next night he ran into trouble on his shift. His car answered a call in Harlem, a report of a deadly assault. As usual, Neri jumped out of the patrol car while it was still rolling to a stop. It was after midnight, and he was carrying his huge flashlight. It was easy spotting the trouble. There was a crowd gathered outside a tenement doorway. One Negro woman said to Neri, There's a man in there cutting a little girl. Neri went into the hallway. There was an open door at the far end with light streaming out, and he could hear moaning. Still handling the flashlight, he went down the hall and through the open doorway. He almost fell over two bodies stretched out on the floor. One was a Negro woman of about 25. The other was a Negro girl of no more than 12. Both were bloody from razor cuts on their faces and bodies. In the living room, Neri saw the man who was responsible. He knew him well. The man was Wax Baines, a notorious pimp, dope pusher, and strong arm artist. His eyes were popping from drugs now. The bloody knife he held in his hand wavered. Neri had arrested him two weeks before for severely assaulting one of his whores in the street. Baines had told him, 
Hey man, this done your business. And Nary's partner had also said something about letting the niggers cut each other up if they wanted to. But Nary had hauled Baines into the station house. Baines was bailed out the very next day. Nary had never much liked Negroes, and working in Harlem had made him like them even less. They were all on drugs or booze while they let their women work or peddle ass. He didn't have any use for any of the bastards. So Baines' brazen breaking of the law infuriated him, and the sight of the little girl all cut up with a razor sickened him. Quite coolly, in his own mind, he decided not to bring Baines in. But witnesses were already crowding into the apartment behind him, some people who lived in the building and his partner from the patrol car. Neri ordered Baines, Drop your knife. You're under arrest. Baines laughed. Man, you gotta use your gun to arrest me. He held his knife up. Or maybe you want this. Neri moved very quickly so his partner would not have time to draw a gun. The Negro stabbed with his knife, but Neri's extraordinary reflexes enabled him to catch the thrust with his left palm. With his right hand, he swung the flashlight in a short, vicious arc. The blow caught Baines on the side of the head and made his knees buckle comically, like a drunk's. The knife dropped from his hand. He was quite helpless. So Neri's second blow was inexcusable, as the police departmental hearing and his criminal trial later proved with the help of the testimony of witnesses and his fellow policemen. Neri brought the flashlight down on the top of Baines' skull in an incredibly powerful blow, which shattered the glass of the flashlight, the enamel shield, and the bulb itself popping out and flying across the room. The heavy aluminum barrel of the flashlight tube bent, and only the batteries inside prevented it from doubling on itself. One awed onlooker, a Negro man who lived in the tenement and later testified against Neri, said, Man, that's a hard-headed nigger. But Bain's head was not quite hard enough. The blow caved in his skull. He died two hours later in the Harlem Hospital. Albert Neri was the only one surprised when he was brought up on departmental charges for using excessive force. He was suspended and criminal charges were brought against him. He was indicted for manslaughter, convicted, and sentenced to from one to ten years in prison. By this time, he was so filled with a baffled rage and hatred of all society that he didn't give a damn that they dared to judge him a criminal, that they dared to send him to prison for killing an animal like that pimp nigger, that they didn't give a damn for the woman and little girl who'd been carved up, disfigured for life, and still in the hospital. He did not fear prison, felt that because of his having been a policeman, and especially because of the nature of his offense, he would be well taken care of. Several of his buddy officers had already assured him they would speak to friends. Only his wife's father, a shrewd, old-style Italian who owned a fish market in the Bronx, realized that a man like Albert Neri had little chance of surviving a year in prison. One of his fellow inmates might kill him. If not, he was almost certain to kill one of them. Out of guilt that his daughter had deserted a fine husband for some womanly foolishness, Neri's father-in-law used his contacts with the Corleone family. He paid protection money to one of its representatives and supplied the Corleone family itself with the finest fish available as a gift. He petitioned for their intercession. The Corleone family knew about Albert Neri. He was something of a legend as a legitimately tough cop. He had made a certain reputation as a man not to be held lightly, as a man who could inspire fear out of his own person regardless of the uniform and the sanctioned gun he wore. The Corleone family was always interested in such men. The fact that he was a policeman did not mean too much. Many young men started down a false path to their true destiny. Time and fortune usually set them aright. It was Pete Clemenza, with his fine nose for good personnel, who brought the Neri affair to Tom Hagen's attention. Hagen studied the copy of the official police dossier and listened to Clemenza. He said, Maybe we have another Luca Brasi here. Clemenza nodded his head vigorously, though he was very fat. His face had none of the usual stout man's benignity. My thinking exactly. Mike should look into this himself. And so it was that before Albert Neri was transferred from the temporary jail to what would have been his permanent residence upstate, he was informed that the judge had reconsidered his case on the basis of new information and affidavits submitted by high police officials. His sentence was suspended, and he was released. Albert Neri was no fool, and his father-in-law no shrinking violet. 
Neri learned what had happened and paid his debt to the father-in-law by agreeing to get a divorce from Rita. Then he made a trip out to Long Beach to thank his benefactor. Arrangements had been made beforehand, of course. Michael received him in his library. Neri stated his thanks in formal tones and was surprised and gratified by the warmth with which Michael received his thanks. Michael said, Hell, I couldn't let them do that to a fellow Sicilian. They should have given you a goddamn medal. But those damn politicians don't give a shit about anything except pressure groups. Listen, I would never have stepped into the picture if I hadn't checked everything out and saw what a raw deal you got. One of my people talked to your sister, and she told us how you were always worried about her and her kid, how you straightened the kid out, kept him from going bad. Your father-in-law says you're the finest fellow in the world. That's rare. Tactfully, Michael did not mention anything about Neri's wife having left him. They chatted for a while. Neri had always been a taciturn man, but he found himself opening up to Michael Corleone. Michael was only about five years his senior, but Neri spoke to him as if he were much older, older enough to be his father. Finally, Michael said, There's no sense getting you out of jail and then just leaving you high and dry. I can arrange some work for you. I have interests out in Las Vegas. With your experience, you could be a hotel security man. Or if there's some little business you'd like to go into, I can put a word in with the banks to advance you a loan for capital. Neri was overcome with grateful embarrassment. He proudly refused, and then added, I have to stay under the jurisdiction of the court anyway with the suspended sentence. That's all crap detail. I can fix that. Forget about that supervision. And just so the banks won't get choosy, I have your yellow sheet pulled. The yellow sheet was a police record of criminal offenses committed by any individual. It was usually submitted to a judge when he was considering what sentence to give a convicted criminal. Neri had been long enough on the police force to know that many hoodlums going up for sentencing had been treated leniently by the judge because a clean yellow sheet had been submitted by the bribed police records department. So he was not too surprised that Michael Corleone could do such a thing. He was, however, surprised that such trouble would be taken on his account. If I need help, I'll get in touch. Good. Good. Michael looked at his watch, and Neri took this for his dismissal. He rose to go. Again, he was surprised. Lunchtime. Hey, come out and eat with me and my family. My father said he'd like to meet you. We'll walk over to his house. My mother should have some fried peppers and eggs and sausages. Real Sicilian style. The afternoon was the most agreeable Albert Neri had spent since he was a small boy since the days before his parents had died when he was only 15. Don Corleone was at his most amiable and was delighted when he discovered that Neri's parents had originally come from a small village only a few minutes from his own. The talk was good, the food was delicious, the wine robustly red. Neri was struck by the thought that he was finally with his own true people. He understood that he was only a casual guest, but he knew he could find a permanent place and be happy in such a world. Michael and the Don walked him out to his car. The Don shook his hand. You're a fine fellow. My son Michael here, I've been teaching him the olive oil business. I'm getting old. I want to retire. And he comes to me and he says he wants to interfere in your little affair. I tell him to just learn about the olive oil. But he won't leave me alone. He says, here is this fine fellow, a Sicilian, and they are doing this dirty trick to him. He kept on. He... Gave me no peace until I interested myself in it. I tell you this to tell you that he was right. Now that I met you, I'm glad we took the trouble. So if we can do anything further for you, just ask the favor. Understand? We're at your service. Remembering the Don's kindness, Neri wished the great man was still alive to see the service that would be done this day. It took Neri less than three days to make up his mind. He understood he was being courted but understood more, that the Corleone family approved that act of his which society condemned and had punished him for. The Corleone family valued him. Society did not. He understood that he would be happier in the world the Corleones had created than in the world outside, and he understood that the Corleone family was the more powerful within its narrower limits. He visited Michael again and put his cards on the table. He did not want to work in Vegas, but he would take a job with the family in New York. He made his loyalty clear. Michael was touched. Neri could see that. It was arranged. But Michael insisted that Neri take a vacation first, down in Miami at the family hotel there, all expenses paid and a month's salary in advance, 
so he could have the necessary cash to enjoy himself properly. That vacation was Neri's first taste of luxury. People at the hotel took special care of him, saying, Ah, you're a friend of Michael Corleone. The word had been passed along. He was given one of the plush suites, not the grudging small room a poor relation might be fobbed off with. The man running the nightclub in the hotel fixed him up with some beautiful girls. When Neri got back to New York, he had a slightly different view on life in general. He was put in the Clemenza regime and tested carefully by that masterful personnel man. Certain precautions had to be taken. He had, after all, once been a policeman. But Neri's natural ferocity overcame whatever scruples he might have had at being on the other side of the fence. In less than a year, he had made his bones. He could never turn back. Clemenza sung his praises. Neri was a wonder, the new Luca Brasi. He would be better than Luca, Clemenza bragged. After all, Neri was his discovery. Physically, the man was a marvel. His reflexes and coordination, such that he could have been another Joe DiMaggio. Clemenza also knew that Neri was not a man to be controlled by someone like himself. Neri was made directly responsible to Michael Corleone, with Tom Hagen as the necessary buffer. He was a special, and as such, commanded a high salary, but did not have his own living, a bookmaking or strong-arm operation. It was obvious that his respect for Michael Corleone was enormous, and one day Hagen said jokingly to Michael, Well, now you've got your Luca. Michael nodded. He had brought it off. Albert Neri was his man to the death, and of course it was a trick learned from the Don himself. While learning the business, undergoing the long days of tutelage by his father, Michael had one time asked, How come you used a guy like Luca Brasi, an animal like that? The Don had proceeded to instruct him. There are men in this world who go about demanding to be killed. You must have noticed them. They quarrel in gambling games. They jump out of their automobiles in a rage if someone so much as scratches their fender. They humiliate and bully people whose capabilities they do not know. I have seen a man, a fool, deliberately infuriate a group of dangerous men and he himself without any resources. These are people who wander through the world shouting, Kill me! Kill me! And there is always somebody ready to oblige them. We read about it in the newspapers every day. Such people, of course, do a great deal of harm to others also. Luca Blasi was such a man. But he was such an extraordinary man that for a long time nobody could kill him. Most of these people are of no concern to ourselves, but a Blasi is a powerful weapon to be used. The trick is that since he does not fear death, and indeed looks for it, then the trick is to make yourself the only person in the world that he truly desires not to kill him. He has only that one fear, not of death, but that you may be the one to kill him. He is yours, then. It was one of the most valuable lessons given by the Don before he died, and Michael had used it to make Neri his Luca Brasi. And now, finally, Albert Neri, alone in his Bronx apartment, was going to put on his police uniform again. He brushed it carefully. Polishing the holster would be next. And his policeman's cap, too. The visor had to be cleaned. The stout black shoes shined. Neri worked with a will. He had found his place in the world. Michael Corleone had placed his absolute trust in him. And today, he would not fail that trust. Chapter 31 On that same day, two limousines parked on the Long Beach Mall. One of the big cars waited to take Connie Corleone, her mother, her husband, and her two children to the airport. The Carlo Rizzi family was to take a vacation in Las Vegas in preparation for their permanent move to that city. Michael had given Carlo the order, over Connie's protests. Michael had not bothered to explain that he wanted everyone out of the mall before the corleone Barzini family's meeting. Indeed, the meeting itself was top secret. The only ones who knew about it were the capos of the family. The other limousine was for Kay and her children, who were being driven up to New Hampshire for a visit with her parents. Michael would have to stay in the mall. He had affairs too pressing to leave. The night before, Michael had also sent word to Carlo Rizzi that he would require his presence on the mall for a few days, that he could join his wife and children later that week. Connie had been furious. She had tried to get Michael on the phone, but he had gone into the city. Now her eyes were searching the mall for him, but he was closeted with Tom Hagen and not to be disturbed. Connie kissed Carlo goodbye when he put her in the limousine. If you don't come out there in two days, I'll come back to get you. He gave her a polite, husbandly smile of sexual complicity. I'll be there. She hung out the window. What do you think Michael wants you for? 
Her worried frown made her look old and unattractive. Carlos shrugged. He's been promising me a big deal. Maybe that's what he wants to talk about. That's what he hinted, anyway. Carlo did not know of the meeting scheduled with the Barzini family for that night. Really, Carlo? Carlo nodded at her reassuringly. The limousine moved off through the gates of the mall. It was only after the first limousine had left that Michael appeared to say goodbye to Kay and his own two children. Carlo also came over and wished Kay a good trip and a good vacation. Finally, the second limousine pulled away and went through the gate. Michael said, I'm sorry I had to keep you here, Carlo. It won't be more than a couple of days. I don't mind at all. Good. Just stay by your phone and I'll call you when I'm ready for you. I have to get some other dope before, okay? Sure, Mike, sure. He went into his own house, made a phone call to the mistress he was discreetly keeping in Westbury, promising he would try to get to her late that night. Then he got set with a bottle of rye and waited. He waited a long time. Cars started coming through the gate shortly after noontime. He saw Clemenza get out of one, and then a little later, Tessio came out of another. Both of them were admitted to Michael's house by one of the bodyguards. Clemenza left after a few hours, but Tessio did not reappear. Carlo took a breath of fresh air around the mall, not more than ten minutes. He was familiar with all the guards who pulled duty on the mall, was even friendly with some of them. He thought he might gossip a bit to pass the time. But to his surprise, none of the guards today were men he knew. They were all strangers to him. Even more surprising, the man in charge at the gate was Rocco Lampone, and Carlo knew that Rocco was of too high a rank in the family to be pulling such menial duty unless something extraordinary was afoot. Rocco gave him a friendly smile and hello. Carlo was wary. Rocco said, Hey, I thought you were going on vacation with the Don. Carlo shrugged. Mike wanted me to stick around for a couple of days. He has something for me to do. Yeah, me too. Then he tells me to keep a check on the gate. Well, what the hell? He's the boss. His tone implied that Michael was not the man his father was. A bit derogatory. Carlo ignored the tone. He said, Mike knows what he's doing. Rocco accepted the rebuke in silence. Carlo said so long and walked back to the house. Something was up, but Rocco didn't know what it was. Michael stood in the window of his living room and watched Carlo strolling around the mall. Hagen brought him a drink, strong brandy. Michael sipped at it gratefully. Behind him, Hagen said gently, Mike, you have to start moving. It's time. Michael sighed. I wish it weren't so soon. I wish the old man had lasted a little longer. Nothing will go wrong. If I didn't tumble, then nobody did. You set it up real good. Michael turned away from the window. The old man planned a lot of it. I never realized how smart he was. But I guess you know. Nobody like him. But this is beautiful. This is the best. So you can't be too bad either. Let's see what happens. Are Tessio and Clemenza on the mall? Hagen nodded. Michael finished the brandy in his glass. Send Clemenza in to me. I'll instruct him personally. I don't want to see Tessio at all. Just tell him I'll be ready to go to the Barzini meeting with him in about a half hour. Clemenza's people will take care of him after that. There's no way to let Tessio off the hook? No way. Upstate, in the city of Buffalo, a small pizza parlor on a side street was doing a rush trade. As the lunch hours passed, business finally slackened off, and the counterman took his round tin tray with its few leftover slices out of the window and put it on the shelf of the huge brick oven. He peeked into the oven at a pie baking there. The cheese had not yet started to bubble. When he turned back to the counter that enabled him to serve people in the street, there was a young, tough-looking man standing there. The man said, Give me a slice. The pizza counterman took his wooden shovel and scooped one of the cold slices into the oven to warm it up. The customer, instead of waiting outside, decided to come through the door and be served. The store was empty now. The counterman opened the oven and took out the hot slice and served it on a paper plate. But the customer, instead of giving the money for it, was staring at him intently. I hear you got a great tattoo on your chest. I can see the top of it over your shirt. How about letting me see the rest of it? The counterman froze. He seemed to be paralyzed. Open your shirt. Counterman shook his head. He said in heavily accented English, I got no tattoo. That's the man who works at night. The customer laughed. It was an unpleasant laugh. Harsh, strained. <laughs> Come on, unbutton your shirt. Let me see. The counterman started backing toward the rear of the store, aiming to edge around the huge oven. But the customer raised his hand above the counter. There was a gun in it. He fired. The bullet caught the counterman in the chest and hurled him against the oven. The customer fired into his body again, and the counterman slumped to the floor. 
The customer came around the serving shelf, reached down, and ripped the buttons off the shirt. The chest was covered with blood, but the tattoo was visible, the intertwined lovers and the knife transfixing them. The counterman raised one of his arms feebly, as if to protect himself. Fabrizio, Michael Corleone sends you his regards. He extended the gun so that it was only a few inches from the counterman's skull and pulled the trigger. Then he walked out of the store. At the curb, a car was waiting for him with its door open. He jumped in, and the car sped off. Rocco Lamponi answered the phone installed on one of the iron pillars of the gate. He heard someone saying, Your package is ready, and the click as the caller hung up. Rocco got into his car and drove out of the mall. He crossed the Jones Beach Causeway, the same causeway on which Sonny Corleone had been killed, and drove out to the railroad station of Wontaw. He parked his car there. Another car was waiting for him with two men in it. They drove to a motel ten minutes farther out on Sunrise Highway and turned into its courtyard. Rocco Lampone, leaving his two men in the car, went to one of the little chalet-type bungalows. One kick sent its door flying off its hinges, and Rocco sprang into the room. Philip Tatalia, seventy years old and naked as a baby, stood over a bed on which lay a young girl. Philip Tatalia's thick head of hair was jet black, but the plumage of his crotch was steel gray. His body had the soft plumpness of a bird. Rocco pumped four bullets into him, all in the belly. Then he turned and ran back to the car. The two men dropped him off in the Wontaw station. He picked up his car and drove back to the mall. He went in to see Michael Corleone for a moment and then came out and took up his position at the gate. Albert Neri, alone in his apartment, finished getting his uniform ready. Slowly he put it on, trousers, shirt, tie, and jacket, holster, and gun belt. He had turned in his gun when he was suspended from the force, but through some administrative oversight they had not made him give up his shield. Clemenza had supplied him with a new 38 police special that could not be traced. Neri broke it down, oiled it, checked the hammer, put it together again, clicked the trigger. He loaded the cylinder and was set to go. He put the policeman's cap in a heavy paper bag and then put a civilian overcoat on to cover his uniform. He checked his watch, 15 minutes before the car would be waiting for him downstairs. He spent the 15 minutes checking himself in the mirror. There was no question. He looked like a real cop. The car was waiting with two of Rocco Lamponi's men in front. Neri got into the back seat. As the car started downtown, after they had left the neighborhood of his apartment, he shrugged off the civilian overcoat and left it on the floor of the car. He ripped open the paper bag and put the police officer's cap on his head. At 55th Street and 5th Avenue, the car pulled over to the curb and Neri got out. He started walking down the avenue. He had a queer feeling being back in uniform, patrolling the streets as he had done so many times. There were crowds of people. He walked downtown until he was in front of Rockefeller Center, across the way from St. Patrick's Cathedral. On his side of Fifth Avenue, he spotted the limousine he was looking for. It was parked, nakedly alone, between a whole string of red no-parking and no-standing signs. Neri slowed his pace. He was too early. He stopped to write something in his summons book and then kept walking. He was abreast of the limousine. He tapped its fender with his nightstick. The driver looked up in surprise. Neri pointed to the no-standing sign with his stick and motioned the driver to move his car. The driver turned his head away. Neri walked out into the street so that he was standing by the driver's open window. The driver was a tough-looking hood, just the kind he loved to break up. Neri said with deliberate insultingness, Okay, wise guy. You want me to stick a summons up your ass, or do you want to get moving? You better check with your precinct. Just give me the ticket if it'll make you feel happy. Get the hell out of here or I'll drag you out of that car and break your ass. Driver made a $10 bill appear by some sort of magic, folded it into a little square using just one hand, and tried to shove it inside Neri's blouse. Neri moved back onto the sidewalk and crooked his finger at the driver. The driver came out of the car. Let me see your license and registration. He had been hoping to get the driver to go around the block, but there was no hope for that now. Out of the corner of his eye, Neri saw three short, heavy-set men coming down the steps of the plaza building, coming down toward the street. It was Barzini himself and his two bodyguards, on their way to meet Michael Corleone. Even as he saw this, one of the bodyguards peeled off to come ahead and see what was wrong with Barzini's car. This man asked the driver, What's up? I'm getting a ticket, no sweat. This guy must be new in the precinct. At that moment, Barzini came up with his other bodyguard. What the hell is wrong now? Neri finished writing in his summons book and gave the driver back his registration and license. 
Then he put his summons book back in his hip pocket and with a forward motion of his hand drew the thirty-eight special. He put three bullets in Barzini's barrel chest before the other three men unfroze enough to die for cover. By that time, Neri had darted into the crowd and around the corner where the car was waiting for him. The car sped up to Ninth Avenue and turned downtown. Near Chelsea Park, Neri, who had discarded the cap and put on the overcoat and changed clothing, transferred to another car that was waiting for him. He had left the gun and the police uniform in the other car. It would be gotten rid of. An hour later, he was safely in the mall on Long Beach and talking to Michael Corleone. Tessio was waiting in the kitchen of the old Don's house and was sipping at a cup of coffee when Tom Hagen came for him. Mike is ready for you now. You better make your call to Barzini and tell him to start on his way. Tessio rose and went to the wall phone. He dialed Barzini's office in New York and said curtly, We're on our way to Brooklyn. He hung up and smiled at Hagen. I hope Mike can get us a good deal tonight. I'm sure he will. He escorted Tessio out of the kitchen and onto the mall. They walked toward Michael's house. At the door, they were stopped by one of the bodyguards. The boss says he'll come in a separate car. He says for you two to go on ahead. Tessio frowned and turned to Hagen. Hell, he can't do that. That screws up all my arrangements. At that moment, three more bodyguards materialized around them. I can't go with you either, Tessio. The ferret-faced Capo Regime understood everything in a flash of a second and accepted it. There was a moment of physical weakness, and then he recovered. Tell Mike. It was business. I always liked him. Hagen nodded. He understands that. Tessio paused for a moment and then said softly, Tom, can you get me off the hook? For old time's sake. Hagen shook his head. I can't. He watched Tessio being surrounded by bodyguards and led into a waiting car. He felt a little sick. Tessio had been the best soldier in the Corleone family. The old Don had relied on him more than any other man, with the exception of Luca Brasi. It was too bad that so intelligent a man had made such a fatal error in judgment so late in life. Carlo Rizzi, still waiting for his interview with Michael, became jittery with all the arrivals and departures. Obviously, something big was going on, and it looked as if he were going to be left out. Impatiently, he called Michael on the phone. One of the house bodyguards answered, went to get Michael, and came back with the message that Michael wanted him to sit tight, that he would get to him soon. Carlo called up his mistress again and told her he was sure he would be able to take her to a late supper and spend the night. Michael had said he would call him soon. Whatever he had planned couldn't take more than an hour or two. Then it would take him about forty minutes to drive to Westbury. It could be done. He promised her he would do it, and sweet-talked her into not being sore. When he hung up, he decided to get properly dressed, so as to save time afterward. He had just slipped into a fresh shirt when there was a knock on the door. He reasoned quickly that Mike had tried to get him on the phone and had kept getting a busy signal, so it simply sent a messenger to call him. Carlo went to the door and opened it. He felt his whole body go weak with a terrible, sickening fear. Standing in the doorway was Michael Corleone, his face the face of that death Carlo Rizzi saw often in his dreams. Behind Michael Corleone were Hagen and Rocco Lampone. They looked grave, like people who had come with the utmost reluctance to give a friend bad news. The three of them entered the house, and Carlo Rizzi led them into the living room. Recovered from his first shock, he thought that he had suffered an attack of nerves. Michael's words made him really sick, physically nauseous. You have to answer for Santino. Carlo didn't answer, pretended not to understand. Hagen and Lampone had split away to opposite walls of the room. He and Michael faced each other. You fingered Sonny for the Barzini people. That little farce you played out with my sister? Did Barzini kid you that would fool a Corleone? Carlo Ricci spoke out of his terrible fear, without dignity, without any kind of pride. I swear I'm innocent. I swear on the head of my children I'm innocent. Mike, don't do this to me, please. Mike, don't do this to me. Barzini is dead. So is Phil Tatalia. I want to square all the family accounts tonight. So don't tell me you're innocent. It would be better for you to admit what you did. Hagen and Lamponi stared at Michael with astonishment. They were thinking that Michael was not yet the man his father was. Why try to get this traitor to admit guilt? That guilt was already proven, as much as such a thing could be proven. The answer was obvious. Michael still was not that confident of his right, still feared being unjust, still worried about that fraction of an uncertainty that only a confession by Carlo Rizzi could erase. There was still no answer. Don't be so frightened. 
Do you think I'd make my sister a widow? Do you think I'd make my nephews fatherless? After all, I'm godfather to one of your kids. No, your punishment will be that you won't be allowed any work with the family. I'm putting you on a plane to Vegas to join your wife and kids. And then I want you to stay there. I'll send Connie an allowance, that's all. But don't keep saying you're innocent. Don't insult my intelligence and make me angry. Well, who approached you, Tatalia or Barzini? Carlo Rizzi, in his anguished hope for life, in the sweet flooding relief that he was not going to be killed, murmured, <sighs> Barzini. Good. Good. He beckoned with his right hand. I want you to leave now. There's a car waiting to take you to the airport. Carlo went out the door first, the other three men very close to him. It was night now, but the mall, as usual, was bright with floodlights. A car pulled up. Carlo saw it was his own car. He didn't recognize the driver. There was someone sitting in the back, but on the far side. Lamponi opened the front door and motioned to Carlo to get in. I'll call your wife and tell her you're on your way down. Carlo got into the car. His silk shirt was soaked with sweat. The car pulled away, moving swiftly toward the gate. Carlo started to turn his head to see if he knew the man sitting behind him. At that moment, Clemenza, as cunningly and daintily as a little girl slipping a ribbon over the head of a kitten, threw his garrote around Carlo Rizzi's neck. The smooth rope cut into the skin with Clemenza's powerful yanking throttle. Carlo Rizzi's body went leaping into the air like a fish on a line, but Clemenza held him fast, tightening the garrote until the body went slack. Suddenly, there was a foul odor in the air of the car. Carlo's body, sphincter released by approaching death, had voided itself. Clemenza kept the garrote tight for another few minutes to make sure, then released the rope and put it back in his pocket. He relaxed himself against the seat cushions as Carlo's body slumped against the door. After a few moments, Clemenza rolled the window down to let out the stink. The victory of the Corleone family was complete. During that same 24-hour period, Clemenza and Lampone turned loose their regime and punished the infiltrators of the Corleone domains. Neri was sent to take command of the Tessio regime. Barzini bookmakers were put out of business. Two of the highest-ranking Barzini enforcers were shot to death as they were peaceably picking their teeth over dinner in an Italian restaurant on Mulberry Street. A notorious fixer of trotting races was also killed as he returned home from a winning night at the track. Two of the biggest Shylocks on the waterfront disappeared to be found months later in the New Jersey swamps. With this one savage attack, Michael Corleone made his reputation and restored the Corleone family to its primary place in the New York families. He was respected not only for his tactical brilliance, but because some of the most important capo regime in both the Barzini and Tattaglia families immediately went over to his side. It would have been a perfect triumph for Michael Corleone, except for an exhibition of hysteria by his sister Connie. Connie had flown home with her mother, the children left in Vegas. She had restrained her widow's grief until the limousine pulled into the mall. Then, before she could be restrained by her mother, she ran across the cobbled street to Michael Corleone's house. She burst through the door and found Michael and Kay in the living room. Kay started to go to her, to comfort her, and take her in her arms in a sisterly embrace, but stopped short when Connie started screaming at her brother, screaming curses and reproaches. You lousy bastard! You killed my husband! You waited until our father died and nobody could stop you and you killed him! You killed him! You blamed him about Sonny, you always did, everybody did. But you never thought about me. You never gave a damn about me. What am I gonna do now? What am I gonna do? She was wailing. Two of Michael's bodyguards had come up behind her and were waiting for orders from him. But he just stood there impassively and waited for his sister to finish. Kay said in a shocked voice, Connie, you're upset. Don't say such things. Connie had recovered from her hysteria. Her voice held a deadly venom. Why do you think he was always so cold to me? Why do you think he kept Carlo here on the mall? All the time he knew he was going to kill my husband. But he didn't dare while my father was alive. My father would have stopped him. He knew that. He was just waiting. And then he stood godfather to our child, just to throw us off the track. The cold-hearted bastard! You think you know your husband? Do you know how many men he had killed with my Carlo? Just read the papers. Barzini and Tatalia, the others. My brother had them killed. She had worked herself into hysteria again. She tried to spit in Michael's face, but she had no saliva. Get her home and get her a doctor. The two guards immediately grabbed Connie's arms and pulled her out of the house. Kay was still shocked, still horrified. What made her say all those things, Michael? What makes her believe that? Michael shrugged. She's hysterical. 
Kay looked into his eyes. Michael, it's not true. Please say it's not true. Michael shook his head wearily. Of course it's not. Just believe me. This one time, I'm letting you ask about my affairs, and I'm giving you an answer. It is not true. He had never been more convincing. He looked directly into her eyes. He was using all the mutual trust they had built up in their married life to make her believe him, and she could not doubt any longer. She smiled at him ruefully and came into his arms for a kiss. We both need a drink. She went into the kitchen for ice, and while there heard the front door open. She went out of the kitchen and saw Clemenza, Neri, and Rocco Lamponi come in with the bodyguards. Michael had his back to her, but she moved so that she could see him in profile. At that moment, Clemenza addressed her husband, greeting him formally. Don Michael. Kay could see how Michael stood to receive their homage. He reminded her of statues in Rome, statues of those Roman emperors of antiquity, who, by divine right, held the power of life and death over their fellow men. One hand was on his hip. The profile of his face showed a cold, proud power. His body was carelessly, arrogantly at ease, weight resting on one foot slightly behind the other. The capo regime stood before him. In that moment, Kay knew that everything Connie had accused Michael of was true. She went back into the kitchen and wept. Book 9, Chapter 32 The bloody victory of the Corleone family was not complete until a year of delicate political maneuvering established Michael Corleone as the most powerful family chief in the United States. For twelve months, Michael divided his time equally between his headquarters at the Long Beach Mall and his new home in Las Vegas. But at the end of that year, he decided to close out the New York operation and sell the houses and the mall property. For that purpose, he brought his whole family east on a last visit. They would stay a month, wind up business, Kay would do the personal family packing and shipping of household goods. There were a million other minor details. Now, the Corleone family was unchallengeable, and Clemenza had his own family. Rocco Lampone was the Corleone capo regime. In Nevada, Albert Neri was head of all security for the family-controlled hotels. Hagen, too, was part of Michael's Western family. Time helped heal the old wounds. Connie Corleone was reconciled to her brother Michael. Indeed, not more than a week after her terrible accusations, she apologized to Michael for what she had said and assured Kay that there had been no truth in her words, that it had only been a young widow's hysteria. Connie Corleone easily found a new husband. In fact, she did not wait the year of respect before filling her bed again with a fine young fellow who had come to work for the Corleone family as a male secretary, a boy from a reliable Italian family but graduated from the top business college in America. Naturally, his marriage to the sister of the Don made his future assured. Kay Adams Corleone had delighted her in-laws by taking instruction in the Catholic religion and joining that faith. Her two boys were also naturally being brought up in that church, as was required. Michael himself had not been too pleased by this development. He would have preferred the children to be Protestant. It was more American. To her surprise, Kay came to love living in Nevada. She loved the scenery, the hills and canyons of garishly red rock, the burning deserts, the unexpected and blessedly refreshing lakes, even the heat. Her two boys rode their own ponies. She had real servants, not bodyguards. And Michael lived a more normal life. He owned a construction business. He joined the businessmen's clubs and civic committees. He had a healthy interest in local politics without interfering publicly. It was a good life. Kay was happy that they were closing down their New York house and that Las Vegas would be truly their permanent home. She hated coming back to New York. And so, on this last trip, she had arranged all the packing and shipping of goods with the utmost efficiency and speed. And now, on the final day, she felt that same urgency to leave that long-time patients feel when it is time to be discharged from the hospital. On that final day, Kay Adams Corleone woke at dawn. She could hear the roar of the truck motors outside on the mall, the trucks that would empty all the houses of furniture. The Corleone family would be flying back to Las Vegas in the afternoon, including Mama Corleone. When Kay came out of the bathroom, Michael was propped up on his pillow, smoking a cigarette. Why the hell do you have to go to church every morning? I don't mind Sundays, but why the hell during the week? You're as bad as my mother. He reached over in the darkness and switched on the table light. Kay sat at the edge of the bed to pull on her stockings. You know how converted Catholics are. They take it more seriously. Michael reached over to touch her thigh on the warm skin where the top of her nylon hose ended. Don't. 
I'm taking communion this morning. He didn't try to hold her when she got up from the bed. Smiling slightly, he said, If you're such a strict Catholic, how can you let the kids duck going to church so much? She felt uncomfortable, and she was wary. He was studying her with what she thought of privately as his Don's eye. They have plenty of time. When we get back home, I'll make them attend more. She kissed him goodbye before she left. Outside the house, the air was already getting warm. The summer sun rising in the east was red. Kay walked to where her car was parked near the gates of the mall. Mama Corleone, dressed in her widow black, was already sitting in it, waiting for her. It had become a set routine, early mass, every morning, together. Kay kissed the old woman's wrinkled cheek, then got behind the wheel. Mama Corleone asked suspiciously, You eat the breakfast? No. The old woman nodded her head approvingly. Kay had once forgotten that it was forbidden to take food from midnight on before receiving Holy Communion. That had been a long time ago, but Mama Corleone never trusted her after that and always checked. You feel all right? Yes. The church was small and desolate in the early morning sunlight. Its stained glass windows shielded the interior from heat. It would be cool there, a place to rest. Kay helped her mother-in-law up the white stone steps and then let her go before her. The old woman preferred a pew up front, close to the altar. Kay waited on the steps for an extra minute. She was always reluctant at this last moment, always a little fearful. Finally, she entered the cool darkness. She took the holy water on her fingertips and made the sign of the cross, fleetingly touched her wet fingertips to her parched lips. Candles flickered redly before the saints, the Christ on his cross. Kay genuflected before entering her row, and then knelt on the hard wooden rail of the pew to wait for her call to communion. She bowed her head as if she were praying, but she was not quite ready for that. It was only here in these dim, vaulted churches that she allowed herself to think about her husband's other life, about that terrible night a year ago when he had deliberately used all their trust and love in each other to make her believe his lie that he had not killed his sister's husband. She had left him because of that lie, not because of the deed. The next morning she had taken the children away with her to her parents' house in New Hampshire, without a word to anyone, without really knowing what action she meant to take. Michael had immediately understood. He had called her the first day, and then left her alone. It was a week before the limousine from New York pulled up in front of her house with Tom Hagen. She had spent a long, terrible afternoon with Tom Hagen, the most terrible afternoon of her life. They had gone for a walk in the woods outside her little town, and Hagen had not been gentle. Kay had made the mistake of trying to be cruelly flippant, a role to which she was not suited. Did Mike send you up here to threaten me? I expected to see some of the boys get out of the car with their machine guns to make me go back. For the first time since she had known him, she saw Hagen angry. That's the worst kind of juvenile crap I've ever heard. I never expected that from a woman like you. Come on, Kay. All right. They walked along the green country road. Hagen asked quietly, Why did you run away? Because Michael lied to me. Because he made a fool of me when he stood godfather to Connie's boy. He betrayed me. I can't love a man like that. I can't live with it. I can't let him be father to my children. I don't know what you're talking about. She turned on him with now justified rage. I mean that he killed his sister's husband. Do you understand that? She paused for a moment. And he lied to me. They walked on for a long time in silence. Finally, Hagen said, You have no way of really knowing that's all true. But just for the sake of argument... Let's assume that it's true. I'm not saying it is, remember. But what if I gave you what might be some justification for what he did? Or rather, some possible justifications? Kay looked at him scornfully. That's the first time I've seen the lawyer side of you, Tom. It's not your best side. Hagen grinned. Okay, just hear me out. What if Carlo had put Sonny on the spot, fingered him? What if Carlo beating up Connie that time was a deliberate plot to get Sonny out in the open, that they knew he would take the route over the Jones Beach Causeway. What if Carlo had been paid to help get Sonny killed? Then what? Kay didn't answer. Hagen went on. And what if the Don, a great man, couldn't bring himself to do what he had to do, avenge his son's death by killing his daughter's husband? What if that, finally, was too much for him, and he made Michael his successor, knowing that Michael would take that load off his shoulders, would take that guilt. It was all over with, Kay said, tears springing into her eyes. Everybody was happy. Why couldn't Carlo be forgiven? Why couldn't everything go on and everybody forget? She had led him across a meadow to a tree-shaded brook. 
Hagen sank down on the grass and sighed. He looked around, sighed again. In this world, you could do it. He's not the man I married. Hagen laughed shortly. If he were, he'd be dead now. You'd be a widow now. You'd have no problem. What the hell does that mean? Come on, Tom, speak out straight once in your life. I know Michael can't, but you're not Sicilian. You can tell a woman the truth. You can treat her like an equal, a fellow human being. There was another long silence. Hagen shook his head. You've got Mike wrong. You're mad because he lied to you. Well, he warned you never to ask him about business. You're mad because he was godfather to Carlo's boy, but you made him do that. Actually, it was the right move for him to make if he was going to take action against Carlo. The classical, tactical move to win the victim's trust. Hagen gave her a grim smile. Is that straight enough talk for you? But Kay had bowed her head. Hagen went on. I'll give you some more straight talk. After the Don died, Mike was set up to be killed. Do you know who set him up? Tessio. So Tessio had to be killed. Carlo had to be killed, because treachery can't be forgiven. Michael could have forgiven it, but people never forgive themselves, and so they would always be dangerous. Michael really liked Tessio. He loves his sister. But he would be shirking his duty to you and his children, to his whole family, to me and my family. If he let Tessio and Carlo go free, they would have been a danger to us all, all our lives. Kay had been listening to this with tears running down her face. Is that what Michael sent you up here to tell me? Hagen looked at her in genuine surprise. No. He told me to tell you you could have everything you want and do everything you want as long as you take good care of the kids. Hagen smiled. He said to tell you that you're his Don. That's just a joke. Kay put her hand on Hagen's arm. He didn't order you to tell me all the other things? Hagen hesitated a moment as if debating whether to tell her a final truth. You still don't understand. If you told Michael what I've told you today, I'm a dead man. He paused again. You and the children are the only people on this earth he couldn't harm. It was a long five minutes after that Kay rose from the grass and they started walking back to the house. When they were almost there, Kay said to Hagen, After supper, can you drive me and the kids to New York in your car? That's what I came for. A week after she returned to Michael, she went to a priest for instruction to become a Catholic. From the innermost recess of the church, the bell tolled for repentance. As she had been taught to do, Kay struck her breast lightly with her clenched hand, the stroke of repentance. The bell tolled again, and there was the shuffling of feet as the communicants left their seats to go to the altar rail. Kay rose to join them. She knelt at the altar, and from the depths of the church, the bell tolled again. With her closed hand, she struck her heart once more. The priest was before her. She tilted back her head and opened her mouth to receive the papery thin wafer. This was the most terrible moment of all, until it melted away and she could swallow and she could do what she came to do. Washed clean of sin, a favored supplicant, she bowed her head and folded her hands over the altar rail. She shifted her body to make her weight less punishing to her knees. She emptied her mind of all thought of herself of her children, of all anger, of all rebellion, of all questions. Then, with a profound and deeply willed desire to believe, to be heard, as she had done every day since the murder of Carlo Rizzi, she said the necessary prayers for the soul of Michael Corleone. To help us improve our content, you're welcome to leave comments, like the videos, and subscribe to our channel.